Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, this is Kai Yang. I'm an assistant professor from uh, the Division of Biostatistics at uh, MCW. And I, I'm also the vice president of the uh, Wisconsin chapter of American Statistical Association. Today, I'm very pleased to open the workshop and uh, welcome you to this event. Um, First of all, let me thank you for attending this workshop, which is organized by the Wisconsin Chapter of American Statistical Association. Um, uh, if you are not familiar with, in, in, in association with the Division of Biostatistics at MCW, if you are not familiar with uh, the Wisconsin Chapter, uh, this chapter is, was formed uh, in 1953 and it was named the Milwaukee chapter originally. And the chapter was expanded to serve statisticians uh, from the entire state of Wisconsin in 2014. Uh, currently, we have about uh, 128 uh, ASA members in the chapter, as well as many non-ASA um, members. Hopefully, uh, more people will join us in the, in the future. Um, Next, I want to I want to introduce uh, today the first speaker, Dr. Rob Mechanic. Uh, Dr. Mechanic received his PhD from uh, the University of Minnesota in 1985. Um, now he's a professor um, of in the School of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences uh, at Arizona State University with research interests. Um, focused on Bayesian data analysis and the machine learning research. Um, his research has been published in a great variety of journals, including JASA, Journal of Econometrics, and the Journal of Marketing Research, with more than 6,000 citations. Um, in today's work workshop, um, Dr. Mechanic will, will um, Talk about uh, talk about the tree based uh, ensemble models, which are also known as Bayesian additive regression trees. Um, let's welcome Dr. Mechanic. Thank you. Let me turn this on. Okay, so we're sure they can hear me. Is that is that too loud? Is that, they got the and this works. Okay, so good morning, everybody. So, uh, uh, not everybody's done Bayesian stuff. Not everybody's done whatever. I got this short intro section, just simple base, some simple ideas but then try to present them in a way that when we get to BART, which is fundamentally Bayesian, then you know we're ready for those issues. Like, what are the issues? And then I, you know, I have a brief summary of some of like the more theoretical underpinnings of, of Bayesian statistics, the things that are in the back of my mind when I work as a Bayesian statistician. And then as we go through BART, we can see how, oh yeah, you know, this idea is important here or not. You know, sometimes theory is fundamental and sometimes theory is garbage waste of time. So you always want to sort those out in your mind. Okay. Okay, so the first thing I did is uh, just some, some broader context of what we're doing here and what's going on. So we're all in this uh, crazy world now. So, you know, what is statistics, what's machine learning, what's data science, all this kind of stuff. So what I put there is it's lots of things. There's a lot of different angles you can take on it, but um, a fundamental fact in my mind is that we, we do now have some truly amazing tools for finding high dimensional relationships 
there weren't there. I don't know how many years you want to go back. You know, not that long ago, we, we couldn't do these things. So we're, we're really on a totally different landscape than we were not too long ago. And I, I feel like, and I'm going to try to back this up in a slide or two. If you, if you ask me what the stars of the show are in terms of statistical methodology, it would be the methods based on ensembles of trees. So the things you've heard of would be random forest boosting. And then of course, neural networks. So in the popular press, they're always talking about AI. And when they say AI, AI usually they mean neural networks. But uh, so I always like to ask you all, besides ensembles of trees, and that covers a lot of ground, particular BART, which we're we'll talking about today, um, and neural networks, what's your, what's your like third favorite method that you think is a big deal nowadays in statistical science? What do you have to know now? What do you feel like an idiot if you don't know it? Nobody. What? Uh, so I'm talking more basic statistics. That would be more, I'll call that an application, you know, about convolutional neural network. That's an application of, pardon? So I'm gonna show you in a second in terms of applied work, if that's the right answer. Uh, anyway, so, okay. So uh, a couple of days ago when I was doing this, I was reading um, uh, Deep Learning in Python. <laughs> I don't know what you guys read, that's what I read, Deep Learning in Python by Chole, C-H-O-L-L-E-T. -E so this, that's the guy who wrote Keras. Uh, so he's, it's a very good book. It's a, you know, you, you try to read all these different books and it's very uneven, right? If you just pick up a book on machine learning, it can make you crazy because the statistics are so bad. It's so uneven and all that kind of stuff. So I would, that's, that's a good book. So anyway, he, he in, his, in the beginning of the book, he pointed to this kind of uh, documentation. So I have the 2021 just because that was in the book. I'm actually kind of curious if we, if I pull the 2023, how different it will be. I mean, that's another fundamental thing. Things are moving so fast in machine learning that it's it's almost impossible to keep up. Uh, so they have a, you know, so do you believe uh, Kaggle or Kaggle, whatever it is? So when Kaggle puts out these contests uh, in, for, you know, predictive approaches. And they just do the survey, you know, what do you, what, what do you actually use? What do you actually do? And I, I think, uh, you know, something that's really fundamentally different about statistics now is that it's market driven. You know, when I was an academic starting out, well, I had to get my darn paper published. And uh, I think I have 17,000 sites, not 6,000 sites. So that's not bad. <laughs> depends, depends on where you are at Chicago. That wasn't that great. Some other places, it's not bad. Uh, but nowadays, it's like, you know, do people use it is, is more important than ever. That was in the last five years where you have-, you have Oh, well, that was the last five years? Okay, okay. <clears throat> so, you know, what do people use? So uh, linear logistic regression, GLMs. So, so that's actually, so we have machine learning and data science. What do people actually use? <laughs> GLMs, uh, subject to the uh, qualification that they're not using GLMs the way that we used them 10 or 15 years ago. It's more like a lasso or ridge version of GLM. So that is different, but nonetheless, the linear model is still like right at the top here. And what's next? You know, tree-based methods. So if you, you know, read the New York Times, you would think that everything is neural networks. If you knew that when they said AI, they were talking about neural networks, that's not true. Okay, so what people actually use is neural networks, but it's not, you know, exactly what people are doing. So decision trees, random forest, what's next? Boosting, well, that's just more trees. Okay, so this is people actually working, doing this stuff. 
And I trust these people more than I trust me. I trust these people more than I trust professors because they try it every day. And if it doesn't work, they will get fired. And it's a serious business. So finally, we get down to neural networks. So it says convolutional neural networks. So as many of you know, probably that's kind of a, a specialization of neural network technology to images. Uh, so image, that, that is a big deal. Okay. So text images, there's been a huge breakthroughs using neural network type technology. That's so some people think we're all going to change everything because of that. But in applied statistics, it's still GLM, OK? Oh, and then finally, we get to uh, finally. I'm only down to my fourth one, Bayesian approaches. Uh, so that's actually becoming more popular, I think, in machine neural learning, not less. So weird to that, though. Yeah, I know. Let's assume that the B was dropped and that there's for all we know, there is now a new field called Asian approaches, and I just haven't been paying attention. And if I was on an archive or whatever, I would know about this. Uh, recurrent neural networks. So uh, convolution neural networks, that would be kind of the underpinning of images. And maybe recurrent would be kind of the underpinning of, uh, well, text now in the sense of uh, sequential analysis of text as opposed to the old bag of words. Okay. Uh, and then we're, and then it says neural networks, but we already had neural networks specialized to images, specialized to, well, lots of things, but in particular text. Transformers next, GANs, evolutionary approaches, other. Okay. So I think that's a good way to understand sort of what's going on out there. And I just want to go through it uh, to give us a context. So I'm going to be talking about a tree based method and a Bayesian tree based method, which has some pros and cons. Okay. And then the other one I couldn't help putting in was this one. So this is the wonder and misery of our lives. You know, uh, you know, what was the breakthrough in neural networks? I love, you know, that book, uh, the Benjo book, Deep Learning. It's a really nice book. Uh, he says right in the beginning, you know, the breakthrough, we didn't really have a conceptual breakthrough. We just had more data and more computer, and we simplified our optimization algorithms. They didn't make it more complicated. They simplified them. Okay. But, you know, whichever people first did all that work to get the, the parallel computing to work. So the GPU computing, which is parallel computing, you know, that's the breakthrough. So... The technology stuff is interwoven with it. Obviously, it's now so computer driven. So, what are people using? So, so uh, scikit-learn. So, uh, in statistics, you learn R typically, and there's, you still feel like you have to know R. But how can you not learn scikit-learn as well? And that's a real nuisance because being good at one thing is hard. Being good at two things is harder. <laughs> Being good at three things is like really hard. So I told my students, I, I, I felt really crappy about not being that good at Python until I realized I wasn't very good at R either. <laughs> and then I kind of relaxed about the whole thing, you know. So, so there's, a lot, there's a lot to know there. So TensorFlow, that's kind of the, the SAS of neural networks, right? But I don't think there's that many people using, well, I don't know. I think more people use Keras than TensorFlow, but Keras actually comes as part of TensorFlow now, and Keras is just a, an easier way to, to, to do TensorFlow. And I, I don't know, I love Keras. In academics, people tend to use PyTorch, which is, so, okay, so Keras, XGBoost, so boosting comes up. PyTorch, so PyTorch, Keras, two different ways to do neural networks. Uh, light GBM, that's more boosting. Uh, what's Carrot? Carrot is an R package for doing kind of uh, machine learning things. So that's R finally. R finally gets, gets on the list. Uh, and that's kind of, and then, then, you know, I guess, uh, whatever. Okay. 
So I'm saying that's what that's the context, the broader context that we're, we're talking about here. And it, I think it's quite difficult. There's there's uh, a lot going on. And uh, just the computing skills is a challenge. And then, of course, understanding the modeling issues is the more fun part, the intellectual part. But, uh, you know, you have a lot of tough decisions to make about how to spend your time and what uh, software computing issues you're going to focus on and what modeling issues you're going to focus on. Okay. Okay, so GLM was not a terrible answer. Uh, linear. So, uh, the only one I think you should know now is uh, my answer is usually Gaussian processes. Be like a third one you should know now. But 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 your answer is probably better. Uh, so linear methods are still still a big deal, and then after that we saw that the tree based methods were a big deal. Okay. So again, I, I don't think that's, you know, if you're a person out there and you're reading the New York Times or whatever, you don't realize that's true. But it is it is true as a practical matter. And of course, Python and R are king. And uh, Bayesian approaches are also on the list and maybe becoming actually more important. Okay. But let me, uh, again, uh, so we said linear models. But it's not the linear models from 20 years ago. It's not, you know, give me the p values, give me the t sets, blah, 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 blah. It's sort of regularized linear models. Okay. So, what do we mean by regularized linear models? So, if I'm fitting a regression model, that's minimizing the sum of squares. But we add on a, a penalty term that says, okay, yeah, 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 let's, let's choose the, the betas to make this small. But if I have a lot of X's, is it a good idea to make this super small? Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so that's the kind of intuition you need to have in machine learning. So we add this penalty. And if lambda is big, it says you're, you're, you're not allowed to have coefficients that are too big. And uh, so uh, if lambda is big, all the coefficients will be shrunk towards zero. Okay, so that's going to be a major theme of all, all these things. And the kind of one thing that I wanted us to be vaguely aware of as we talk about Bayesian approaches, as we talk about BART, is the idea of uh, this kind of shrinkage idea. In the Bayesian world, will be more explicit and shrinkage will come through the prior as opposed to the complexity penalty or whatever they call it now in machine learning. So there, there's an interplay there that, that we want to be aware of. <clears throat> okay. So, but the, the big thing that it's all I'm going to talk about today is, uh, yeah, 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 you can have a complicated model. Okay, so you want, you know, what do neural nets and boosting both give you? I can go out and I can find complex patterns and data. So it, people say automatically, that has to be in quotes, right? But you, you don't have to specify the model. You don't have to say, I want to try X3 squared. It does that somewhat automatically. That's what they both do. So in the big picture, they both do that. They both, I, you know, I can give you y and x, I can go out and figure out the function of relating y to x without you knowing anything about it. And it does it, um, they both do it amazingly well. It's just amazing. You know, the first time you play around with anything, the first time you try BART, you know, if all you've done is a GLM, it's absolutely mind blowing how well any of these things work, I think. I never would have believed 20 years ago that things would work just well. Uh, but you know, you know what I want. So the models have to be complicated enough to figure out all kinds of different patterns and maybe in the data. But of course, we don't want to make them too complicated. So you have this idea of shrinkage, shrinking towards simplicity. We have a complicated model, but you're able, able to take that complicated model and make it simpler in some way. So this is the famous picture associated with this. So here I put the absolute value of beta. It gives us the lasso. If I put beta squared, it would give us L2 regularization, which is ridge regression. Okay. But in either case, you get shrinkage towards zero. If I make the lambda big, the complexity penalty big, then it'll, it'll shrink the solution towards smaller coefficients. So here's the kind of picture you have. So this is a small lambda, 
And then as lambda gets bigger, so sorry, um, these are the coefficient, the path of coefficients I get by solving this optimization problem as I vary lambda. So if lambda is zero, you get the least square solution. So here's lambda basically zero. They put log, it's log one over lambda, but uh, this corresponds to a small lambda. So these would be the least squares coefficients for the set of coefficients in my linear regression. As lambda gets big, the coefficients shrink towards zero, and that's how you make your model simpler. Okay. So all those ideas will be in BART, but in a, in a Bayesian way. So that's what I'm just trying to give you this big picture. So when we do BART, we have all these things in the back of our mind. Okay. And uh, not important to us at all today, but in passing, we, when we see the picture, we can't help but remember uh, people, one of the people, reasons people like the lasso is, yeah, the coefficients shrink towards zero. That's kind of intuitive from here. But because of the absolute value, the solution will actually give you exactly zero for some of the coefficients as lambda gets big. Okay. So that has nothing to do with the work going to do today. But it, it's cool. And that I've been already skirting around the idea of the bias variance trade off. We want to be able to have our models complicated so we can figure out these patterns in the data. But you have to have this basic intuition that if you make them too complicated, you will overfit the data. And then when you go to predict, you will do poorly. And that's generally represented as the bias variance trade off. So in this axis, we have model complexity. So as I make uh, lambda bigger, the model gets simpler. As I make lambda bigger, the model gets simpler in the sense that the coefficients are shrunk towards zero. Okay, so a model, by model complexity, we could, that translates directly into that lambda in the parameter we just talked about. Okay. So a complicated model would be a small lambda because you're letting all those coefficients be big. Okay. So if I make the model too simple, if I say, hey, all your coefficients have to be tiny. Oh, I can't fit the data. That's no good. And then I, I make lambda a smaller and smaller. So the model gets more complicated and now I can have bigger coefficients. So in sample on your training data, your fit just gets better and better and better. But out of sample, initially you do better as you make your model, model more complicated. But eventually, if you make your model too complicated, you do worse. Okay. So I teach courses on applied machine learning and, and I do this over and over again. I, it's actually pretty bad. I'll confess this to you. Don't tell anybody. You know, I'll go through a whole course on applied machine learning. And I won't do anything Bayesian at all. So that's pretty bad. Uh, but I, I do, you know, that's to me the central picture. Uh, and we will accomplish that kind of idea through a, a Bayesian model, okay? So we have all these ideas and I haven't said anything about Bayes yet. So how does this relate to Bayes? Is somebody want to just have the big picture up before we launch into BART? Okay, so this is one of those, I probably already said everything, let's see. So one of the big ideas, we want to have complex models with many parameters so we can capture high dimensional relationships, but we don't want to overfit. So we have to shrink towards simpler models. Okay. Uh, so in the Bayesian approach, we can use the prior. So what I'm going to go through just very simply a little bit of time. Uh, so you may, so somebody might be here who's never seen a Bayesian anything before. So I want to make clear this idea of, uh, you, you can think of the prior as a way of shrinking. So when we do get into BART, we'll be the title of the slide will be the BART regularization prior. So I'm just trying to give us that background so that that means something to us. So this is called regularization, adding on that penalty so that you can sh shrink the model towards a simpler solution. Okay. So in a Bayesian approach, we can use the prior to shrink towards simple models. 
Okay. So now I can say in one line, why is BART great? Because it does exactly this in a nice way. We have a fundamentally complicated model. Good. That means I can figure out nonlinear interaction, complicated things in my, in my data, in my process, generating the data, probably, perhaps would be a better way to put it. But I have a prior that works. I have a prior that I can understand, a prior that can shrink the model towards simpler models, simpler instances, so that I don't overfit. Okay. So I guess I'm, you know, I'm foolishly trying to do this such that if you knew absolutely nothing, you'd be able to follow in some sense. Okay. So obviously uh, some of you here know a lot, so be a little patient with me, but I, but I think these ideas I'm talking about, they're the things that are always in the back of our head. So it doesn't hurt every once in a while to, to go through them. Maybe not everybody's done a Bayesian analysis at all. Oh, let's see. So probably this is what I just said. So BART. So BART stands for Bayesian Additive Regression Trees. So we're going to build a high-dimensional nonlinear model. Uh, this is inspired by the the boosting literature, pretty pretty directly. Uh, and uh, we have a sophisticatedly simple prior that allows us to shrink towards simpler models. Okay. Uh, so a fundamental reason, and I will make this very explicit as the day goes on, why is BART successful? It's because even though I have a pretty complex model, I'm able to come up with a fairly a relatively simple prior specification that allows me to do all this stuff that I'm talking about, okay? So correct me if I'm wrong, there's a ton of research on Bayesian approaches in neural networks. I don't th think they're as successful as BART because it's not easy to put a prior on all those weights in a neural network and do all the calculations, okay? So BART is a stunning example, if I may say so, of actually being able to put a prior that's comprehensible on these high dimensional models and use it effectively. Okay. So for example, one thing that BART does that I think very few other things do is there's a default setting. And if you run the default BART setting, you do pretty damn good, pretty consistently. That is certainly not true for say neural networks. Neural networks takes a lot more tuning, okay? So uh, if you're new, that's maybe that that's, should maybe be a little bit interesting. If you're not new, you shouldn't believe me. <laughs> you should go, there's no way that's not possible. Okay. So the, the structure of the prior is the big win. Uh, and then of course, there's a computational algorithm, uh, which is in some sense less creative. It's a fairly straightforward Markov chain Monte Carlo. But still fundamental to the success of the thing as a practical thing. And we'll talk about that too. So part often works well with little, and I just said no tuning. <laughs> and that's because of the success of this prior specification. Okay. So um, you all have this book, right? Introduction to Statistical Learning. It is truly a wonderful book. Uh, and uh, they have labs at the end of each chapter of how you're supposed to do it in R. So I was just looking through the lab on tree-based methods. And on this data, on the example, in this wonderful book, the test error of BART is the best. <laughs> okay, so obviously I'm cherry picking, but this happens, <laughs> okay? That you just run BART and I, I you know, if I checked the lab, they didn't do a lot of tuning or BART. They probably ran the default and they beat everything else they were doing. And these people know trees. You know, we're talking about Trevor Hasty, and we're not talking about somebody who's never done it before. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about Bayes and priors, but let's back up 
And uh, it's still true that not everybody sees Bayesian ideas in their education. Or so let's just back up and do the simplest, you know, what is Bayes? Just remember what the prior is and how it works. Uh, I'll do the simplest possible example I can do of a Bayesian analysis. And then I'll quickly uh, try to give a sketch how the simple ideas uh, scale up, scale up to more complicated modeling situations. Okay. And then I'll also try to just remind you of some of the intellectual underpinnings of Bayesian analysis. But I, I don't think the intellectual underpinnings are why it's so popular. It's popular for the right reason, which is that it works. Okay. Okay. So I, I got to tell you this little story. So my father's actually a, was a very, very famous scientist. My father's credited with the discovery of stem cells. So if you Google Ernest McCullough, then he, he's, you know, you're going to get to the Wikipedia page. So, you know, I'm an example of the regression effect. You know, I'm, I'm not nearly as successful or as good. I'm, I'm not bad. You know, it's like, you know, Wayne Gretzky's kids, pretty good player, but he's not Wayne Gretzky, you know? Um, so there was a time, you know, you like every week, my dad was getting a new award, you know? So I went to this dinner, you know, with all these famous scientists and they said, okay, what's busy in statistics? And I kind of babbled. I didn't give a good answer. And uh, these guys are super smart, right? And one of the way people smart people judge you is how quickly and clearly you can just nail a simple idea. So I could see them going, fail, <laughs> boom, you're no good. Because I just got one of those head spaces where I was thinking about too many things. Okay. So I'm going to list out the, the three of the too many things I was thinking about when they asked me that question later on. But I would say the number one reason Bayes is good because you, you just it's just based on simple probability. And that's it. What's the theory of Bayes? P of X, Y, theta. <laughs> that's it. Okay. And this is wonderful. So that's the real strength that it's just based on basic probability ideas. And then as I'll quickly sketch for you, uh, we can build complex probability models out of modeling pieces. So I always think of the car. <laughs> cars are pretty damn good, right? And cars are pretty, and it's an incredible engineering feat. For example, a famous frequentist just told me that my BART thing was crap because it had too many moving pieces. It was too complicated. So that's, that, that's an interesting and it's plausibly valid criticism, but I was like, you know, okay, by that reasoning, you should only ride a bicycle. You should never drive a car. But how do they build these incredibly sophisticated cars? They build them out of components. So a, a big reason that Bayesian thing, thinking is powerful is we can build models out of components. We can get complexity out of simple components. And, and I'll try to argue that. Okay, so why is Bayes great? Because it's just probability. Now there's, you can go on forever about what you mean by that. Like what is probability? You can really get bogged down in that one if you want. Okay, okay so let's just do the most basic, basic example. So suppose we're assuming that the Y's are IID Bernoulli. So here, my, I already used theta for my parameter. So I should have said this. Uh, so often it's just, it's just we start with a model of P of Y given theta, where Y is an observable, the, the data you're going to get, and theta is some structural parameter describing the model you hope will describe the process generating Y. So the simplest case you can possibly write down, I think, is the Ys are IID Bernoulli with parameter P. So here theta is just that one parameter, P. Okay. So this would be the a model you learn in stat 100. Okay. So how do we do Bayesian inference? So we start, we still start with this P of Y given theta usually. And then what's different about Bayes is we add the prior distribution P of theta. Okay. 
So I'll pause because for some people that's a deal breaker right there. They go, okay, I don't want to do that. Okay. But the beauty of it is once I add P of theta, then I have P of the joint of Y and theta because I have the marginal for theta. See, that's basic probability, right? All you have to know is that the joint is the marginal times the conditional and you're good. Okay. And then once I have the joint distribution for Y and theta, I'm good to go. So I think it's just the simplicity of that that makes Bayes fundamentally wonderful. Okay. Uh, notice that I'm using P. So here's P of Y theta, P of theta, P. I'm reusing P. It's you're it's like a overloading an operator. <laughs> okay, the, the function is defined by its arguments. Okay. So uh, once we have P of Y theta, well, of course, we can compute P of theta given Y because it's just proportional to the joint, which is that. Okay. And then we often call this, we observe Y, so it's a fixed known. So we often call this the likelihood function. So I'm going to suppress Y. So the likelihood is just P of Y given theta for fixed Y. Of course, you should fix Y. You, you know what Y is. It is fixed. <laughs> How can you not be a Bayesian? I mean, isn't that obvious? Come on. You know what's made me a Bayesian more than anything is having to teach intro stats. You're trying to explain the frequentist stuff and it obviously is wrong. It's just obviously wrong. And you're like, oh man. So you kind of wave your hands. Okay, I see why. Then I just create this as a function of theta. And then this is the, the famous equation. That's Bayesian statistics. That's all you have. Yeah, okay. So maybe I'll warn you. Uh, often I try to make more and more extreme statements just to see how far I can go to, to, take, to break it. Like, how extreme can I make this statement I, until it's obviously wrong or too ridiculous, right? Uh, but this is, guess what I was trying to say? That is absolutely trivial and incredibly powerful. And that is wonderful. And all BART is that, but I'm going to make theta interesting. All BART is that, but I'm going to make P of theta interesting. Okay, okay so let's go ahead and do it for our Bernoulli problem and see how great it is to be a Bayesian. Uh, so again, some people go, oh, I don't be Bayesian because I don't want to have to choose the prior. It was bad enough picking P of Y given theta. Now you're telling me I have to pick P of theta too. Uh, we could talk about that one for a while. Let, let, let me choose not to get bogged down in that one. To ridicule that one. So uh, for this problem, for the Bernoulli problem, I have to pick a prior. So I'll pick the beta distribution because that gives me a distribution on, remember theta is P. So theta is between zero and one. And then there's the density of a beta. And so what's my likelihood? I just multiply the likelihood for individual observations up because I've assumed their IID. Usually the most ridiculous thing you do, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> okay. And that gives me this likelihood in terms of theta where S is the number of times, sorry, the Y's are all zeros or ones. So for an individual observation, it's uh, that'll be Theta, if y is one, one minus theta, if y is zero. That's the probability. You multiply that up and you just add up all the y's, which are the, that'll give you s, which is the sum of the y's, the number of times you got a one. Then you'll have one minus, the, you've also, okay. Let, let me assume you've all seen this. But I just, let's remember it, write it as a likelihood, okay? And so here we go. Let's just do that. So there's my prior where I drop the proportionality constant. If it doesn't have theta, I don't care about it. And this is when you actually do the details of these stuff, that's, oh man, is that ever nice. Okay, so remember it's proportional. So I just have, I only write down the things that have theta in them. So I write down this part here. 
and I write down this part here and I multiply them together and I get that. And in this case, our computation algorithm is incredibly straightforward because once we see this, we recognize it's just a beta again. But we have to update the beta parameters. So we have to, instead of alpha and beta, we have alpha plus s, beta plus m minus s. Okay. So, um, so that's a beautiful example of a Bayesian analysis. We want to get inference for that parameter theta, which is the memory p. We wrote down the beta prior. We multiply the likely times the prior. We see the posterior, the theta given y is also a beta. And we just have a simple update of the parameters of the beta. In the prior, the parameters of the beta were alpha and beta. It's a little confusing. We just add s to alpha and n minus s to beta. And that's our posterior. Okay. So I want to infer the probability that at least we'll score in a power play. I have data on 26 plus 74 power plays, 26% of the time. 26 times they scored on the power power play, the other times they failed. Okay, so y is one if least score on the power play, y is zero if they fail to score on the power play. Okay, and then I choose, so I had to choose my prior. <laughs> How did I do it? I choose, uh, so the alpha in the prior was three, the beta in the prior was 10. So here's my calculation of the posterior. I just have to add 26, the number of successes, the number of times least scored on the power play to the alpha, and the number of times they failed to the beta. Okay. So this situation where we specify a, a parametric form for the prior and the posterior has the same parametric form, we call that a conjugate prior. Okay, so the updating just updates the, the conjugate parameters. And this basically works in exponential family. And a huge, as we all know, a lot of our models are exponential family because you basically only get a finite dimensional sufficient statistic if you have exponential family. So if it's not an exponential family, you have a big problem. Um, so that seems like a tremendous limitation and it is, but as we're gonna see, because we can build models up complex, complex models from pieces, we can use these. Uh, so what, what you do is you build complicated models out of little pieces and each piece could be comp conjugate, but the overall thing is anything but conjugate. And we'll, we'll look at a simple example of that before we launch into BART. Okay. So it's, it's one of these annoying things in, in being a Bayesian is you, you wanna do these new models, complex high dimensional models, but you still have to go back and learn all these details from like the 1960s <laughs> about the, the, all the different details of the conjugate models. And you have to know them cold. And some of them, you know, by the time you get to a, a multivariate uh, regression or something like that, there's a little detail there, but it's the same idea as what we just did. Okay. okay. So it's wonderful being a Bayesian. I just plotted my, uh, here's the prior. So that was the alpha and beta that I chose for my prior. I saw the data in the light of the data. There's the posterior. So why is base grade? Because it's simple. What could be simpler than that? Before you saw the data, you believe the red. After you see the data, you believe the blue. Why do you go from the red to the blue? Basic probability. Okay, so the claim that you should be skeptical about is that I can take this set of ideas and apply them to a modeling situation which, which has thousands, hundreds of thousands of parameters in an effective way. Okay. So that's the claim for the whole workshop, which you should be deeply skeptical about. Good. A very naive question. So, uh, if your prior is uniform, okay, pretend you don't have any information. Prior. Then you have your your see your data. Then you got your posterior. Is that a posterior equivalent to 
the frequentist approach? Uh, in general, no. Okay. In some, uh, if you're estimating a normal mean with a known variance, then, then it's basically equivalent. So in some very sp specific cases, they're, they're, they are equivalent, but in general, no. In general, no. That's an excellent naive question that's haunted us since the beginning of Bayesian time. Uh, so uh, let me just mention it, but then move on. Okay. Uh, so I say you got to choose the prior. It's very, very tempting <laughs> to say, oh, I don't know. I'll just make it uniform. Okay. And so it's important to realize that that doesn't work. Uh, for a couple of reasons, but maybe the most obvious reason is if I just do a change of variable from the uniform, if I just change to a reparameterization one to one, it won't be uniform anymore. So uh, you, you're kind of fooling yourself. Yeah, it's, it's just another, it's just another prior choice. You, you've really chosen something by not choosing. I'm going to agree with that statement. That's a fact, but that was kind of fun. The gentleman took it from uh, choosing a prior for the Bernoulli problem to a fundamental fact of life. <laughs> People refuse to accept this. There's a great Camus short story about this called uh, Lot. Read that one. Not choosing is choosing. We could talk about that for a while. And that's been an issue that has haunted, you know, how you have to choose the prior. And we're talking about the Bernoulli parameter. Why not just make it uniform? Any issue about difficulty in choosing the prior explodes. I'm not gonna be using this for the Bernoulli prior. I'm gonna be using this for a model with thousands of parameters. And the difficulties of specifying a prior in high dimensions, that really is an issue, okay? That's why BART is great. That's probably the fundamental thing that makes BART great is that there's a, even though it's a high dimensional thing, you're able to choose a prior that's sensible. So that all these lovely ideas we're talking about actually come through in a complex high dimensional model. Okay, we can end the workshop right now. That's what you needed to know. Go forth and prosper. But in this case, if you choose a, a uniform, you still get a Bernoulli posterior, I mean, a beta posterior. So in, in this case, it's... Uh, it's a bad example because the uniform looks good. <laughs> okay, but notice that my prior was not, I didn't choose it. Anyway, um, actually that's a ridiculous prior because I know darn well the amount of my life that I have spent slash wasted watching hockey, playing hockey. <laughs> what day is today? Wednesday. Wednesday. I'm missing hockey in Santa Fe right now. If I was in Santa Fe, I would be playing hockey. Anyway, uh, I, Okay, let's not get bogged. This would be a great, this is a great place to get bogged down because, you know, I get upset about it. Come on, get a life. It's fun to pick P of theta. You should be picking P of theta. I know damn well it's not uniform. Nobody scores 90% of the time on a power play. It's ridiculous. If anything, the whole issue of putting prior information is ridiculously unexploited. It's a crime. It's pure computational laziness. Oh, I, anyway. See, I can get all upset about that. So let's move on. Or I can just say it's interesting, okay? Um, so another basic thing that's gonna pervade everything we do as we go through the workshop is the idea of Monte Carlo. Um, so this, this is just a way to make the Bayesian analysis particularly expressive, okay? So if you're a frequentist and you get a frequentist interval for data, but then I want some frequency, interval for f of theta, what do I have to do? Well, I have to do the delta method, right? Or something like that, remember, remember that one? You have to do Taylor's theorem or redo all your asymptotics, okay? Well, in high dimensional models, we have all kinds of different marginals of the model that we want to examine. And the whole delta method is ridiculous because does that work? Is the asymptotics correct? So there's a bunch of issues there. But again, let me just show you the simplest possible example to illustrate what I'm talking about. But we'll, everything we do in BART will use this approach. 
Okay. So everything that we do with BART is going to be a, a nice simple prior for a high dimensional model. Everything we do in BART is going to be Monte Carlo. Okay. So what do I mean by Monte Carlo? So suppose I have P of theta uh, given Y and uh, what does have mean? I don't like this slide. So have means I can get IID draws. Right, sorry, let's, let's be vague about that. I can get draws of theta from the posterior. So have is a funny word here, right? When I write P of theta given Y, what does have mean? I have code to evaluate it. <laughs> I have, <laughs> what does have mean? Uh, so let's say have means I have an algorithm for drawing from that distribution. Okay. And let's suppose that instead of theta, I really want to think about f of theta, where some f is some function. So I'm going to do this in by my Bernoulli case, where theta is in zero one, and then f of theta is going to be a simple function. But I, I need you to be thinking a little bit ahead to get excited. You know, I'm going to be doing this all day, where theta is very high dimensional, and there's all kinds of different functions of that high dimensional thing I want to understand. Okay. But it's super simple. I get it draws theta j from the posterior distribution of theta given the data. And then for every draw of theta j, I just evaluate the function f at that draw. And now I have draws of the gamma j. And those draws represent the marginal distribution of gamma. Okay. So everything we do in BART is going to work exactly that way. We're going to have draws of an underlying theta which you don't even want to look at, it's so complicated, but we simply evaluate functions of that theta and report those, okay? So as an example of my Bernoulli thing, suppose I actually wanted the odds ratio, theta over one minus theta. Well, in this simple case, I can do the change of variables, I can do the math, but who would ever do the math? <laughs> I'm gonna get, IID draws, so what do I do? I'm just going to get IID draws of theta. For every draw of theta, I'll compute gamma, and then I'll just look at the draws of gamma. I don't have to do any math. Who's got time for that? But I'm assuming that there's a R you can draw from the beta distribution in your software environment. That's what I'm assuming. <clears throat> okay. So uh, here I drew from the prior of theta, because it's a beta. Here I drew from the uh, prior of gamma. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to look at, this gets back to, <laughs> see if I put a uniform prior on theta, is that going to give me a uniform prior on gamma? See, that's this is an example we were talking about before. Okay, so I, if I was really interested in gamma, does that mean I should? <sighs> so I get draws from the prior of theta, then easily I can get draws from the prior of gamma just by evaluating that function. And then just repeat it for the posterior. So now I have prior of theta, prior of gamma, posterior of theta, posterior of gamma with very, very little work, okay? So in this case, you could, you know, this would be a simple little test question, right? Do the change of variable, blah, 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 blah. But as soon as it gets the least bit complicated, you don't want to do it. Even if you can do it, you don't want to do it. So the Monte Carlo thing is fundamental to applied Bayesian work, you know, putting aside all the other issues. And then I can just look at, so here's the prior of theta. I just do the histogram of the draws. Here's the posterior of theta. There's the histogram of the draws. And I just drew the actual posterior over just to remind you that the histogram is a density estimate. And then I just look at the draws of, here's the prior of gamma, see? What's the odds ratio, right? Then here's the posterior of gamma, okay? So that's something that's fundamental to the software, to everything we do with, with BART and lots of Bayesian stuff, is that you're gonna get draws of theta. Typically theta is complex and may have almost nothing on the face of it that you wanna look at that's interesting to you, but there's some marginal that you care about. And we just use this Monte Carlo strategy, okay? I just wanna interrupt, say, uh, you know, you say, you could do the math, but sometimes the math is really complex. Like if you do the difference between two betas, uh, it really is a, uh, it's not trivial. 
when I said you could do the math, I was referring to this specific problem <laughs> of estimating the Bernoulli P and using the odds ratio. You're absolutely right. You don't even have to get high dimensional, blah, 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 to make it something you don't want to do. There's a pain to buy. Absolutely, I completely agree with that comment. Uh, the, and here I just, instead of doing a histogram, I just did the density smooth. I guess I had time on my hands. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's basic base. Did the simplest possible example. But as we went through it, I tried to emphasize those issues, which will still be relevant when we moved on to a more complex model. The other practical issue that I think is fundamentally nice with Bayes and fundamentally nice with Bayesian Monte Carlo is that of prediction. So uh, a basic area where I think machine learning just beats statistics is to focus on the applied problem of prediction as opposed to estimating parameters of models. Okay. So uh, my advisor was Seymour Geyser. Geyser G-E-I-S-S-E-R. And he was one of the first people in statistics to advocate cross-validation. My, my, my father invented stem cells. I say that's supposed to be funny, invented. I guess he discovered them. My advisor uh, invented cross-validation. That's, that's pretty good. So the beauty of cross-validation that machine learning is just to keep your eye on the ball, to make predictions as opposed to estimating. Okay. So my advisor, Seymour Geyser, was a Bayesian, but he was a Bayesian. His, his number one motivation for being a Bayesian is because his number one goal was prediction. It didn't work that he became a Bayesian and then went on prediction. He became a predictivist. He said our focus should be on prediction, not estimation. And then that led him to be a Bayesian. So why? Well, because it just fits in very, very straightforward if you're a Bayesian. So again, I have P of theta given Y. I forget about the Bernoulli thing. Okay, that was just an example. But I have to be able to get draws. I still want to be a Monte Carlo person. So I can get draws theta J from that posterior. And then for every theta J, I'll draw Y given that theta J. And then those draws of Y are draws from the predictive distribution of Y. That gives you uncertainty about the future observable Y. Okay. And I think you can argue that that's our fundamental problem. That's what we wanna, that is what we wanna do. That's what we should be focusing on. You can make things a little bit more complicated by saying, uh, well, what about causal inference is a little different. Maybe that's a major, that would be another major modern area. It's so big causal inference. But I, I think I can cast causal inference as a special case of this or a particular case of this. But I'm not sure I wouldn't put that down as the fundamental goal. Okay. Okay. So that's my intro. So let me just do a, a, one more little example before I actually do the example of the day, which is BART, which is a mixture modeling, just to give you a, a relatively simple example of how we can do what I've been talking about. That is, take these basic ideas and jump them up to a more complicated model in a, in a nice, clean, probabilistic way. Okay. And again, uh, this, this process, and I'll be able to, I'll be able to straight, illustrate the idea of building up a complicated model out of simpler components. And uh, that's really one of the major reasons why Bayesian thinking is so important now, this kind of technology. Okay, so I would like to do mixture modeling. So here, Y is a mixture of normals. So PJ is the weight that goes on the Jth normal component. And that normal component has a mean, normal mean mu J and a normal standard deviation sigma J. Okay. Uh, so mixture modeling is on my list of things. You just gotta know, it's just amazing. You know, you go from, oh, everything's normal. That's ridiculous. And then you go to mixture modeling and without too much work, you're really, really flexible in a wonderful, wonderful way. It's a great technology. So this is a relatively simple example compared to BART, I would say, um, but it's a pretty damn good example, I think. 
I, I love mixture model. Okay, so I want to build a probability model, which enables me to fit the mixture model. Okay, so what's what's theta? <laughs> it's not p anymore, right? So first of all, I have the so p is going to be all the probabilities for the different components. So capital J is the number of components. Then I have a vector of the normal means for each component, and I have a vector of the normal sigmas for the, each component. Okay. And now we're going to do something that often happens in Bayesian statistics. Uh, we're going to introduce another random variable besides the ones that I've talked about, a latent random variable. Okay? So this is another way that Bayesian modeling is super powerful. I'm going to introduce I, and I is going to denote the mixture component that a Y comes from. So you don't have to think this way. That's just a way of getting you mixed. You just compute this, and you can get all kinds of densities out of it. But in order to do a bit interesting Bayesian analysis, I'm going to make up a story. And the story is that each observation is generated by first choosing one of those normal components and then drawing from that normal component. Marginally, that's the same as this. But it's, it's an elaborate elaboration. It's another story, another way to think about it. So I'm going to in interpret P1 as the probability that an observation comes from component one. Okay. You don't have to do that. <laughs> I can just write this down and write the likelihood. Okay, well, let's do it that way. Okay, so probably of I given P, the probability that I equals J is PJ. That's just a multi newly, they call it machine learning, right? Multi newly. I have to vote a prior on mu. I'm going to assume all the mu's are independent. So it's the product of all the P of mu J's. See, I'm, it, I'm already making heroic assumptions, right? Everything. <laughs> I'm going to assume all the sigma j's are independent. Otherwise, what the hell am I going to do? <sighs> so I have a pretty big space of random variables all of a sudden that I'm working with, as opposed to my Bernoulli example. Uh, so every observation is going to have an I associated with it, saying which component it came from. So I'm, if I have n observations, I'm going to have n values of the indicator. I'm going to have the probability vector, and I'm going to have the vector of mu's and the vector of sigmas. Okay, so that's not that's not super complicated, but it's a lot more complicated than my Bernoulli example. And uh, I guess I'm going to claim that if you get the hang of this one, the way this comes together, then there's a lot of Bayesian papers you can read, knowing that this is the game. I'll, I'll go, go stronger. A lot of the good Bayesian papers you might want to read <laughs> uh, basically kind of follow this program as opposed to the ones that maybe you don't want to read. Okay. So I have a, a probability model for everything that I'm thinking about, and it has a structure. Uh, so, first of all, if you give me that probability vector, I can draw an indicator for any y, which component it came from. And then if I know the vector of mu and the vector of sigmas, then I can draw y. So this representation of the model is called a, a DAG, directed acyclic graph. And it's a very, very nice way of understanding the structure of all the variables related. So many Bayesian models are simplified by thinking of them in terms of their DAG. And then what do I need? I need a complete probability model for everything. And I went from one parameter between zero and one to a fair number of things going on, right? And of course, we're going to have more things going on when we, do, when we actually get around to BART. So P is the probability vector. I is for each observation, an indicator saying which component it came from. Mu is the vector of normal means. Sigma is the vector of normal standard, standard deviations. Y is the actual observed data. Okay, so now I need a joint distribution on all of that. Or because remember how excited I was? I was a little excited, right? Oh, if I just have a probability model, everything is nice. Then you go, oh, come on. Oh, that was fine with the Bernoulli, Rob. Oh, actually, it wasn't even fine with the Bernoulli. We could have talked about that for forever. How the hell are you going to do it with all these things? Well, it's because this joint breaks down in, in these components. 
You know, it's I given P and that component, it's not hard. It's just a multi -nulli. come on. So I can build a complicated model out of all these components. And then from this DAG, I can just read off this factorization of the joint. Okay. So this is a very, very powerful idea. This is my car analogy. Okay, a car is pretty damn complicated. If you say build a car, forget about it. You're never going to do it. But those are, somewhere in Ford, there's a DAG for a car. <laughs> Where they say how all these components work together. So the idea of building complexity up out of simplicity, that seems like a, bi a big winner to me. Okay. Uh, so that's the big idea. I think coupled with this idea of building up complex models out of these components, we have the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo. So before I tried to argue that Monte Carlo was actually a fundamental piece of Bayesian analysis, one of the things that made being a Bayesian just super powerful and super easy in practice. Uh, so I need to be able to get draws from these joints. So that's not always the easiest thing in the world. Okay, so if you want look up an algorithm from drawing from a beta, that's not going to be that hard. But now I need to be able to draw from these high dimensional distributions. So that's where a Markov chain Monte Carlo comes in. So it's a very general device for enabling us to draw from these the, from the posterior of these models. So again, oh, I have it right here. So my model is this. So here's where Bayes is simple, right? Here's my model. What do I want? That. <laughs> okay. And I had to be smart the way I built that joint. But now it's just a technical problem. I want draws from that conditional. So I'm going to do it using Markov chain Monte Carlo. So what that means is rather than getting IID draws, so if you just say Monte Carlo, it's assumed you're getting in the IID draws from the distribution like this. That's fair. I think that's fair. So Markov chain Monte Carlo means I get draws and I'm going to use those draws pretty much the way I use in straight Monte Carlo, but it happens that the draws are dependent rather than being independent. Okay. So in a sense, that's a big switch. And if you're not used to that, I'm going to ask you not to worry about it today. I'm not going to try to really explain Markov chain Monte Carlo completely. Because at the end of the day, we're going to use the draws exactly the same way you did in the IED case. I want to understand some function. I just compute that function of the draws and I look at the histogram exactly like I did in the Bernoulli case. Okay. Well, let me uh, sketch out what I mean by Markov chain Monte Carlo here. So the idea is, so what's Markov chain mean? Rather than getting IID draws of, so I need draws of all this stuff. Okay. So that's a little bit complicated, more complicated than my Bernoulli example, much less complicated than my Bart example. But the whole idea is it's the same idea, okay? I only understand Bart easily because I understand this easily. That's why we're doing it. So I want draws from this. So what you do is you, you have an initial, you have to have a starting value for it. So you have values for all those, these things. And then you're going to update each one one at a time. So I want a new value for P. What I do is I draw P from the conditional distribution given everything else. So I've updated P. Then I want to update I. I draw I conditional on everything else. Now I have a new I. Draw mu given everything else, draw sigma everything else. So once I've drawn from each one of these conditionals, I've updated all the parameters. I have a new draw. So that's where it's Markov chain as opposed to IID. I have a current draw. My next draw depends on my current draw. But it's engineered so that I can do exactly the same thing I did in the IID case. That is, I can just look at the draws and that's the marginal. I can just look at evaluate functions on those draws and that's the marginal posterior of the quantity of interest. Okay. So, uh, this is an incredible technology. This, you draw out the DAG, you can understand the structure of the joint distribution. It also gives you all kinds of insights into the nature of these conditional distributions you might wanna draw from. So for example, the conditional distribution of P 
In principle, I, I want to condition on everything else, including the particular y. But it's kind of obvious from the DAG that the conditional p, given everything else, will only depend on i. This, you know, p generates i, and then i generates other stuff, but who cares? If you know i, the other stuff doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so that's incredibly important in practice. Probably the vast majority of useful Bayesian papers over the last 20 years, maybe, how long, I don't have, <laughs> maybe more, more than 20, basically follow this program. You develop a fairly complicated model. You have a joint structure that can be described by some sort of simplification, often a DAG, maybe not always, but often. And then that conditional structure of that model lends itself to a nice, uh, to this algorithm. This the algorithm I just outlined is called Gibbs sampling. So that's a special case of Markov chain Monte Carlo. So Gibbs sampling means you update your parameters by drawing from a bunch of conditionals and cycling through the conditionals. Yeah. So that's a pretty easy algorithm to describe. Uh, the technical property that it has is that the stationary distribution of that Markov chain will be the posterior. So if you know some stochastic processes, that's like, oh, cool. If you don't, I encourage you to ignore it. That's something I want to be a kind of real intuitive about today. I can get draws. Let's just keep going. What, what's Bayesian non parametrics? I just uh, want to say that uh, one of the things about uh, um, these mixtures is how many mixtures to have, and we'll get into that tomorrow. Exactly, and I'm going to touch on that right now. Well, uh, you know, we have a break at 10.15. How do you want to do this? Uh, what time is it now? It's 10.11. I can finish in 10 minutes or five minutes almost. All right, go ahead. Okay, so um, what's, so I, remember my, now let's go back to my machine learning world. I wanna have these flexible models. What does flexible mean from a Bayesian thing viewpoint? It's, it's, it's a weird thing. Bayesian non-parametrics, is lots of parameters, <laughs> okay? Plus, not only do you have lots of parameters, but you don't have a fixed dimension of the parameter vector. You want the parameter vector to have the ability to grow in size, to adapt to the data, to become more complicated or less complicated. That's cool. A basic example of that, that Rodney was uh, talking about was, uh, when you go to do this mixture modeling, you here I've, assumed I know the number of components I want to do. So how do you choose the components, number of components in practice? That's a great, that's a, a fundamental problem in statistics. If you go into uh, Adrian Raftery's R package, they use BIC and I've mocked BIC my entire life as a crude Bayesian approach, but dang it, if it doesn't work pretty well. So you just choose the number of components by BIC and it works amazingly well. Yeah, I used to just mock BIC, but then that one switched me. It's like, okay, if it works, it works. Okay. But you can do a, a Bayesian non parametric analysis, which allows the dimension of the, the parameter space, that is the number of components, to vary as part of your parameters of your model. BART will have the same characteristic. The dimension of the model will change. Okay. So that's a big picture idea. That's pretty fundamental, right? Not only do I have this incredible Bayesian inference for high dimensional parameter spaces, I can actually have a variable dimension in my parameter space. Absolutely fundamental to BART, as we're gonna see. Okay, so, uh, so now, I, now it's the part I can skip, which is Bayesian foundations, because I tried to give you a feeling for, just as a practical matter, why this is an exciting thing to do, why it's a useful thing to do. Okay, but when I was a lad, we didn't have computers. We just had abacuses when I was young. <laughs> uh, so we just talked about what, why, why it might be interesting. So there, there were found. So I'm claiming that that's why Bayes is important. That's the answer I should have given to these famous scientists when they asked me. Instead, I babbled. 
because I had all this stuff in my mind. So when I was growing up, uh, so I do think that complete class theorem is something that I bear in mind sometimes. So if you do a formal decision theoretic approach to statistics, at the end of the day, there's this theorem that says, if you want to have a admissible rule, it has to be a Bayes rule. And if you want to have a, and a Bayes rule is always admissible. Admissible isn't quite the same thing as a good rule. It's like a, a not terribly crappy rule. And this has been super interesting because lots of people who didn't want to be Bayesians became empirical Bayesians because they knew damn well if they wanted to get something that worked, they better act like a Bayesian, even if you would never catch them saying they were Bayesian. That's interesting. So the complete class theorem is a basic theoretical result that I, in the back of my mind, I think that's useful. But I don't need any of this stuff. I can stop. I'm just telling you what you'll, you'll see people talk about. Perhaps this is the one that I grew up with the most. So DeFinetti, Savage, all these people in the 50s developed this elegant theory that laid out axioms for personal decision making. And they proved theorems that saying, if you want to be, be a personal decision maker in such a way that you're not incoherent, that you can not make, have somebody bet against you and always win against you, then you have to act like a Bayesian. And of the foundational things, that's probably the one that I believe in the most. And there's all kinds of interesting things associated with this. I think this quickly lends you down to what is probability? Well, of course, it's subjective. It's not objective. That's ridiculous. Lots of people would shoot me for that, right? So we can, you know, when I was a lad, we got bogged down and all bogged down. We had fun talking about these things. And it was intellectually exciting. Oh, I forgot the likelihood principle. Damn it, I'm missing one. I'll change the slide tonight. I forgot the likelihood principle. That was a big, that's how, maybe how I became a Bayesian. I read Birnbaum's proof of the likelihood principle. I forgot one. And then, but a lot of my friends also uh, like DeFinetti's theorem a lot. DeFinetti's theorem says, well, who cares about theta? Basically, I want to think about observables. But if the observables are exchangeable, you can prove that there is, it's, there is an underlying parameter, or you can think of it that way. So theta is, to me, is always like a latent variable that was introduced, <laughs> would be one way to think about it, okay? So I'm just quickly thinking that there are lots of intellectual foundations to Bayesian thought, which are fascinating. Some of them kind of inform how I feel about things, but I don't need any of these things. So if I go out with Paul Damien or, or Richard Hahn, I have to listen to DeFinetti's theorem. When I go to work, it's much more like my mixture modeling example. I'm trying to build a high dimensional probability model and figure out an algorithm and code it up in C++ so it works. And that's, that's what I do. I think I already said that. So, <laughs> I always, why isn't everybody a Bayesian? Well, okay, come on. It can be hard to come up with these high dimensional parameters. Bart is an example of somebody who got it to work. But if you say neural nets are important, do a Bayesian neural net, I'm going to say, ah, I'm not so sure about that one. Okay? So pulling this off in high dimensions is not a gimme. That would be the reason not to be Bayesian. If you could, then I don't see any reason not to be Bayesian. It's so beautiful. But there's just a technical issue there. So doing these two pieces, coming up with a prior and coming up with a computational strategy, it's, you know, that can be daunting. So what I'm going to argue after the break is that Bart does it all, pulls it off, and it's tough to beat. So just one more thing. Oh, look, it's one slide, okay? So just to tie together in a fundamental way, uh, lots of different big issues we've talked about. Uh, so when we do Bart, the title, which I think Ed George wrote, is Regularization Prior for Bart. Okay, so I just want to go into this saying, well, it, let's be intuitive about what, you know, why Ed wrote it that way. Okay, so what? there's our beloved base theorem right there. So I'm going to take the log <laughs> that equation. So the log of the posterior is the log of the prior plus the log of the likelihood 
And I, that C is for a constant because that's the proportionality there. So that will just give me a constant there. And then it's somewhat useful. Certainly when we talk about intuitively about BART, it's going to be helpful for us to remember this idea of, you know, if, if I so think about optimizing this. Okay, so that's the log likelihood. So if you maximize that, that would be like maximizing your fit on the data. You know, if I take the minus of that, it's the residual sum of squares for a normal model, for example. In the Bernoulli model, if I take the negative, it's the cross entropy, which every machine learner knows about. So the likelihood, I can just use the likelihood as a measure of fit. And then what does this log prior do? I can view that as a regularization term if I'm a machine learner. That prior, I can put into that prior preferences for simpler models. I can put into that prior a belief in shrinkage. Okay. So this is how, with by taking the log, the Bayesian thing fits very nicely into kind of the big machine learning regularization ideas we worked in. Rob made an outrageous claim. That's my goal is to make outrageous claims and see how many I can get away with. So my outrageous claim is I can run the default BART and it'll work pretty well. How could that be? It's because I have a regularization prior. I have a prior that automatically shrinks towards a simple model so that I don't overfit. And I don't have to, I can be a Bayesian. I can forget about all that bias variance. I don't need the bias variance straight off. Uh, I, I take that back. I do think about that all the time. But uh, I can cook up a sensible prior that shrinks towards simpler models, even if this model is quite complicated. And that will be a fundamental part of the BART process. Okay, so that was my attempt to, suppose you knew nothing. <laughs> all of statistics, all of machine learning. Uh, but touch on some of the big picture ideas that will drive why BART works. You want to take some questions now and then, and then we'll sure. take a break. All right, if you can. Um... But anybody have any favorites on the left down? We all do this, right? This is our lives, all this crap. I can ask a question. So uh, in your DEX draw, the, the drawing algorithm and I learned from my uh, business class. So, so you start from a random state, right? And well, starting values. So when I did Markov team, my color said you have it in a draw and you get a new draw by yep. iterating the chain. Starting values, sometimes starting values is not an issue. Sometimes it is. So uh, more like I don't want to wave my hands over that. Sometimes I agonize over starting values in a complicated situation. Sometimes I, may, I feel like I can blow it off. Or identifying which starting values you have to worry about and which ones you don't <laughs> can be an interesting part of the process. So my question is more like, you already have your true why, observe the why. And how can you draw an algorithm connected with that observed why? P of theta given y, that's all there is to it. Oh, you mean? The, the incredible simplicity of this is hard to really take in. I condition on Y. That's all there is to it. Everything is connected to Y. So, yeah, you can forget that. When I cycle through the parameters, you're going, oh, you're conditioning on the parameters. Y is in there, too. I'm always conditioning on Y in each one of those conditionals. Yeah, you're right. Okay. But why are you updating Y in the... No, no. Who would do that? Why would you do that? Oh, just <laughs> why? When he update when he was updating why those are the predictions, but when he's conditioning on why he's using the observed whys. Right. So that's how, if I'm predicting that I'm I'm I haven't seen the future why, so I'm gonna have lots of draws of the future why to represent what why could turn out to be. But the data you condition on, and when you teach intro stats. That's the part that every normal person is gonna go, I've seen the data, what do you mean I could have had other data? You're insane. And we teach them this crock. See, see how crazy it is? 
And see how beautiful it is. P of theta given, given Y. Boom. Why isn't everybody a base yet? It's crazy. Right. Well, I came, came here today, right? <laughs> what? I said why everybody isn't a base yet. All right, we have a question have, in the chat. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't have chat GPT if I was just a Bayesian. On the other hand, these uh, generative models are getting more and more Bayesian, so we'll see how that goes. All right, the question in the chat uh, says, um, from the prediction in Bayes slide, could you explain why only Y sub J is drawing from the conditional on theta sub J? Oh, so that's only true if I've assumed that the Ys are IID conditional on theta. So that, that's a little fast and loose. I could, I should, I, in general, that's, okay, that's a good point. Uh, this is only correct if the, in, say that Bernoulli type model. If I had a time series model, I'd have to put more conditioning arguments in that conditional for the future Y, in particular the past Y would come in there. But aside from that technical, <laughs> good observation, uh, it's the same idea though, in terms of the latent variables, which we often call parameters. <laughs> I have draws in the parameters. For each draw of the parameter, I, I get the prediction of Y conditional on the parameter and what other conditioning information I have. I might have X, I might have past Ys, I might have all kinds of other stuff I could have put in there. Should have put it in there, maybe. When you write out the John distribution here, and then we seem to rely on some Markov model for the PVR, it's given, let's say, given I, if I only rely on the so when you choose to draw the picture of the DAG, you choose how much detail to suppress. Seems to so this is kind of a high level DAG. And from this, the reason I like this high level DAG is like I immediately read off this joint, which is a very powerful thing. But I'm suppressing the fact that, you know, there's a, there's a vector of Y's I equals one to N. And then there's a vector of I's for every Y there's an I. This is a vector. That's a vector of mu's, and I'm assuming my model they're independent. So I could elaborate the DAG to capture some of that stuff, but as I go through these models, uh, I definitely, I, I love this uh, phrase in computing, detail elimination. I mean, uh, when, you, when you're working with a complex model, at certain phases of the considerations, you, you do whatever you can to detail eliminate. So that's my high level DAG. But oh, there's a lot of detail suppression there, which is maybe a little confusing. My question is, I think in this, this simple case, you uh, have to figure out the structure of the variable, which variable you rely on, which is set of variable. Right. Uh, so, but that's that's where the game is to be a, a modeler, is to build up the complicated models out of these components that capture the things you think are in their data. And that's why we have a lot of papers, because we have a lot of different situations, there's a lot of different models. And by talking about Bayesian, like the part we're putting the prior, that doesn't seem like that much more after I have to make all these other decisions about the structure of the model. So. Oh, so you can get a Bayesian paper where the DAG is like this whole picture and there's about like 50 different. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I don't like them. They get too complicated. You can't. Uh... It, you can always be too complicated. That's why when the guy said, I don't like your thing because it's got too many, too many moving pieces. I didn't arrogantly dismiss it. I claim I claim I pulled it off. But you can definitely make it too complicated and just get a mess. There, there's a sense in which as well, like this is a modeling choice that you're making. This is this is not a like claim that this is the, the true underlying distribution. I mean, we'd hope it is, but, but, but you are making these choices with this this decomposition and expressing it with the DAG. I, that was better put than what I said. 
is part of the wonderful modeling process. I mean, come on. Like the whole base, it's a second order problem, right? The real problem is getting a model that makes sense that relates to the data you want to do. That's actually the statistics part. It has nothing to do with Bayes frequentness. But by the time you do all that and you have these pieces, but but on the it's still useful to build up models out of pieces, if Bayesian or not. You know, a great another example of was state-space models. Absolute killers, right? State-space models. That would be another example of so there's lots of frequentists who use state-space models. Kind of nice to do it from a Bayesian viewpoint, but you don't have to. Okay. Uh I think so some of these basic ideas, like building up the complement, like that's not purely Bayesian. But I guess I've tried to argue that Bayesian thinking makes it very natural and embellishes the process usefully. All right, um, we should take a 15 minute break now. Uh, so will we come back at 1045 Central Daylight Time? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a great and terrible time to be a statistician, right? It's great because the tools, it really is amazing. The, the software is amazing, but it's also very challenging. I really think it's very challenging to have all the skills, have all the background knowledge and to effectively combine them. It's like, a, you, you, can't, you can't learn everything, you know? I guess it depends what you want to do, but I mean, does anybody have like a train of thought that they want to mention in terms of that big picture? What's the question? I tried to give an overview of lots of things from different directions <laughs> to inform what the, the specifics we're about to do. But we're, so if one person found it helpful, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Use the microphone. So in a sense, everything you, you talked about, there, there's a likelihood there's like a probabilistic model underneath there. But there are a lot of techniques that don't make use of the probabilistic models. Um, there's just like an optimization function. And, and so what's the gain there? Like a, a neural network doesn't implicitly have like a probability model attached to it. So, so what's the gain that we're getting? So let me give you my other favorite example. That's a, I think that's an important observation. You know, if you're frequentist, you can say, well, yeah, I'm used to Y given theta. That's no big deal. You just add P of theta. But there's lots of stuff that don't even have Y given theta. Um, so when I teach my applied machine learning thing, I very purposely do uh, KNN early on because that's just a very important machine learning technique, which has no probability model at all. It's just an algorithm. And I make a big deal out of that. So you don't even have to, you don't have to do it this way. Absolutely. And I love KNN. I always say, you know, if you had to do classification tomorrow and you were a good C programmer and that's all you knew, you would invent KNN for sure. And I think that's tremendously important. So I, I, I uh, doing it as a probability has, has advantages. I condition on why. It stops me from doing lots of stupid things that people do. But is it the only way to do it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Right. I love KNN because it's got none of this crap. Forget about it. You're crazy. You know, what you need to be is a good programmer. You don't need any of this crap. See what I did? I just made an extreme statement that had some truth, but obviously I don't believe hundred <laughs> percent. Two people online like the like your intro too. And, and the rest, of, uh, the rest, I'm not sure like it too. Well. Okay, but the, now I have to back it up, right? Now I have to give a talk on BART where everything we talked about helps us understand the process. Okay, so I, so Bayesian added regression tree. So, you know, Rodney and I are doing this workshop, but I, of course, I just want to mention that my major partners in crime in developing this work would be the great Ed George and uh, Hugh Chipman. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful people. That's the number one reason to do this stuff to find wonderful people to hang out with or, or smart and not. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
So we, in doing this, I will mix in like examples and code from the AR package. But let me just say that the actual, you know, introduction to the R package is going to be presented by Rodney later on. The actual details, okay? Okay. So uh, as we go through the workshop, we'll see, and there's lots of extensions that we won't get to. We could have had uh, you give a couple talks, right? Should have had you given. If I'd known you were coming, would if I'd known you were coming, you would have given a talk. Not too late. Maybe tomorrow you should talk. Um, but let's just start with the basic BART model, which is y is some function of x, and here x is a vector plus normal error, okay? So to go back to what Samir just said, I have to have the normal errors because it's gotta be a probability model, right? If I'm just doing the lasso, if I'm just doing neural nets, I don't even have to mention that. At the end of the day, I'll have a loss function, which may or may not correspond to a likelihood, okay? So, you know, right off the top, I, I see I'm paying the price for being a Bayesian. I have to have a probability model. So there's lots of yings and yangs here. Okay. So uh, we're going to see when we get into the details that the function f is going to be re represented as the sum of many regression trees. But let me suppress that for a little while and just try to do it. Uh, suppose I just wanted you to be a user uh, 20 minutes from now. That's kind of what I'm going to try to do. But at the same time, you have to be okay with some of these big ideas that we just talked about. Okay, so how can we find a comp, how can we figure out a complex function f from the data? That's our, our basic goal with little human work. Okay, so that might be a narrow but plausible definition of machine learning. Okay, so Bart was definitely inspired by the boosting literature. You know, so lots of people are doing boosting. Jerry Friedman didn't invent boosting, but we were definitely uh, motivated by his work. Uh, the connection to boosting. If you know what boosting is, the connection will be pretty obvious. Uh, if you've never seen boosting before, that might be something we might do like tomorrow or something. Just go back. It might be fun at some point to look and see what boosting is and how it's different from Bart and the same as Bart. That, that's a good thing to know, but, but we're going to skip that for now, okay? So some things will be a little bit more obvious to you if you've done boosting, and, but it's not crucial. Okay, so BART is a Bayesian MCMC procedure. So I'm going to say theta. Remember my beloved theta from this morning, from a little while ago? So theta is the function and the sigma. So what are my parameters of my model? F and sigma. And for now, I'm gonna suppress what the hell F is. I'm just gonna treat it as a parameter and then we'll be able to use the software as long as we're just okay with that. Okay, so I made a big leap there, but it's, my mind is definitely exactly what the same thing I did with the Bruno. Okay, so that's my parameter, that's my theta. I'm gonna, later on today, I'll show you the Markov change, which enables me to draw from the posterior, that is, I will get draws of F and Sigma given the data, which is now X and Y. Okay, just base there. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so, so at every draw, there's gonna be in the machine F and Sigma, okay? Now you can't do the histogram of F. <laughs> So we have to look at marginals, which we will, but that's easy to do because it's Monte Carlo. Exactly like we talked about a little while ago. Okay. So uh, we will go through the representation of F, but I'm claiming that we can initially suppress that and just assume that, okay, at every iteration, there's a representation of F in the computer. However, it's done. And there's a number Sigma, which gives me the error variance. And I can, but I can look at any marginal of those draws that I, that I want to look at, okay? So the most obvious thing to do is look at the sigma draws, which we'll do, because that's actually an interpretable parameter. Um, in terms of understanding F, basically what we do is we just evaluate F at certain Xs. And I, that's the marginal that we examine, okay? So this is how the BART software works. Yeah, 
I can't just report a bunch of Fs to you. What the hell is that? Remember, you know, X could be a, the talk I gave yesterday. X was an R62. Okay. It was the X was an R62. So a map from R62 to R1. How do you represent that? So you have to pick a set of X's. And that, so D is going to be the D draw of F. How do I tell you what that function is? I just evaluate that draw at a set of X's. So that's numbers. Okay. So I think it's a little bit, I get, maybe I get a little, normally I try to avoid math speak, but I kind of like this as like, a, so the parameter is F and the marginal, that's my parameter. And F of X is a marginal of F, see? So I'll map from a function to a real number, they call it a functional, right? So my functional, I map from the function space to the real line is simply evaluate F out of X, okay? So I can't give you the histogram of F, but for any set of X's, we can just evaluate F. And that's what the software returns, okay? So it's a little abstract, it's a little high level, but given what we did this morning, I'm just gonna get draws of F and Sigma. For every draw of F, I just evaluate that function of F at a bunch of X's and that's what the software returns. So at an abstract level, pretty easy, right? Okay. It's a little abstract, it's a little different, but pretty easy. So let's try it, let's, let's try it right away, okay? So this makes uh, my students crazy. I always want to try with one X first. <laughs> like if I can't do it with one X, I'm not gonna try with... But they wanna do convolutional neural networks on the first day. <laughs> anyway, so here's my, I'll just simulate data. Well, let's see. So here's my, so that's theta. That's the true theta, sigma F, okay? So F is just X cubed and sigma is 0.1. I'll generate 200 observations. Of course, the model doesn't tell you how to generate X. It's only Y given X, so I can do whatever I want for X. And there's my simulation of my Y. And then these, I'm gonna have another set of X's I wanna evaluate F at. So that might be the X's that you wanna predict at. So I would like to estimate F at the X's in X test. That's why it's called test, right? So this X and this Y will be my training data. I'll run bar with that training data and we'll get inference for F at these X values, okay? So I'm gonna do everything with, with a one-dimensional X, but every idea extends immediately to a higher dimensional X, okay? There's no, we don't have to change things. You know? Okay, so here's my plot of the simulated data. So X, Y, here's my training data. These are all the text values of X that I would like to infer F at, okay? So it's kind of funny, the terminology. I, if I was a machine learner, I wouldn't say infer F. I think I would say learn F. <laughs> when I said infer, there's gonna be a suggestion that I'm gonna get an inference. So does that mean anything? Let's see. Okay, so here's my R package. Not the only R package out there. You're only are you going to talk about just this one. See? No. No. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to use. I'm going this. to talk about the ones that we are authored, but I will just mention there are a few others by the name. Okay. Okay. So here I'm running Bart in R. So uh, so I'm using this function W Bart. I think. Rodney will probably use G Bart, but in this case, G Bart would just call W Bart. So it's the same thing, I think. So here we go. I give it X and Y, the data, and I give it the X's that I want to predict at if I'm a machine learner. And I just, and I end skip as the number of initial draws I'm going to have before I start keeping them. And I'm going to keep 2000 draws. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So these are arguments. So as we go through this thing, well, well, the list of arguments that we understand will grow. 
as we learn the model and we learn all the things you could choose. But at the same time, I emphasize that if you don't choose anything, if, if, if you just do the, in this problem, if you didn't even put that in, it would work about the same. Okay. Uh, so the name W bar is for weighted BART, but let's not worry about that. Okay, it's, it's just the model I talked about. Okay, so I'm in R. I call this function. I give it my training data, the X's I want to predict that, how many draws I want. That's it. The default prior. That's going to take me like a, the the rest of the a while, right? So I'm going to show you how to use it without explaining. And then after that, we'll we'll go dive into more of the details. What Rob made this outrageous claim that he can put a prior on the function f. We'll talk and we'll talk about that. And then as we talk about that, you'll see that there are more options you could put there in terms of specifying the prior. Right now, I want you to be astounded and shocked that the default prior works well. Okay. So imagine all the people who don't want to sit through this workshop, but they might want to run BART. I want them to be able to run BART and get good results without sitting through the next hour and learning about that prior. Okay, thank you. We have a question about the red dots. Can you just show the previous slide again? So the red dots are the X test. Okay. So I just plotted, I just plotted the X's. That's just that the X's I want to uh, learn <laughs> the function F at. So let me just mention, this is a R markdown document. So what you see, uh, that's on my webpage. And how I got everything is right there. Okay. Okay. So that's all there was to running BART. And now I, right now, I wish I hadn't put that. <laughs> I don't know. It would still work fine. Okay. Okay. So as usual, RB in R, you're going to get a list of components and uh, we, we have to understand what, comp what the components are, what they represent, how we use them. Okay. That would be the same in everything. Okay. So, uh, so I go names R, B, and R, and that tells me all the components that are in the returned list. Okay. So what I can do for you now is <laughs> rather than having to read the documentation, always a nightmare. Uh, rather than playing around, I can tell you, okay, uh, this is the one you need to know. You can ignore those other ones for a while. That's what you always need to know, right? What you can ignore. So I complain, I, I claim that out of all this schlock, this y hat dot test component right here, that's the most exciting one. If all you do is understand that one, you can use BART. Okay. And the short answer is that y hat dot test is just exactly that. Okay. So the x values are the values I had in x test. I, I want it right here. Yeah. Okay. So for every draw, I evaluate the function f for that draw at each of the values in x test. Gives me a vector. So the, the rows of, I'm gonna, it's gonna be a matrix. The rows correspond to the different draws and the columns correspond to the different x's in x test. That's it. It could be worse. So I don't know about you, but when I'm learning software, yeah, I'm anal about checking the structure of each object. That's the worst thing. You don't even know what the hell. Okay, so there should be like a, I'm pretty sure that's a matrix. There should be an is dot matrix there. I jumped the gun a bit. But in any case, the dimension is 2000 by 11. So let's just, where's the 2000 come from? Maybe that's why I did it right here. That's the number of draws. Okay, just like in a Monte Carlo. It's Markov chain Monte Carlo, but as a practical matter right now, at this level, it's just, matter, it's just like a Monte Carlo. I have 2,000 Monte Carlo draws of F, conditional on the information in the data, 
at each draw, I evaluate that function f at the 11 values in x test. Okay. So, uh, hey, where's 11 come from? Should be uh, that the length of that. It was 2000. 2000. Yeah. And you say you also skipped uh, several models. That means you grew like more than 2000 boost trees. Yeah. So there's actually, I actually generated, um, where's this stupid thing? I actually generate 2000 plus 500 draws, but uh, with the Markov team Monte Carlo, there's a burning period. There's an initial set of draws, which are kind of figuring things out before it stabilizes. So typically you drop the initial set of draws. It's a little bit arbitrary. So as we get further into it in practice, sometimes you do want to check that you've dropped enough. So that's why you had that choice there. Yeah. Of course, you could always drop them after. You could you know, take 2,000 and just drop the first 1,000 if you decide you want to do that. Is that like a one draw means uh, you're building one boost trees? Well, see, right now I, want, I can abstract and just say at each draw, I have a function in my computer. And I, and I haven't explained to you yet. I have to explain to you how I represent the function. And then I have to explain to you how I put a prior on that function. Okay. But lots of people might want to use this without learning those that level of detail. And I claim if you just abstract, I think I could be wrong about this. If you abstract to that, <laughs> which is trivial given what we did this morning, you could use it. But if you don't have what we did this morning, it's a little weird, right? It doesn't work at all like something else in I can learn. So without the abstraction that we did this morning, I think it would be a little confusing. I claim it's not confusing, <laughs> but you're the judge of that. Okay. So most of the questions I'm gonna know you're jumping ahead. That's I'm trying to suppress those details right now. And they will emerge. That's not to say you shouldn't ask. Maybe a kind of a clarification here. Like if I had said this F was had some parametric form, like maybe it was a cubic or a cortic that I've and there's some like coefficients that I want to learn, what you're saying is that each MCMC draw, it's just a different set of coefficients and you are uh, making predictions based on that. Is, is, is that kind of the mental model? <clears throat> so if I had a parametric model with a per vector theta, at each draw of theta, that would, that, that would give me a function F. So that would be each draw. So that would be one way to get draws of F, right? Is to draw theta and then for each theta, you have a function f, and then I could evaluate that function at a set of x's. And that's not a terrible idea, right? So as soon as you get to, you know, a bunch of transformations, people say, oh, you know, x squared, everybody understands polynomial. You've never worked with polynomials if you can understand them. You might be better off doing it this way. <laughs> that's it, sorry. Okay, but that, I think that's a good way to think about it. At the end of the day, I will have a big theta that parameterizes this function f. It's just not something you see every day. And it's a variable dimension. OK. So uh, you see my tension here? You should obviously be naturally curious about these things. But my whole strategy is to say, we're going to get to that. Suppose you just wanted to use it like at lunch. This is what you would have to understand. And not much more, <laughs> not much more. Let's see, look, see how it goes. So why out to test is a 2000 by 11 matrix. The different columns correspond to different X's. As I go down the column, those are all the values of F at that X, which are plausible given the information in the data. Doesn't that sound like what you want to know in life? So if I could skip the whole Bayes intro and just say, look, these draws tell you what the plausible values are in light of the data and just go with that, right? I could have skipped the whole morning. That wasn't bad. 
Okay, so if I want a point estimate of f of the different x's, what do I do? I average all the rows. I average over the draws. Now correspond to the posterior mean. Well, you could be intuitive about that, right? Oh, every row corresponds to a different possible f. Well, I want just one f, let's just average them. Which is your Monte Carlo estimate of the posterior mean of these marginals of the random variable f. Okay. So did it work? So the blue is the true. So now I, I am using the fact that you know what x cubed is. <laughs> and then the red is the posterior mean of f based on the data. Okay. It worked. <laughs> so that's machine learning, right? I didn't have to say anything about x cubed, x squared, sine x, blah, blah, blah. I didn't have to say anything about anything. And I got it. Okay. And something I immediately get that you don't typically get out of machine learning tools, suppose I want to know my uncertainty about f at a particular x. Well, I just take that particular x, there's a column, and those values in that column represent plausible values for f at that x. And instead of computing the average, I just look at the distribution. So this is perfectly analogous to gamma being a function of theta is my idea. My parameter is f, it's a little complicated, but I wanna look at a marginal. What's the marginal? f at x. I have draws, boom, done. So I, I should actually show you the histogram of f at one x and say, look, but I just did the, well, I, I don't remember, so I had to look at the code. I did 95% of intervals. So I just took the, each column, computed the half of 5% quantile, the half of one minus 5% quantile, and that's a 95% posterior interval for f at that thing. Do you care about the uncertainty? Well, uh, so uh, Samir is nodding yes, and that's a good answer. But I would say it depends on the application. Some applications, the uncertainty really matters, and you're, it's, you're just crazy not to do it. But there are lots of applications where point prediction is. So I would say the answer is it depends, but let's let's, we're statisticians, we're supposed to think that uncertainty is something we care about. We're just taught incorrectly how to think about it. <laughs> okay, so that was pretty easy. And, and you go, oh, you know, fine, Rob, it's one X. Oh, I did one X so we can do the graph, okay? But obviously I'm claiming that a higher dimensional X is. So the talk I gave yesterday was a finance application. The dimension of X was 62 highly nonlinear, complicated thing. In that talk, I just used the point predictions. I didn't do the uncertainty at all. And I, and I beat everybody else. Okay. Okay. So that's how you use the software. End of workshop. So it was a, What's the, as we go through, let's note all the places we could plausibly stop. But I appreciate that you're curious about the prior. That's the right attitude. <laughs> mm, sorry, I, I'm also curious for the previous slides plot. Can you? Yes. Uh, so for X goes to one, uh, I, I, it feels like, it looks like the 95% predictive interval, even out of the truth, right? Right. Good. Let's talk about that for a sec. So I think you're talking about here. So I go, oh, look, 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 you know, there's my estimate, the red's my estimate, there's the blue, there's my interval. This thing is perfect, it's perfect, it's perfect. Maybe it's not perfect here, right? My 95% interval missed. Okay, so why did it miss? Well, at the edge of the data, clearly I have, I'm missing information that I have in the interior about that function f. So, I, and there is a prior there. And how do things work? They work by shrinking so you don't overfit. So at that edge, the bias in my shrinkage actually made me miss there a little bit. Is this good or bad? Let's go with good. See, you gotta change your attitude. It drives me crazy. People are, oh, bias. My estimate is, un is unbiased. Obviously crap. 
it's supposed to be biased. You want the right bias. That's the game. So there's a little bit of bias there. Uh, we only know it's biased because I have the true one. For real data, eh, I kind of don't believe in XQ. I don't think there's much data that's actually going XQ. I think XQ is more likely to level. I bet you my priors more sensible than XQ. I have a different opinion on that. Where am I? You said that's good at end up a data shrinkage. But the reality is you when you do the predicting, you predict on a data you haven't seen yet. Correct. But well, remember, uh, I think I'm everything's at X test. I didn't see why at X test. This is actually out of sample. Yeah, so your test is like the, the range X you already saying. Like you are oh uh, I'm not trying to extrapolate. Okay, okay, I see your point. That's a whole other set of issues. But I guess I brought it up or you brought it up. You know, I'm saying, um, you know, extrapolate an X cubed, don't do that. Who's gonna do that? That's crazy. That makes more sense. And after, after I explain the model, we could come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> So those are point wise. Uh, don't say confidence interval. <laughs> uh, posterior Bayesian interval for f at x. Okay, so f is the random variable. So here's why I need you to be usefully abstract. F is the random variable. We're looking at the marginal of the functional f of x. Ninety five percent interval. Uh, 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 oh. uh, 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 you're you're forbidden to say confidence. We call them credible intervals. Okay, fine. Cred okay, that's all right. Posterior interval for the. Okay. A confidence interval is completely different. So I, I realize I go slower and slower and slower, but even this is interesting. So let's let's. Okay, um, so I, I'm just trying to go through that. So almost all the fun you want to have with BART is just right there, right? I could, but there's some other stuff there. So let's let's look at it. For example, uh, the y hat uh, train, that's you evaluate each draw of F at the X's in the training data. So that would be like your in sample fit, your fit on the training data as opposed to your predictions at X is not in the X test. You did not have, there was no Y corresponding to the X test. And the usual train test a distinction. Okay, and then there's a, for both train and test, the software returns the, the mean, the average over all the rows. So you might say that's ridiculous, I can compute the average. But I'll show you later on, there's options where you don't store all the draws. So once you're doing a big problem and you want to do, it can be convenient to say, no, 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 I, I just need the mean. Don't, don't do all the work to do all that stuff. Okay. So we so see, we can have all kinds of fun. I could just do the whole workshop on this example. Um, look, so for example, let's just increase the sample size. What should happen when you increase the sample size? My bias should be mitigated, right? My uncertainty should go down, should go down, right? Boom. Who asked me? Uh, is that posterior interval? Does it have ninety five percent frequentist coverage? Not exactly. Which is okay because that's not what it is. Th this is a funny thing. This is true. My Bayesian posterior interval is not a confidence interval. It's not. I put the bias in on purpose to make a lot of things work. On the other hand, if my 90% interval doesn't roughly cover 90% of the time, I will not have users. So here's where I have to. So I've got lots of papers where I've checked it. It's not going to be 90%, but it won't be so far off that it's going to upset you. So even though to me, it's fundamental that intellectually they're not the same. 
it can't be too different or that would be weird. You know, typically they're a little too big, I would say. So they actually cover more often than not, unless they're at an edge, like you pointed out, where the bias reasonably takes over. Yeah. So again, what's the whole point of the lasso? To introduce bias. <laughs> it's the bias variance trade-off. What's the point of my prior, which I will get to someday, if you don't stop asking good questions. To introduce the right bias. Okay. So here's the thing you should not believe. So I gave this little example. If I put in, if I, well, I am gonna simulate data with way more Xs, exact same call and I'll still get it. Right, that's actually kind of impressive. Okay. So what, what would you say is the interpretation of the green band then at a given point, at a given test point? Point-wise, it's the, point-wise, it's the posterior interval of F at that X. That's all there's to it. So Rodney says they call it the credible intervals here. I can never remember names for anything. It's the posterior distribution of the marginal, just like when I had gamma and theta. How would you say that to a non Given the information, the data, we, that we believe that there's a 95% probability that f of x is in, in here. See, he shouldn't ask me that one either, should he? Well, that's-, that's Because no matter how often you tell somebody what a confidence interval is, you can tell them every day, of their lives. They will not understand what it is. They will interpret it the way I just told you the probability interval was. And that's a fact. That's not. But this time it's true. <laughs> what? But, but no, it's true. I just have to tell them exactly what they think it is. There's a 95% probability it's in there given the information, the data. Now, he, they might be curious about the prior. They know I put some bias in there. There's lots of issues there, but. Okay, so now I'll do a simulated example with 10 X's, nonlinear, okay? <clears throat> so here, so what's theta? Theta is F and sigma. So I just changed my F to be that one for no good reason, just how it forced a habit. We use this, this example is due to Friedman a million years ago, but I've done a million of these things. <laughs> it works pretty well, right, Rodney? Um, but anyway, so that's theta F sigma. So now it's a function of, uh, you can give it any dimension of X you want, but it only depends on the first five. Okay. And uh, so we'll do a hundred observations. And uh, so I'll actually simulate 10 X's. So, but only the first five matter. So now I'm going from one dimensional to 10 dimensional. And it's nonlinear. So I'll, I'll assume I can do 500 burn in and I'll keep 5,000. So, so it's the exact same call as I had before. Okay, totally different setup, <laughs> exact same call. Okay, so this time I'm gonna look at this component, the sigma component of the return data structure, which we didn't look at before. So that's gonna be at each iteration, I have a draw of the parameter. What's the parameter? F and sigma. So I'm just gonna look at the sigma draws. And the sigma draws are interpretable, right? That's the, the standard deviation of the errors, my simple IID normal one, okay? And the sigma draws, I just as a simple way of judging the burn-in, I actually return all of the draws of sigma. That is, I include the burn-in draws and the, and the ND post draws, okay? So this is a little detail of the software. This is how I use it. <laughs> More sophisticated users might do something different, but this is how I use it. So um, the length of sigma, do I have it here? Yeah, length sigma is 5,500, which is 500 plus 5,000. So it has the draws of sigma for every iteration of my chain. Okay. And then there's the, just the sequence plot or time series plot of the sigma draws, okay? So initially the sigma is too big. 
because that's where the Markov chain is learning where the posterior is. So that might be some initial draws you might want to drop. But we can see informally that it looks like it's kind of burned in. Uh, certainly after this line, it looks like it's just bopping around a, a fixed level. So there's a big literature on deciding when Markov chains are burned in. I, don't, I never do it. <laughs> I don't know that literature, completely ignorant. Uh, maybe some paper someday I'll have to learn it. Rodney knows all about it. Uh, I just look at this typically. Or if I was interested in F at a particular X, I might look at those draws and make sure they're burned in. Okay. Because maybe a sad fact is once you're in R5000, you can always find something, some marginal that's not right. Oh, right. Check the ones that you're actually going to use. I just want to add one thing. So, so one of the challenges with uh, the MCMC draws is to, to get good mixing. And because BART is non-parametric, it mixes really fast. Uh, uh, and it, it makes these convergence issues less difficult than, than in most other situations that I've seen. Okay. Usually, but not always. <laughs> Often. Often. So notice that these draws don't look IID. That's the mar So now we're seeing very visually the Markov chain part of the Monte Carlo. You use those draws exactly the way you use in the IID draws. You do the histogram and you go, oh, look, that's my distribution for sigma given the data. So use it the exact same way, but uh, there is dependence in those draws. But that's a detail I don't want to get bogged in. Okay. So, uh, so for example, I don't have, gee, why don't I have it? There's the true value. It's a simulation. It worked. Totally automatically, right? I didn't do any exact same call in R10 as I had in R1. So when I gave my finance talk yesterday, my X was R62 and I did not want to do tuning because I had to fit the model over and over and over again in a variety of situations. So I very explicitly said the reason I, one of the reasons I want to use BART is because I can do it without tuning. That depends on the application. Okay. That's not to say that there isn't an application where if somebody's willing to tune their neural net, they won't beat my BART. Here's the autocorrelation function of the sigma draws. So there is quite a bit of autocorrelation in those draws. Here I just thinned it. I just took every 10th draw. And the autocorrelation looks quite reasonable. Uh, I, I must have done that. That must be so. But I thought I had all the code in here. Oh, hey, look. You just have to give it enough of the variable name for it to uniquely identify. So that is a typo, but it's the code still ran. Yeah, that's an R feature, I think. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So those are my sigma draws. So. Uh, you know, this is where we're going, you know, as we go through it, we dive into some of the details. The Markov chain Monte Carlo thing it is very evident in these sigma draws. Sigma is a nicely interpretable parameter. We understand. I won't, I won't go back. Y equals F of X plus normal zero sigma squared. You all know what that is. <laughs> uh, did it work? So here I'm plotting Y. First is the true mean of y. It's a simulation, so I know. I really don't. 11%. Tell me when I get to 2%. <laughs> I can't stand back there. So, so what does BART fit mean? Oh, is there power there? Okay. Thanks.
So what's the, the BART fit? So on the training data, I just average those rows, right? That gives me the posterior mean. So here's, so now I, I, I'm in R10 or R5 if you knew only the five matters. So I can't graph it, right? That's why I like the 1D so much. I can actually see everything. Uh, so how do I graph it? Well, I just plot, you know, F at the X's. Okay, so here's the actual Y's. Here's E of Y, which is F of X at the X's. So there was a lot of, so this is a high signal problem. The signal wasn't too big. Unlike the application I was working on yesterday, which was a low signal problem. Uh, and then here's the BART fit versus, so here's E of Y versus the BART fit. Yeah. Just worked. Um, if, if you stare at this long enough, I think you could argue that maybe it overfit a bit. It's like too good. Uh, so that's an issue. And I, I could fix that once I know enough about the prior to tweak the prior, or I could decide, hey, come on, good enough. It's not going to be perfect. Here's the fitted values from a linear regression, which of course is no good. See, it's a strange world. Shouldn't I just be teaching people BART from day one, and maybe, and then GLMs later? You'll do better. You'll do better. This is one of the weirdest days in my life. I taught, you know, I, I still teach applied regression. How many here have taught applied regression, right? And remember you teach them to like, look at the residual plots to see if it worked. <laughs> what a nightmare. So when I was doing the solutions for my homework to see if the, you know, she was going to transform the X's and then you look at the residual plots to see if it worked. A horrible algorithm. So I would just run BART. And if my, my linear model with the transformations agreed with BART, I knew it was right. I was a complete fraud, right? The way I'm teaching it is not the way I would do it. There's some useful in intuition in the idea that the residuals should be unrelated to X, but as a practical procedure for science, it's, it's really kind of, I'm not comfortable with it. So BART automatically fit the data, even though it was this wacky simulation thing. Looks like it overfit. In this case, it burned in fast. I can't show you examples where the, it doesn't burn in that fast. And the autocorrelation is severe enough. You have to worry about it. Uh, so, but in this case, it burned in fast and the autocorrelation was such that if I just thin the draw, so you call it thinning. Instead of taking every draw, you take every, but the histogram will be the same. Just if you thin it enough, it, they, you can make it look more like IID, and sometimes you're just more comfortable with that. Uh, this is the sigma draws from the simulated example I did before. So that one just burned in immediately. That one's too good. Uh, I need to have an example here where it's not so good. Maybe I'll add that tonight. There should be a slide now where it, it takes longer to burn in, because that does happen. Okay. Okay, so at an abstract level, Bayesian level, you know enough you could use it very reasonably. But suppose I thought I wanted to fix that overfitting. Well, now I have to know details about how the prior works and what the options are. And I get the sense that you're curious and that's all good. Okay, so up to now, I've tried to emphasize that we can usefully work th through it at that level of abstraction, given our basic Bayesian understanding from this morning. Uh, but now we want to go deeper into the model and the prior and the uh, to everything. Okay, so first, let me remind you what a regression tree is. So first, I have to review a, a simple regression tree. Uh, but no, let me say at the top and I'll say it again. Uh, so hopefully you've had regression trees in an applied class somewhere. Uh, if you hadn't, I'll give you a quick review. 
Uh, it's very interesting the difference between the way I think about a regression tree as a Bayesian versus the way you would be taught a regression tree in an applied machine learning class. Because uh, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm a full on Bayesian, I need a probability model. Whereas the CART algorithm does not build on probability, much like you were commenting before. Okay, so here's um, a single tree model, okay? So maybe just to remind you, I, I, I tried to say at the beginning, look, look at Kegel, <laughs> look at this stuff. Ensembles of trees is killer, folks. <laughs> That's where we are. That's where it's at. <laughs> that neural nets, and uh, if you know neural nets and ensembles of trees, you'll beat every, all your buddies every time. Okay, so ensembles of trees are models that are built up of many trees. So that's what Bart will be. Um, so let's just learn what one tree is. Remind ourselves what one tree is. Okay, so, uh, so we have an X vector and we drop the X vector down the tree. At each one of these nodes, there'll be a decision rule that sends you left or right. So, and each decision rule will be of this form. So X5 says take the fifth coordinate of the X vector. Okay, so the X vector could have any dimension. The decision rule has to pick one of the coordinates of the X vector. And then it says, well, if that coordinate is less than a cutoff, you go left. And if otherwise you go right. Okay. So you'll have a set of decision rules. So you drop the X vector down and depending on X5, you go might go left or right. Depending on X2, you might go left to right, and you end up at a bottom node. Waiting for you at the bottom node is a number, and that will be your prediction for Y, or actually your, uh, the mean of Y given X. Okay? So actually, the way I'm going to talk about it is this tree gives me a function of X. How do you evaluate the function of X? You drop X down the tree, and the result of the function is the number you have at the bottom node there. Okay, so I'll, I'll let, so my theta right now on this slide is the tree structure. So for reasons you'll see later, technical reasons, we're gonna separate out the parameter space into the, the tree structure, which involves the, the nature of the tree and all the decision rules, that's T. And then M is gonna be the numbers in the bottom nodes. So I'm gonna call these mu's because they're gonna be means, okay? So already, if you've had CART before, I sound, even though it's the same model, I sound different than if I was just teaching CART because I, I have to think like a Bayesian. I have to think of it as a parameter. I have to think of it as a theta. And for technical reasons, when I uh, specify my prior and when I compute my posterior, it's gonna turn out to be helpful to structure theta as T and M, okay? So T has all the decision rules. And there's a lot going on there, right? I have to have the structure of the tree. I have, for, at each decision rule, I have to pick which coordinate, I have to pick the cutoff. This is not an easy problem, okay? And then, but then each bottom node has to have a mean level, okay? So theta is TM, and then there's my model. For with a single tree, that's my Y. Y is this function of X plus here. Okay, so that's a tree. That's me. How much trouble am I in this time? <laughs> Please mute all your devices. What? Oh, I'll turn it off. I thought it would stop sooner. Okay, so this is gonna be, that's a single tree model. Um, so this, this tree, another way to look at the tree is this coordinate view. Sorry, I'll turn it off. So there could be any number of coordinates of X, but this says 
this first one, you take X5 and you cut at this value C. And then for bigger than C, that's it. So that'll be a region in an X space right there. For that region of X space, you have that mean level. But for the ones less than C, you cut again on X2. So we cut this bottom half. So the first split, you cut it into these two pieces. And then this one will subsequently cut this into two pieces. Okay. So it's a very simple model. You can have principally you can have a number of X's. It'll divide your predictor space into disjoint rectangular regions. And then you just have the same prediction for Y, the same mean level for Y within each region. Okay. So uh, that's a very important model in applied statistics. Uh, first time, do I have that? No, no. Uh, so it has a function, it's gonna be a step function, right? So I suppose I just had X1, X2, then it would just break the X1, X2, X1, X2 space into rectangular subsets, and then you would have a constant within each rectangular subset, okay? So one tree alone, is it good or bad? <laughs> yes, it's good and bad. You know, it's a, it's a very nice way to, to get nonlinearity and interactions and simple representation stuff. But this piecewise thing is a little kludgy. Okay. And essentially, we can fix, fix that kind of kludginess by using many trees. So how do we do that? So finally, here we go. So this is a huge leap, uh, unless you've had boosting, in which case it's not a huge leap. But here, here's the actual model. So for any... So T1, M1 is going to be one of these trees models, okay? So for each TM pair, I get a G of X theta, where theta equals MT. So this would be the first tree model. That gives me a function. And then I have a second tree model. That gives me a function. See, I drew the little tree there. But there'll be a little tree for each term here. And then I have little m, so I have little m tree models. Each tree model will give me a function, and I add, I get the sum of those functions. Okay. So what's m? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I'll answer it this way. The default in the R package is 200. Okay, so, oh, so for example, the two simulated examples I showed you, the actual model I can now tell you was the sum of 200 trees by default. Okay. So how many parameters were in those fits I showed you? A lot. How come it didn't overfit with all those parameters? Well, we, have, we got to do the prior, right? Okay. Uh, so I like that comment. So that's an identified parameter. So I'm just summing up trees. It's the same model. So if you haven't seen boosting before, I invite you to be flabbergasted. It's not at all, this is not at all obvious thing to do. Um, and I'll try to make it obvious later on, okay? So that's the form of the model. Uh, once you make your model, do you start from 200, for example, or you start from one and grow it to 200? The, 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 the results I showed you is just fixed to 200. Thank you. Okay. So, so this, I should actually have, so this here is my f of x. And I'm telling you how the F is represented. So what do I mean by unidentified? There's absolutely no point in looking at one of these trees. It, it doesn't mean anything interpretable, right? So there's absolutely, the only interpretable prior is sigma, sorry, parameter is sigma. The only identified parameter is sigma because I can always swap fit around from one tree to the other, okay? And all these turn out to be fundamental to its success. But if you haven't seen a model like this before, it's, it's weird. 
Why would you add up the same thing over and over and over again? Oh, uh, excuse me. Can you explain uh, the interaction effects? How can I see the interaction effects actually incorporated with you doing BART? So uh, let's just think about a single. So for that, we can go back to see well, any one of these single trees can capture interactions. So as you go down the path of the tree, if as you go down a path to get to a bottom node, if you use X2 and X4, that could capture an interaction between X2 and X4. So does this include all order of the interactions or the certain order? So I have to infer all these trees from the data. It has to figure out what those 200 trees should be like. It has to figure out the variation of plausible values for those 200 trees. And in those 200 trees, I can look at those, I can, I do have code where I look at the trees and say, gee, how often are this, is this pair of X's on a path down the tree? So that will be a somewhat interpretable marginal of the ensemble of trees. It's supposed to figure that out, right? Gee, do I need a lot of trees with X2 and X7 or not? If there's interaction between X2 and X7, I do. Automatically, right? Okay. Okay, so if you've seen boosting, the connection is obvious. Uh, if you haven't seen boosting, I think there's a little mystery here and I'll give you a crazy explanation, which I love in a little while. How I think about it. Okay, but now, we, so entry is another parameter to the function that I didn't, I, when I ran Bark before it was set to its default of 200, you can choose the number of trees. Okay, and then sometimes it, it, it if you get used to it and get some insight out of this work, sometimes you do play with that perimeter. One time I went to a talk and somebody was doing uh, wavelets. And if you've ever seen wavelet talks, they have these test examples that they always do in wavelets. So I said, I can get that with Bart. And he goes, no, you can't. So we had this really deep intellectual discussion. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. <laughs> so I went to my hotel room. And I knew that I just had to increase the number of trees from the default. And I nailed it immediately. But somebody else, if you just ran the default, it wouldn't work though. That's an example where the 200 might not work. Okay, so now we know one more parameter of the function because we know a basic thing about the model. It's the sum of M trees. You can specify how many trees go in, okay? So Matt Petrola has a student uh, who's working on a project where he's um, making the number of trees something that he estimates as part of the MCMC. Okay, so here we go. Here's the full prior. Now we know the model, we need the prior. So see, so complete the model with a regularization prior. So after this morning, we're supposed to be just waiting for the regularization prior. You can't have all these parameters, all these trees without kind of some kind of shrinkage. You will just overfit, it's crazy. So that's why I think Ed chose that term, complete the model. So the idea is that's not even a model. <laughs> it only becomes a model when we add the prior to describe how those different pieces are supposed to combine to shrink those pieces to something sensible, okay? So here's the, the essence of BARD, is to get this prior to be reasonably simple and to work, okay? And I've given you some evidence. I just ran those simulated examples without any, just at default prior settings, and it worked pretty well. Okay. Okay. So, so what's theta? <laughs> so, so there's the collection of tree models. Each tree model has a T and an M. And then there's also the one interpretable, simple, straightforward parameter, sigma. So that's my theta, okay? So what's my prior? So I have an independent prior on sigma. This would be easier if I'd done the DAG, but I didn't put the DAG in. And then all these TM pairs are independent. 
So I have the same prior for each TM pair. Okay. And then each TM pair, the joint is represented as a marginal for T and a conditional for M given T. So this is the basic structure of the prior. So most of it's the usual Bayesian laziness. Got a bunch of stuff we want over prior, let's just make them independent. And the data will fix that for us, even though it's probably crazy. Uh, this joint represented as that structure is, a, that has to be that way. Because remember, what's the dimension of M? So M is all the numbers in the bottom nodes. The dimension of M is the number of bottom nodes in the tree. So until you know T, not only do you not know M, you don't even know the dimension of M. Okay. But once I know T, then, then M is just a, a real vector. So I can put a prior on it. Uh, can I just interject? So the dimension of M is unbounded. I mean, this is one of the reasons that BART is non-parametric, right? So it's a feature of Bayesian non-parametrics that there's no, no effective limit of the number of potential parameters. Right. So we mentioned uh, probably the most famous non Bayesian non-parametrics would be the mixtures of Dirichlet process mixtures, and that has that, and that's that mixture model that I talked briefly about. But what makes it Bayesian non-parametrics is the number of mixture components is inferred as part of the Bayesian thing. So the dimension of the space is not fixed. So BART intrinsically has this on, on a big scale. Each one of these individual trees, uh, we're actually gonna learn the tree and we're gonna let the dimension vary. Okay, so it's not just that, well, each tree has a different dimension and so uh, that I know M, we're actually gonna infer the dimension of each tree. None of which are meaningful or identified. Okay. Okay, so I started with a Bernoulli example and I claimed that I still claim that there are certain things that are simple and we abstract this as the, I say it's the exact same thing, but obviously there's a lot of things going on here that there's a bunch of jumps. Okay. Bias is good. As soon as I have a proper prior, I want to shrink. That's how I make it work. What do I want this prior to do? How does this prior make this a meaningful model? I can list out very simply the key ideas that I need this prior to do. And some of them are just like in, in uh, the lasso. I wanna shrink things towards zero, okay? But there's another idea here as well. So I'm gonna put a prior. So I'm not gonna say each tree has to have five bottom nodes. I'm gonna put a prior on the tree, which gives me a marginal distribution for the number of bottom nodes. I'm going to specify a prior in the T in such a way that I can say, hey, conceivably you could have 10 bottom nodes, but I'm going to shrink you towards my prior beliefs are that the tree shouldn't be too big. Okay, see, I'm, I'm, it's a regularization prior. I'm shrinking towards simplicity. So this would be the key Bayesian idea. I want to allow for potential complexity. So I have a, potentially lots of complexity in my model but the prior shrinks towards simplicity. That's why I could run O equals X cubed with thousands of parameters and not crazy overfitting. I don't want the trees to be too big. I don't want the muse to be too big. That part feels a lot like the lasso or something like that or ridge regression, the shrinking the muse towards zero. Oh, sorry. So typically, I sub I'm going to maybe I should I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Typically, before I run the thing, I subtract off y bar, so I'm always shrinking the mean level towards zero. Okay. So when I say not too big, I'm, sh I'm literally shrinking towards zero, which makes sense because I'm going to subtract off the mean. Okay. So that's that's a lot right there. So exactly how we do that, you know, that's, we'll go into some of the detail, maybe not all the detail, but that was 
fundamental to involving this technology to specify these priors in such a way that we could do that. And without those priors, garbage. <clears throat> um, I have to put a prior on Sigma. And this one is, uh, is of all the priors, this is the one that's easiest to think about. If I, and I'm gonna show you a little example. Uh, if I put a prior that says Sigma is super small, you know what? It'll find trees that make Sigma super small, it'll overfit. So I can make it overfit by saying, I believe Sigma is super small. And conversely, I could make it underfit by saying, I think Sigma is super big. So I can get a lot of, I can get any damn thing I want out of it, right? Well, that's, okay, that was, that one didn't, that sounded too extreme, <laughs> not any damn thing. There's a wide range of things I gotta get out, but I, so I have to be able to sensibly set these priors. Okay. But just put like that, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Okay, so what's the nature of the prior on T? So if, I just have to choose one pi of T because the T's are IID. Okay, so we actually specify a process by which you can grow a tree. So for example, uh, this is the probability that a, a current bottom node will split. So we start the process with just one node and then we have the probability that it splits. So it's, sorry, D is the depth of the node. So when you have one node, the depth is zero. So the probability that that one node will split and have two children is alpha. And then as the tree grows, when you get down to a node, if once the depth gets big, then the probability of splitting gets smaller. So eventually the tree will just stop growing. Okay, so you grow a tree by starting with just one node. Oh, what's the probability it splits? Alpha. What's the probability this one splits? Well, now it's depth one, so it'll be not as likely as alpha. And besides to go down, the probability of splitting will get down, down, down. So alpha is the probability that the, that the one node splits. And after that, the probability gets smaller and smaller by one plus D to the, we call it beta. So if, if beta is big, you're gonna increase your preference for small trees. Pretty easy, right? That's how we did it. Okay, so for example, at the default, that's the prior distribution on the number of bottom nodes in a tree. Okay, so there's only a 3% chance that you have five bottom nodes. So there's a prior preference for small trees. Remember, <laughs> So if I, if, I, if I can fit the function with small trees, this prior will say, hey, <laughs> let's use the small trees. And that will be great. But it's just a prior. If the data strongly tells me I have higher order interactions, it can overcome that prior and make the trees bigger. So one time I was giving this talk and I said to myself, any talk in machine learning should have an example where the thing doesn't work. Anybody can find their five examples where it works show those five examples and walk out and say, I'm the greatest. So I say, well, obviously the thing is designed not to have too big trees, so not too high in order interaction. And so if I go back to an applied statistician from 1967 and say, I have prior beliefs about the level of interaction, they're gonna, I'm gonna be talking their language. They're gonna go, oh yeah, that, that's perfect sense. That's how we fit, you know, what the, I forget what they're called now. <laughs> One of those design of experiments models with the interaction. Anyway, um, so I simulated data which had 18 order interaction to show that it wouldn't work. It worked. <laughs> so again, this is kind of the magic of Bayes. I can shrink towards simplicity, but I don't impose it. If the data, if there's evidence in the data, it can move you out into the tail of that prior and find the complexity. So that's right, that's what, but if the data demands it, you can actually find higher order interactions. 
Uh, so that's so that's all I'm telling you about PFT. So there's some detail there, but not much. That's about all there is to it. Okay. Um, maybe I maybe the thing that's absolutely not there is okay. They select to give me the structure of the tree and you know when to stop growing it, but I have to pick the rules. So I'm just uniform on which corner of X goes in each rule, and then I'm just uniform. So now we're back to the uniform thing. I'm just uniform on the set of available cut points. And then that's pretty much my entire prior. Hey, Rob, um, it's right about noon. How many more slides do you have here? Uh, well, I guess I'm, what's that? What happened? Did it die on me? The zoom in? Yeah, you're, you're not on anymore. Uh, well, I have a bunch more slides. This isn't, I'm not close to finishing. How long, how long do you want to uh, continue? No, I think we should just stop for lunch and just keep going after lunch. So, All right, so um, should we resume at 1 p.m.? All right, we will resume at 1 p.m. CDT. Right now. Can you hear me now? But now I'm getting the feedback. Why don't you call the guy? He'll fix it in one second. Yeah, I'm muted. But it, it feels like it's coming from the... It feels like it's this uh, iPad. Of course, I didn't change anything while we were gone. So we're bad? You know, I just turned the sound down on my iPad. Can they, uh, see if they can hear me still hear, hear me on, on Zoom. Can you still hear me on Zoom? Okay, we're good. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I, I, I need a, I have this crazy model. And again, you know, if you haven't seen boosting before, this should be a little like, what the hell? This is not, it's not obvious at all. Uh, uh, I'll have a story a little while to try to make it uh, sensible. Uh, 
so I, I need my prior to do my Bayesian analysis. And I need the prior, the priors. I don't want to have a uniform prior. I need a prior that really makes a statement. And what statement do I need to make? I would like the trees to be small. Well, in a big picture, you can always think I'm shrinking towards simplicity. Although as we'll see soon, there's also an intimate connection to the basic intuition behind boosting as well. So there's actually two things going on here, at least two things. One is the kind of regularization idea and very general idea we talked about all day. But there's also aspects of this prior which are specific to the boosting intuition, which I'm gonna to get to soon. Okay. Uh, so maybe I can just say right now, the connection to boosting is uh, each one of these trees is supposed to only do a little bit of the fit. So the idea of boosting is, you know, why do I have all these trees? Well, each one of the trees just does a little bit of work fitting what the other ones didn't. You don't want one of the tree models to actually fit the data. And that's why it's, they're all uninterpretable. They're not fitting the data. They're fitting that little part of the structure that the other ones didn't capture. So I want each tree to be small for two reasons, not one. One reason I can say, well, I'm just shrinking towards simplicity. I, I want small trees, but there's also the basic boosting intuition that I want each one of these trees in the ensemble to just do a little bit of contribution to the fit. It's not trying to fit the overall pattern, the data, only the parts of the data the pattern not captured by the others. So, so consider Bart like a weak learner? Just consider, Sorry? Consider Bart to be a weak learner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, I, thank you. So that's what people call a weak learner. I want each one of the individual trees to be a weak learner, not learn the relationship on its own, just a little bit more, a bit of the fit. Absolutely. So that's an interesting thing about BART. That prior is actually doing two fundamental things. Again, one is the regularization idea. But it's also a weak learner idea going on there. Do I have weak learner on the slide? Should be a weak learner should be on that slide maybe. Thank you. Okay, so we have a prior on the tree that says, as you grow, grow the tree, the deeper down you go, the less likely you are to grow. And that gives us a implied prior in the number of bottom nodes. So we have a prior saying we want small trees. Uh, then, then given the tree, remember our the structure of the prior is T and then M given T. Given T, M is just all the, the mu's on the bottom node. That's actually relatively simple. So we make those independent. So I just have to choose one pi of mu. So, uh, so first of all, we're gonna start by just centering the data. So in the R package, we literally just subtract off Y bar, okay? So you can think of it as the actual model is Y equals mu plus F of X plus error. And we just point estimate mu with Y bar. That you can put a prior on mu, and I guess in some of our work we, we do something like that. Uh, okay, so we just subtract off, we just estimate mu with y bar and subtract it off. So that means it makes sense to my prior for each mu is normal mean zero tau squared. Okay, see how simple this is? So this is what Bart may, makes Bart work, how simple this is. So if tau is small, all the mu's are shrunk towards zero, okay? And, uh, and again, there's two things going on there. One thing is, well, the usual kind of shrinkage towards, you know, just like in the lasso, just like in ridge regression, shrink the parameters towards zero. And now zero makes sense, okay? But there's also the weak learner thing. I want each individual tree model to only do a little bit. I don't want it to do too much, okay? So how do we choose this, this tau parameter? So uh, the function given uh, all the trees and the M is, uh, so how do, I, how do we evaluate the function? You drop the X down this tree, you get a mu, right? You drop the X down this tree, you get a mu. Dot, 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 you drop the X down this tree, you get a mu. So you'll get the sum of the mu's from the different trees. 
Okay, so that's what I had there. I'm just talking about the prior now, right? So the actual uh, F at X, given all the trees in M, is the sum of the mu's from the individual trees. But in the prior, each one of those mu's is normal zero tau squared. So this is where you need stat 100. Uh, so what's the sum of in, what's the distribution of the sum of independent normals with mean zero and variance tau squared? Mean zero and variance m tau squared. Okay, so it's an absolutely trivial calculation. I tell you, this is absolutely crucial for BART to work because I can actually put a prior on the function f of x, even though we have all these trees and different dimensions and you know, there, it's a fairly sophisticated thing going on. Once I pick tau, f of x given the tree is normal with mean zero and variance m tau squared, where m is the number of trees in the ensemble. Done. <clears throat> that is so simple and so crucial to how the hell can I put out a default prior? And you run it with 100 X's, blah, 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 blah. You run it with five X's and 200 observations. You have 75 X's and five, 50. How can it possibly work in all those different problems? <gasps> this is why. Okay. So F of X given T, it says it does not depend on T. It doesn't on the details of T, but the dimension of course depends on T. So that, that statement's not quite right. Except, you know, f of x given t is normal zero, zero m tau squared. The m depends on t, but in no other way. So it's completely trivial. What's the prior distribution of f of x? Just that normal. Okay, so f is not a simple thing, but I specify the prior in such a way that it's a simple prior to think about. <clears throat> So uh, how do we do the default in the R package? So in principle, you could pick this, right? You could actually be a Bayesian and say, gee, I think f of x should range and have this kind of range. <clears throat> but how do we do the R package? We say, well, uh, I want, I look at the actual data. So it's not pure Bayesian. I ballpark the prior off the data. I, I take the range over the Y values. So just look at the range of the y values and I want f of x to kind of be able to walk from the biggest x, the distribution of f to cover that range of the y values. Okay, so if there was no noise, then y would equal f of x. So I'm just letting f of x cover the observed y's. And I just, uh, so um, I let the, uh, so k is the actual parameter you choose in the, in the R package. So we usually the default for K is two. So the standard deviation is square root of M tau. So square root of M tau times K should be half the range of the data. Okay. So, uh, so at K equals two, that says, you know, plus or minus two standard deviations of half of X kind of covers the range of the data. Okay. But, Sometimes you do play around with K. You know, I can tighten it up by making a bigger K. I can spread it out by having a smaller K. But it's not too hard to think about. You know, you try K equals two, you try K equals one, three, four, five, and that's about it. It's really not too bad. <clears throat> I think when I beat that guy in the wavelets, I, I bumped up K. Okay. So again, so now you understand there. So there is a parameter K in the, in the, our package, and now you know exactly what it is. K is a way of specifying tau. The variance of f of x is m tau squared. It, it couldn't be, almost couldn't be easier. <clears throat> uh, you can also just directly specify the standard deviation of f. Just say, I want the standard deviation to be whatever. If you believe you know that a, a good prior range for f of x should be, you know, whatever that standard deviation is rather than doing the default off the data. <clears throat> and I, I did use that in my finance application. My finance application, the data was incredibly noisy. 
So uh, I didn't feel like ballparking that prior off the data was such a great idea. So I actually talked to my finance co-author and you know tried to think about what a reasonable range is for the f of x, which is in that application was expected return. And my finance co-author had strong beliefs about that. Okay. So that's, you know, maybe if I've left out some detail, it's maybe some details on that prior in the tree, but we covered the, the heart of it. But I really think that this is the one that really makes it work. Maybe that's too strong, but, you know, maybe everything matters. Okay, so I'm done with the, the, the funky tree stuff. I just have to put a prior on sigma squared. And now we're back to, you know, almost as simple as the Bernoulli problem. We have a single real parameter and I'm gonna just use the standard Bayesian con conjugate prior uh, to do it. So sigma squared is new lambda over chi squared nu. So I have to pick uh, nu and lambda. Uh, so what we do is we, we get a ballpark estimate of sigma hat. So for example, we, we can run the linear regression and just get the sigma hat estimate from linear regression and we're gonna ballpark our prior after that. Um, so we're going to choose, as we often do, a, a relatively small value of nu, so the prior is not too strong. <clears throat> and then we'll choose lambda to position the prior for sigma, who asked me that, for sigma <clears throat> relative to what that sigma hat is. Okay, so we'll choose lambda so, so that probably uh, sigma is less than sigma hat is q, where q is, I think, uh, the default is 90 percent. <laughs> okay, so the defaults in the package are nu is three, three degrees of freedom. We pick the quantile 0.9. And so for example, if that was sigma hat right there, that would be my prior for sigma. So what does that prior say? Two things. <laughs> First of all, it's fairly spread out but it kind of pushes you to sigma smaller than what you got off, say, a linear regression. <clears throat> so that has the belief that I'm gonna do better than linear, <clears throat> but it's not a strong belief. Okay. See if you think this is funny. So I told, a, <laughs> I told an audience, we chose this prior so that when people ran the default, if it was nonlinear, they would get results a lot better than linear. And it, we didn't really care if they got worse results because they wouldn't report it. They'd only publish it. We chose the prior. <laughs> people would publish all the good results they got and it wouldn't matter about the bad results because they just wouldn't publish it. It wouldn't be a terrible idea, right? It's kind of like, it's deeply immoral. <laughs> we just, but that's not how we chose it. Okay. But, uh, you know, we did say, you know what? We're going to be linear, <clears throat> but it's not a strong prior. Okay. So, uh, so there's our, you know, so as we go through the, the model and the prior, what's the difference? The, the prior is part of the model, right? The, so that's the interesting thing about Bayesian statistics. The distinction between prior model becomes blurred. Now is the idea of complete the model with the prior. Without the prior, it's a meaningless model. So that distinction gets blurred in high dimensional Bayesian stuff. So as we go through the, the, the model, including the prior, we're understanding the different choices you can make beyond the defaults. We're also understanding how we chose the defaults. Okay, so uh, it would be very evil of me to, to do my joke, but it was not at all evil of me to say, "Gee, I'd like to have some default settings for the prior that would work pretty reasonably in a wide variety, wide set of cases." I mean, that's a funny thing. The defaults, like. Uh, 
some of the defaults on scikit-learn are nuts. If you don't know enough and you just run the thing, you can get horrible results. And sometimes they're not, sometimes they're reasonable. That's a tricky thing when you learn the machine learning software. How much do I really have to know to drive this thing? And that can really depend on how much thought went into the defaults when the person designed the software. Okay, so for example, we now have a bunch of uh, <clears throat> uh, options in the, the software. You can set the degrees of freedom for new, you can set the sigma estimate, which you're ballparking that thing off. If you don't set anything, it'll just again, run the multiple regression and base it off that estimate from the multiple regression. Unless P is bigger than N, in which case you can't run the multiple regression if the number of X's is bigger than N, then it bases it off the sample standard deviation of Y, which is a totally different thing. <clears throat> so that's a detail that's in the software that could really screw you up. Uh, that we should probably fix. Okay. So for example, a nice thing about, say, if you do regularized regression, you can have more X's than observations and it will still work because the shrinkage will keep the problem well-defined. Uh, the way my software is currently set up, uh, the ballpark for that sigma prior is very, very different. <laughs> That's probably not a good idea. <clears throat> I think I've been meaning to fix that for like a bunch of years and I never, I always forget about it. Uh, so you so you can choose all these and of course you can just uh, choose lambda directly if you want to rather than using this quantile mechanism. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to basically skip this. So uh, this is just a summary of what we just talked about. And all I did was do a little example where I kind of played around with this prior to show that, you know, it does have an effect. So for example, I, I played around with those parameters to choose all those different priors for sigma and then saw what effect it had on the BART fit. So for example, I managed to get BART to do the green line. <laughs> How did I get Bart to be that bad? I put in a strong prior that sigma was big. And then by golly, it, it gave me a, a crappy fit. Okay. So you should be able to screw it up by choosing these parameters badly. This prior, if you choose a crap prior, <laughs> crap enough prior, you can get a crap result. But it's amazingly robust. I really had to like be an idiot to wreck it. I was kind of surprised again at how well it worked. You know, I tried to wreck it. Uh, so for a wide range of priors on Sigma, I actually got very similar results, but let me, let me not go into those details. Let's just do quickly. So, but now we have the big picture. Okay. So uh, as we were saying, you know, we could stop now and you would, you could claim you kind of understand bar. You could certainly run it. You would know lots about the options of the software. Okay. Let's just sketch the, so, so when you do these high dimensional Bayesian analysis, you know, what are your two fundamental problems? One is how to specify the prior in a meaningful way. So, and that is the key thing about, that is a key thing about BART, that, that even though it is a high dimensional complex model, the prior is pretty comprehensive. How about the MCMC? Uh, the other thing about BART is this MCMC works much better than, I, than you, you might think it would be even though it's, it's not too creative, but here we go. So here's our model right there, okay? So what's our MCMC? Uh, just like we did with a mixture of normals, you just draw you know, one thing given everything else and you just cycle through the things. So for example, you just draw sigma given all the tree models, okay? So if I know all the tree models, I know the function, I can just do y minus f of x, I know the errors, and that's a simple conjugate problem. Okay, so that would be a classic example of where the Gibbs sampling is so easy. Conditional on all the tree models, I observe the errors. Drawing sigma with that conditionally conjugate prior is just a basic Bayesian calculation. 
how do I draw the, all the tree models? Well, I just draw one tree model at a time. So the TM pair is one of the tree models. So I say, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, I'll suppose I knew all the other TM, T, J, M, J, let's draw T1, M1. And then you just cycle through and draw each pair one at a time, given all the other ones. <clears throat> so for example, suppose I want to draw T1, M1, I can just subtract the fit from the, all the other trees from each side. And then I have a single tree model, y equals just g of t1 m1 plus error. Once I subtracted all the tree fits from both sides, from the other tree models. So can I ask a clarifying question here? Um, when you say draw a tree model, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Draw? Yeah, you're, saying you're drawing a tree. What is, what is, what do you, conditional on all the others. What is that? What do you mean by that? Okay, so T and M, you, you, you know, you know what they are. And given all, conditional and all this other stuff, look, look who's the somebody, I forgot to, I didn't, it was supposed to be understood that the data is there, okay? So the, there's, a, there's an error in that slide. There's data, it's understood. This is always conditional on the data, okay? So I have to draw that tree structure and I have to draw that M. So that's not obvious how to do that. We're gonna to get to that. That's your question, okay? So the structure of the Gibbs sampler is supposed to be obvious. But when I say draw a tree, that's not obvious. <clears throat> right. Uh, excuse me, can, can I add a more uh, question? So where is the mu here in between of this process? Where's what? Mu. Mu, uh, mu, mu, I. Uh, so remember, sorry, that's the notation. Remember the MI is all the mu's for the ith tree. So this is completely uh, understandable at this point. So M equals mu one, mu two, up to mu B, where B is the number of bottom nodes. Hey, Rob. Can, can you come over and look at this? We have a, a chat question, but it's too complicated for me to read. So, uh, or I can read them out loud if you want. Uh, or do you want to finish before you come back to those? Okay. So it's funny when you learn these things. So, you know, if you ask Rob, Rob will tell you, oh, Bart's simple. That's why it's great. But I guess it's not really simple, right? There's a lot of layers to their stuff and a lot of details. So each, each one little part is going to be, I'll tell you, oh, that's easy, that's obvious. But the whole package is less than obvious. Okay. Okay, so, and then, you know, when you read these things, you have to break down, like, so top level, I can say, it's just a Gibbs sample. And then psychologically, you, you have to put aside for a second that it's not clear how you, the details of that piece. Okay, now we're gonna drill down and say, wait, you know. Okay, oops, I missed something here. Okay, so that's my Gibbs sampler. At a high level, that's obvious. This draw is completely obvious. If you've had any sort of, it's no more complicated than the Bernoulli example that I did earlier today. Uh, this draw is not obvious, as you noticed right away. So the way you, so now we have some discussion of that. And the key thing there is, first we integrate out M, we marginalize out the M, so that we're only drawing T. Okay, so, this, and with that choice, that's another reason we have that normal prior, because with that normal prior, we can do the marginalization analytically. We can do all the integrals analytically. So I have to integrate out all the mu, mu parameters so that I just have T given uh, all the other tree models in sigma rather than M and T. 
And then we're going to draw T, not obvious, so wait for it. And then, given I draw T, I can draw M given T. M given T is pretty straightforward because the M's are just normal means. So that part reduces again to a basic Bayesian calculation. Okay. So again, you have to get your levels of abstraction <laughs> correct to eliminate the details that you need to eliminate. Now we need to drill down and say, okay, what the hell does Rob mean by draw T? So up to now I've said, well, we have Markov chain Monte Carlo and my example has always been Gibbs sampling. I'll just draw from these conditionals one at a time. Okay, so when I did the mixture model, that was my example. So draw from the conditionals one at a time. Here, that's a simple Gibbs sampler. I just draw from the conditionals one at a time. Then I start getting a little tricky. Trick one, when I draw this pair, I actually integrate out M. Trick two, how do I draw T? Now this can't be easy because T is this tree. It's not a standard parameter. But then we just use the other basic tool in Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is the metropolis hastings algorithm. So the two things that you have to know in Markov chain Monte Carlo, there's a million things, but the two basic things would be give sampling and metropolis. So what metropolis does is, is you're at a current tree and you're allowed to say, hmm, what if you, let's propose changing the tree in a certain way, then you ever either accept or reject that change in such a way that it's still true that the posterior is the stationary distribution, okay? So that's, here I'm really waving my hands. I don't wanna go through all that stuff. But what it boils down to is to draw a T, I have to propose moves in the tree space. And uh, there's a whole literature on moves in the tree space now. It's pretty interesting. But the fundamental thing that makes Here's another fundamental thing that makes BART work. How many fundamental things have I had? The list is getting a little long. Okay, so maybe it's not that simple. Here's another thing that's absolutely fundamental to BART being cool, is this birth death move. So this might be the current value of tree seven out of 200. So I wanna draw tree seven, given all the other trees and their associated M's. Okay, so uh, here's a, a, a birth move. Uh, so I, I take this bottom node and I propose adding children. See the dimension of the tree just changed. So you can pick any pair. So bottom nodes always comes in pairs, right? There's the left child and the right child. So we, we literally, Look at the tree, enumerate all the pairs of, ch of children, randomly pick one of the pairs, randomly pick one of the, the left or right child and propose adding children to that one. Then that move is accepted or rejected according to the Metropolis algorithm approach, which involves the integrated distribution where we've integrated out M for both of the two trees under consideration. And then complementary to the birth step where the, a tree could add children, there's a death step where you kill children, where you pick any two, you randomly pick up a pair of children and propose collapsing them back to one node. <clears throat> so this is again, a, a key part of part. So remember I promised you that, gee, uh, you know, uh, uh, often, I don't know about always, but often a cool thing about Bayesian non parametrics is the dimension of the parameter space changes as you, as you do your inference. <clears throat> so in the mixture model, you get Bayesian non-parametrics by inferring the number of mixture components, the dimension of the model changes. In BART, we have the same thing in the same picture. Every time you run the, do an MCMC scan, the dimension of each tree can change and get bigger or smaller. So it doesn't even have a fixed dimension, okay? So that makes it a very interesting exploration of this model space. <clears throat> okay, so uh, that's not the only move out there, but that's the key move. Uh, in fact, if you just program 
uh, Bart, with just that birth death move. Uh, I think all the examples I've shown you only use that birth death move. <sighs> now, if you do a single tree, just using that birth death move won't work. But if you have many trees, you can actually get away with much simpler moves in that tree space and still have it work pretty well. Okay, so for example, Matt Pertola has a really cool paper. We propose this pretty sophisticated moves in the tree space. Um, in BART, it doesn't really make much difference if you add those in, but if you ever want to do Bayesian inference on a single tree, then you'd have to, it would really be worth your time to invest in learning about these more complex moves. Uh, I have one question. Here. So uh, can, can we go for the like previous slide? Uh, on, before, yeah, yeah. So for the T, if it is gap step, so is there have any initial value? Like how do you choose the initial value of that? Uh, so when the, program starts, there's 200 trees, and each tree is just a single node. That's the starting values. Not obvious that's going to work. <laughs> it works. Um, so as you run the MCMC, each tree will can grow in size and shrink. I should have a slide like this because it's one of the first things I looked at when I coded it up. You know, if you look at tree seven, it starts off with just one node. At iteration 1,225, it could have five bottom nodes. At each iteration 5,678, it could be back to one node. Um, so not to get too bogged down in the details, but basically you've got your Gibbs sampler or T, T and M within each Gibbs step and you do a full Metropolis Hastings to search the, the space of tree. I don't know what full means. I mean, you, 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 you do Metropolis Hastings over, you know, you're doing multiple, many, many iterations of Metropolis. No, no. You just do one Metropolis Hastings? It, yep. So you could do that, but we don't just do one proposal. One reach, accept, reject, and then move on. For each tree, but there's 200 trees. So in one pass, there's a lot of proposals on tree changes, but each individual tree. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so this is my one slide to make the whole thing intuitive. So uh, I want to represent a complex object. So here's a, a complex scene. Uh, so, so I don't know if you can see it that well. This is called pointillism. By, it's a famous painting by Shira. And pointillism, you just add little dabs of paint. You don't do big brush strokes. You just add little dabs of, of paint and the dabs add up to give you the overall picture. So that's my intuitive explanation for how BART works, how weak learners work. So I think of each tree as just a little dab of paint to fill out the overall picture. You only get the overall picture has the sum of the contributions of all of the trees, of all of the dabs of paint, okay? And this is why this ensemble thing works so well, because each one of these TM pairs is not trying to understand how Y is related to X. It's just trying to look for a little piece of signal that the other trees haven't figured out. And if you're familiar with boosting, I think that is consistent with the basic intuition that you would hear about boosting. But I think it, that, that boosting intuition really comes to life in this Bayesian approach. And then additionally, so that's kind of the way I think about the model. I mean, and that's why the prior, again, it's not just the regularization in the prior. It's not just shrinking towards simpler things, which is our overarching theme. 
the prior has to make sure that each tree is just a little dab of paint. I don't want one of the trees to grow big and try to capture the relationship between Y and X by itself. I just want it to be one more little bit of fit. So that's, uh, to me, an essential intuition for the, the, the sum of trees model. So here's a weird fact that helps you understand that. You can always express the sum of trees as one big tree. So what the hell are you doing, Rob? Why don't you just have one big tree? Well, with one big tree, two things go wrong. First of all, I can't do this little add up the fits thing. The boosting thing is gone. <clears throat> and second of all, the MCMC gets so much harder. So why does the part MCMC work so much more easily than the MCMC on a single big tree model? It's because when I do a little change on one tree, I'm just taking one little dab away. So I'm just like, just like, take a dab away, add a dab, take a dab away, add a dab. And you know, if you add a dab and it makes it look more like the beach, is that a beach? <laughs> like the scene, keep it. If you add a dab and it makes it look less like the scene, reject it, okay? So it's a cool example of the whole computing world, right? It's a ridiculous algorithm but computers are fast. But, uh, Rob, can I, so I think there's one thing to say why the, the ensemble is not like a big tree also. And that is some of the trees in the fit can be like contradictory. And they call that uh, in ensemble theory, they call it contradictory. So, or I'm uh, sorry, they call it ambiguity. So um, I don't know if, if you want to, Go any further. <laughs> I just I just thought I would add that. Well, just in the sense of you know, any one tree is totally not interpretable, right? Because it's only amending what the other ones are doing. So it, you know, in searching the tree space, it might make sense to have one tree give, another tree take away. And that might actually make it traverse the whole model space better by doing that or not doing that. Right. It's all random stochastics. It's not a bad thing. A ambiguity probably is one of the reasons that ensembles work better than a one big tree. In this case, absolutely. <laughs> uh, put a, one other point. Uh, some trees, right, you can always write it as one big tree, but a crucial thing is that the, the outputs at those, at those leaf nodes will share parameters when you use the sum of trees. So you get some sort of smoothing that happens once you, once you start doing the ensembling. That, that's relative to one big tree. So you, you get some more what, what, flexibility here. What do you mean share parameters? You have two trees. You've got the muse from tree one and the muse from tree two. And then you write the sum as one big tree. The muse for that one big tree will have some muse from- Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, and that induces some correlation or smoothness. Right, right. Right, I should have that picture. <laughs> So if I took the, the sum of trees and wrote it as one big tree, the mu's in the individual regions would be sums of some of the mu's from all the individual trees. To repeat what Samir just said. Okay, folks. First absolute finish. That's all the fundamentals. Okay. So uh, there's gonna be more stuff about how to run the software. And of course, this is just the most basic part model. You know, uh, there's been lots of developments to take the BART's ideas and apply them to all kinds of different modeling situations. So we'll, we'll learn about some of those as well. But I, I claim uh, that those are the basic concepts of the, that have made it a powerful technique. Can you, So I just have uh, some examples, which I'm kind of I'm going to kind of skip because uh, I I think Rodney needs to get going on some other stuff. Um, so here are some other options in the code, and what these options allow you to do. First of all, uh, 
control how many you save. So I might run 10,000 MCM iterations, but I don't want to save, you know, all 10,000. So it, it can, you can, instead of thinning after you get it all back, you can thin as you go along. And, you know, once you get to a big problem and lots of iterations, you know, we're talking memory, we're talking disk space, we're talking, oh, I'm not spending all my computational time doing my MCMC, I'm spending my computational time managing all these giant data structures. So there's a bunch of options in there. For example, uh, in my finance project, I just wanted the prediction. I didn't want all the draws. So I could say, don't keep any of the, all these things I've been talking about, just keep the average over all the draws of f at x. And that, then I just got the point prediction, but that's all I wanted. And then it ran just you know, much faster, much simpler. Uh, so like n keep test, how many draws of that? So remember we just, when I started off, I said, all you have to know is y hat dot test. The number of rows is the number of draws. Well, I might want to do, you know, 10,000 iterations, but keep every 10th. And they'll have the same amount of information as I kept all of them and be at one tenth the size. Okay. So uh, there's a bunch of options like that. Um, so I tried a bunch of these. And then the other thing that might be worth knowing uh, another thing that might be worth knowing. Uh, there is actually a predict method. <laughs> so when I showed you the software before, I said, oh, you give it the training data X, Y, and then you give it the X's you want to predict that. Uh, it does actually return all the drawn ensembles. And you can decide, you can, you can say, well, I did 10,000 iterations, but I only want to keep each 10th ensemble. So, you know, we're talking about a lot of trees. If every draw has 200 trees and you do 10,000 draws, it's, you know, it's a lot of trees and you don't necessarily need them all, okay? So you can say, uh, I'm going to keep the trees, but I only keep, you know, a thousand, even if I did 20,000 iterations and it'll keep the trees. And then you can call a predict function, which will take those saved trees and you know, evaluate f of x based on those trees. So there is a predict function as well. Okay, so here I just timed out just so to see the top first call the bar is just BART x, y, x predict. Okay. which of course works pretty well. <laughs> and then I did, then the next two, I did it in two steps. I just called BART, but this time I, I, I didn't keep any of the tests or train draws, but I kept a hundred trees. By a hundred trees, I mean a hundred ensembles of trees. And then using the hundred of ensembles, I called the predict method. And I used eight cores using the standard R parallel computing thing to do the calculations, okay? So let's not go through all that level of detail. Let's leave it to Rodney to start going to detail in the package. I'm just kind of showing you uh, that's kind of stuff out there. Many of those options I, I coded in to do my darn uh, finance project because it was just too slow without those. And I should mention XBART too. Richard Hahn has worked on uh, pseudo BART algorithms that just run faster on bigger data. But there are a bunch of options that allow you to, you know, thin down how much you're actually storing because you don't need every draw. And there is a predict method there and there is uh, access to the basic parallel uh, computing facilities that are in R. So rather than one chain, running one chain, you can run eight chains at a time. Okay, that wouldn't be hard to just program yourself. So there I was just comparing the, the predictions I got from the, there I'm carrying the predictions I got from running this thing, X, Y, X, P, to running the second thing, where I just saved hundred trees and then called the predict method. So I got virtually the same thing. And uh, it took 116 seconds to do the first way. And it took 23 plus nine seconds to do it the second way. Okay. So it depends on what application you're working on, whether you give a, if, whether you care about that or not. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll just tell you what I did here. Let's not go through it all. 
So this would be the close, I shouldn't skip this because this might be the closest to like a real data example. So I took the diabetes data. So this is a fairly famous uh, data set in the sense of uh, Tip Shirani and Hasty used it in one of the seminal uh, lasso papers as an example. Okay, so, uh, so I got the data from the Hasty Tip Shirani Wainwright website, okay? But it's used in this Lars paper. So Lars is one of the early lasso type algorithms, okay? So there were 442 patients and they measured things about patients and they were trying to predict disease progression. Okay, so a fairly standard example. Yeah. And what they did in this large paper was they said, well, okay, we got 10 X's, but it could be nonlinear. Let's throw in a bunch of squares and cross products. Okay. So people do this a lot now, and it's not a bad idea at all. I don't want to bad mouth this at all. I, there's something to be said for this. It often works well in practice. So they start off with like, I forget, it's 10 or 11 X's, but by the time they, uh, By the time they threw in all the polynomial terms, they had 64, okay? So the, the lasso approach, and again, you know, these are the developers of the lasso doing this, it's not me, uh, said, okay, you know, we'll do, we got 440 observations, we'll put in 62 X's with all the transformations. Well, we all know if you just throw in polynomials willy-nilly, you'll just overfit. No problemo, <laughs> you run the lasso and you do something reasonable. And there's a lot of truth to that. And that's an important part of modern. Remember the most used method on my thing? Who, who is it said linear? Was it you? Uh, linear is number one, but lasso type linear, not, not anything else. Okay. So that's a good application. And, and of course, you know, they used it in the paper. It works pretty well. Uh, and you get variable selection too, a, a chunk of the coefficients. At the good lasso solution, several of the coefficients are set to zero. It's a beautiful application. But, uh, but screw that. I haven't got time for that. I should be able to just run BART without any transformations and do well, right? Uh, so that's what I did. I just gave BART the original 10 Xs and, instead of all the polynomial transformations. And then I just put it in a loop. <laughs> And each iteration of the loop, I randomly pick 75% of the data to be trained and then 25% to be test. BART, I just run default BART on the training data. There's no tuning. The lasso has to take that 75% of the data and do all the cross validation and blah, blah, blah to pick the, the parameter. Okay. And uh, that's the out of sample root mean square across the different random partitions, BART versus lasso. So they're virtually the same, okay? So I, I wasn't hoping to beat it because, you know, they probably picked that example for a reason. But the point is just running default BART, you know, I, I did as well, right, automatically. And of course, I get way more than they get in the sense of, it's a crappy graphic, but what it, it has uh, box plots of the draws of f of x. So I gotta change the slide, the box plots are crap. But the point is I can do exactly what I did in the beginning of the talk. Not only can I get you good out of sample prediction, but I can actually suppose you had a patient and you were wondering, gee, what's gonna happen with this guy? Maybe I want my uncertainty rather than a point prediction. Uh, I did just as well automatically at the default setting as they did with the lasso and whatever, however they picked those transformations. Plus I get a sense of the uncertainty. How many people like this plot? Rob always says he hates this plot, but to me, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, you're comparing to running um, default BART, but of course you do cross validation and, and, and tune your BART parameters. Yes, yes. So let me finish with one story here. So in the original part paper, we compared running the default versus tuning on like uh, 50 different data sets. And we compared it to neural nets and 
ran a forest and boost him. So when we tune the prior, we beat all the other methods across these 50 data sets. When we just ran default, our performance was comparable to the other methods. And the other doing the other methods included uh, an honest attempt on our part to tune them. Okay, so we had to do what I just said we you do in the had to do in the lasso was that you know every time you fit on train you have to do tuning. Okay. And then the, to me, the funny part of this story is uh, we wrote the paper like, wow, the default thing is killer. And we got the referee reports back and the referee said, oh, you're wrong. What's really cool here is that if you tune it, it beats the other methods. So we kind of changed the writing a little bit <laughs> just to say, oh, you know, just to change the emphasis. You know what you do. You know, you know. Uh, but I firmly believe <laughs> that a big part of the success of Bard is that you can run it at the default and do pretty well. I don't think there's a ton of people out there tuning that prior. So I think we were right. But, but you know, uh, one of the million things that I keep telling myself I should do is pick a tuning scheme that's fairly automatic and put it in the art in the Bard package so that if somebody wants to spend the time to tune, they could do it. And we would we would pick a tuning scheme, um, and then you know it could well be that if people run that automatically, what an obvious idea, right? How much ML, ML software is there like that? Yeah, I think uh, I think the DBARTS package might have, have that a cross validation uh, aut automation for uh, if you if you want to try it. Yeah. Maybe we should do that too. But if I went to do it, it's not a gimme, right? Because you have to, I have to go back over the talk I just gave <laughs> and decide, and I have to go back over my old paper and I'd have to make hard decisions about exactly what should be tuned. I think it's possible you could be overfitting too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. you're not very careful and cross validating you could uh, just as easily overfit. Because you've got all this smart uh, priors in here not to overfit. And then what are you doing yeah. by? I mean, when you tune, you look at your auto sample performance. So that's supposed to stop you from tuning. Yeah, but. Um... But I'll, I'll agree with you just. It's not obvious exactly. How, I'd be interested to see what they did in DBARTS then, but I don't think it's obvious how you would do it. But it would be a good thing to put in the package, maybe. We, I think a lot of people would, might try that if it was there. But they don't want to do what I just said, which is design their own tuning thing, because you have to understand all these priors that we just went through pretty well to decide. And also, I would like to know if we need to tune in the parameter based on previous experience, how much computational time you should take. I mean, that could be. <laughs> no, it's going to be a lot. Right. Whether it's worth it. To... Uh, I... I almost Rich search CV. How many of you run that in Scikit-Learn? No, nobody really. Uh, you've, almost, you've run something like it in R or whatever like that. It takes time. I almost never tune it. It's it's too time consuming, and generally the fit you get is is so good anyway. I mean, maybe you could beat it a little bit, but it's not worth it. <laughs> okay, so I said I was going to make outrageous claims, but I think Rodney beat me. Uh, so Rodney just said it works so well. This is a waste of time. Especially true for the number of trees. Okay, um, that's a more than I can talk in a day. Now I have to like say nothing for many hours to recover. <laughs> do you, Do you want to come over and take a peek at this question though? Maybe. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. From the chat. Um, why don't you look at that? Well, uh, I'm. Well, we'll, we'll, all of them. Yeah. Somebody asked three questions. Four questions. Um, you could respond online if you want. Um, you can just look at those while I switch over. So, why, so they're certainly correlated in the posterior. They're certainly uncorrelated in the prior. Uh, sure, let me read the question. <laughs> Number one, are the trees correlated since all predictors are presumably considered at every split similar to bagging? What does, cor what does it mean for a tree to be correlated with another tree? <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming it means they're dependent. 
you know, of course, in the posterior, they're highly dependent. That's the whole part of the boosting thing. Because it's each tree only means something in the context of all the other trees. Okay. So question two, I understand the weak learner idea, but in boosting the weak learners are used sequentially on residuals. Okay, so, so that I should have emphasized. That's a good question, just to go back and emphasize. Uh, although now you have to know what boosting is. So in boosting, you add in the trees sequentially one at a time. Okay. So you, whereas this is what's called Bayesian backfitting. You have this set of trees and then you cycle through all the trees and, and keep adjusting one tree given all the others. And you can go back and forth as many times as you want through all the trees and that's called uh, give sampling. Okay, so the, the Markov team Monte Carlo, I think gives you a more thorough search of the, the model space than just the sequential boosting. So that's a whole other way to spin it than anything I've said today. I think I just have a more effective stochastic search and model space than just the sequential fit that you have in boosting. Uh, while we're on boosting, remember when you, when you do boosting, uh, one of the tuning parameters is the depth of the tree. I think that's a huge reason why BART is great because we infer the depths of all the trees as part of the MCMC. Whereas in boosting, it's a tuning parameter. So you know how much we hate tuning parameters. <laughs> okay, if you've done applied machine learning, you hate tuning parameters. That's why the lasso is great, one tuning parameter. <laughs> you want me to read it? So uh, since machine learning algorithms adjacent to BART all require very large sample sizes in order to produce generalizable models, does BART require large sample sizes as well? No, we had examples like that. So it works pretty well with smaller data sets, which is important. I think the big data thing's overblown. We have more data sets, but it's not true that every data set is suddenly a million observations. We have lots of small data sets. They're important. It also works well with big data. And again, Richard Hahn and, his, and some of his co-authors have explored uh, altering the BART algorithm so that it works better just computationally with, with larger data sets than the MCMC. All right, I'll read the last one. How much heterogeneity is there among the different trees given the prior on the depths? Allowing the heterogeneity seems like it would be a nice perk over something like XGBoost, which requires the user to tune or pre-specify the maximum depth of all maximum depth of all learners. So in XGBoost, you 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 could you sequentially add in trees, but you have to tune. Uh, each tree has a fixed depth. The fixed size. Whereas at every iteration of my Markov chain Monte Carlo, I'm changing the, the size of each tree. Okay, so there's a lot of heterogeneity in the sizes of the trees. And not only that, but again, you know, a single tree doesn't mean anything really, except relative to what the other ones happen to be right now. And I think it's, I'll repeat what I said before. As you run the MCMC, if you look at tree 57, you start it with one node, you run it for a while, it could have five bottom nodes. You run it further, it could be back to one bottom node. So it's more than a heterogeneity. <laughs> you know, it's part of the stochastic model search to let each individual tree change as we go through all these different Gibbs sampling iterations. So the fundamental comp, forget about all the Bayesian junk. Okay, so Rob's gonna give you his Bayesian spiel. Rob's a Bayesian. I am, but I could pitch the whole thing as a stochastic search and model space, which is more effective than boosting. And maybe that's why people care about it, not the Bayesian garbage. But I, obviously I use the Bayesian machinery very effectively to handle all these basic issues that we discussed all day. I don't, wait, is there anything else that has just a default setting that works pretty reliably? Is there anything else? I don't think there's anything else. That's a pretty, okay. That's a strong statement. <laughs> Let me stop there. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Robert, for your excellent talk. 
Um, next, let me introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rodney, uh, Dr. Rodney Sparampani. Um, I believe that most of you in this room and online should be familiar with Rodney. Uh, he is an associate professor uh, in the Division of Biostatistics at MCW. Um, and his research applies based methods to many important biostatistical research programs, including causal inference, uh, survival analysis, uh, health service research, and more. Uh, currently, his research focus is on Bayesian non-parametric methods and Bayesian machine learning. Um, Rodney is also very experienced on Bayesian additive regression trees. Uh, next, he will uh, share his, his experience and uh, his perspectives uh, on BART with us. Uh, welcome, Rodney. All right, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, let's have a, let's have some applause for Rob. All right, so um, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, Rob and I have compiled a, way too much material for two days, so, um, so, but it's all gonna be online. Uh, all of the slides are gonna be online. Uh, and um, so uh, wherever we stop, you'll still have a chance to uh, go through all of the material. Uh, it's all out there and uh, we wish we had three or four days. <laughs> um, so, um, so I'm going to talk first a little bit about the software. So, um, so in association with our collaborators, we've created several R packages for BART, and mainly today I'm going to talk about R packages. Um, uh, so R has done a nice job of papering over the differences between the the main three platforms: uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Uh, but um, you know, there are some major differences between the platforms uh, uh, that you can't easily paper over, especially uh, in regards to multi-threading, which BART really uh, uh, benefits a lot from multi-threading. So I've created this uh, in installation instructions to help you uh, get multi-threading working. Um, most of it is automated, but uh, you can run into uh, uh, issues. Um, it very very easily uh, with getting uh, the multi-threading working. Uh, so so that's why I had to create these for my students originally, and now um, I'm sharing them with you. Um, here's a, a slide that talks about uh, the major packages. So uh, one of the first packages was Beige Tree. That's something that uh, Rob was involved in uh, that came out originally in 2006. And um, it was mainly written in C++. Rob says he's a bad R programmer. And maybe that's true, but he's a very good C++ programmer. So, uh, so Bayes Tree, <laughs> he's, he's shaking his head now. <laughs> so Bayes Tree was, uh, uh, was the first uh, package. And um, uh, currently it's still on CRAN, uh, but it's, it's, it's not, no longer developed. Uh, it doesn't have any multi-threading. Uh, and I should say, I'm, I'm limiting this slide to those packages that have a predict function. Uh, Rob just touched on that recently. Uh, so um, without a predict function, you're, you can't be taken seriously, frankly, uh, with a BART package. Uh, so there's a few others. Uh, um, BART machine that's written in Java. Um, that's really good if you're a Java programmer. Uh, uh, but for those of us who are not, I, I find it hard to use. Um, uh, uh, so uh, apologies to those people, but uh, um, if you like Java, that's the way to go. There's also dbarts, which is uh, probably the, the best package, uh, I, I think, outside of our packages. Uh, it does have a predict function, and it does, uh, does have multi-threading um, based on forking. Uh, I can exp uh, If you look through the slides, you'll see what forking means. Uh, um, if we have time, we can talk about it. Uh, but the big innovation, I think, came from uh, this package, uh, um, this uh, MPI BART source code, which came out in 2014, uh, which Rob and uh, some of his collaborators released. And based on that, 
uh, moving forward, uh, we started on we started work from that source code on the BART package uh, back in 2015, but it took us several years to 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 get it uh, to get it to the point where um, we we felt like it was uh, stable enough to release and had all of the nice features that we wanted. Uh, for multi-threading, it actually has uh, two types of multi-threading: open, open MP, and forking. So the um, the stable version is on CRAN is 2.94, and I have a development version called BART3 on on my GitHub site, and um, mm, that's where all of the nice new features are appearing. Uh, the the BART package is is frozen to be uh, concurrent with our, our our article in Journal Statistical Software that came out in 2021. Uh, there's a few other packages uh, I'll just touch on briefly. There's R BART, uh, which is uh, about heteroscedastic BART, and then Rob uh, uh, Rob will be talking about that tomorrow. I've also got uh, a variant uh, that I'm developing called H BART based on that. Um, and then there's there's two others, uh, NFT BART, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, again, there's a CRAN version, and then there's one just called NFT BART that's uh, on um, on uh, my GitHub site. Um, so all all of these uh, are descendants of the MPI BART tree uh, source code, um, and of course. Uh, um, we have to thank uh, a lot of other people uh, uh, we worked that we worked on um, uh, the source code. Uh, Hugh Chipman, Robert Gramercy, uh, of course the R core team, which we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have uh, been using R if R didn't exist. The RCPP core team, which is a package that we use a lot, and so many others in the free uh, open software community. So obviously, BART is a computational method. Well, guess what? Without good software, you're not going to be doing BART. Uh, and here is just a quick overview of the of the um, uh, features. Like I said, we're talking about stuff, uh, we're talking about packages that have a predict function. Uh, so all of these packages have their own predict function. And then there's a, a thing called monotonic BART that we're talking about tomorrow where uh, we can use the predict function from BART. And then there's a lot of other features here. Uh, um, I'll just leave um, this slide here. You guys can uh, look at it on your own. Um, but I have to ask, um, I have to ask, so how many people uh, installed the, the BART package or the BART3 package? Raise your hand. All right, so most people here, now I'm going to check online. Okay, so most people have. So uh, I can say that if you're running into any trouble, it's probably covered in these slides. If not, we we want to hear about it. So send me an email. Um, but most of, I've, I think most of the problems I was able to uh, address through these slides. So just a, a quick skeleton of the BART package. Uh, uh, in the root directory of the package, we have this configure uh, script that's used to detect OpenMP for Unix. And uh, keep in mind, R considers Linux and Mac OS as Unix and uh, anything else is, or well, the other choice uh, is Windows. Uh, and Windows does not use a configure script because of, um, I don't know. <laughs> It doesn't, it has nothing to do with us. It's just, it's just the way Windows works. Uh, so, so for example, here we have, uh, uh, there's a directory called R and there's, there's two functions like Rob just talked about the weighted BART function. And there's also one called GBART, the generalized BART function. And there's prediction. We have uh, predict functions here for, for the two types, the two main types, PBART for probit BART and WBART for continuous BART. Uh, there's a data directory, for example, uh, lung, advanced lung cancer data is something that uh, I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, there's some demos. There's the Boston housing demo, that, uh, which uh, Rob um, actually didn't talk about today, which I thought he might. Uh, and there's an advanced lung cancer demo, uh, help pages. Um, so uh, like I said, the, the, the real hard, heavy lifting uh, of, of uh, BART is written in C++. 
Um, uh, but but each um, each platform needs some specific settings to get the uh, multi-threading working, right? So make vars. This is I call this hardwired uh, because. Um, uh, the configure script usually generates these, but Windows has no such capability. So we've hardwired a version for Windows that should work for most people. Uh, I don't know. Um, we're doing our best. Neither Rob nor I are real strong Windows users, but um, but I've done a lot of testing on the platform, and I have a lot of students who 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 um, who've tried it on Windows. And then there's the configure way, which is the smart way to do it uh, instead of the dumb way. All right, so um, I'm going to stop there. Um, well, uh, I should say, any any questions about uh, the software packages? Uh, we're going to do a demo in a little bit, but any questions a bit about what I've said so far? Good. And no, none online? Okay. So now I'm going to go to my talk on uh, marginal effects. So uh, some of this work was funded uh, by Advancing Healthier Wisconsin Research and Education, uh, oh, um, and the Children's Wisconsin Foundation, et cetera. All right, so this was motivated by uh, growth charts. Uh, and if, if any of you have had children, you've seen these. Uh, so uh, here's an example of a growth chart for um, stature for age for girls two to 20 years old. And you can see that um, uh, through the center is the 50th percentile. And you can see, uh, uh, interestingly, that this is a very nonlinear pattern, right, uh, by age and years. And also, it appears to be rather heteroscedastic. Um, So uh, the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, as well as the World Health Organization, have developed growth charts for children. Uh, for example, height by age, but there's also weight by age, BMI by age, and weight by height. So here we're going to focus on height by age and months. For uh, children two to 17 years old, uh, the CDC uses the LMS method uh, with natural cubic splines. Uh, they have three parameters estimated by penalized uh, maximum likelihood with this box Cox power transformation. Uh, there's a, a mean, uh, um, there's like a, a mean trend. Uh, well, uh, there's a, <clears throat> sorry, there's a box Cox trend. LT, there's a mean trend MT, and there's a coefficient of vari variation ST. Uh, but but uh, when they fit these, they only use part of the data. For example, they just use the males or just the females. What if we wanted to use all the data? Or what if we wanted to fit, uh, you know, including more information like weight and or race and ethnicity? You know, theoretically, we could get better, uh, better control of our, uh, of our predictions, uh, lower error, et cetera but they don't do that. And maybe there's good reasons for that, but just this is just a nice motivating example. Uh, here, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna give my take on what is machine learning. I, I don't really differ with Rob, uh, uh, but um, I, I just felt that we needed one slide that comes out and gives um, common definitions. So AI is a computer's ability to perform tasks that normally require human intel intelligence, like driving a car. And machine learning or statistical learning is a field within AI to develop methods that learn predictions from training data without being explicit, explicitly programmed to do so. Uh, so this is a concept that's been around for a long time. Uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing Arthur Samuel, and that was written way back in 1959. So uh, machine learning is, is really nothing new. Uh, what is new is that we have methodology that that works much better now than than anything they've had before. Uh, for example, uh, a machine learning example is you could directly model childhood growth chart based on uh, principles of human oxology, or you could indirectly learn the growth curves from training data. 
Uh, and then, um, you know, the, the, the two best methods uh, uh, or the two best current methods are deep learning and ensemble learning. So uh, deep learning is the best currently known machine learning method of prediction where all of the covariates are the same type, i.e. they're all pixels or words or audio waves, et cetera. Ensemble learning is the best currently known method, machine learning method with respect to out of sample predictive performance for tabular data. That's where all covariates are of different types, age, sex, height, weight, et cetera. Uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> A collection of machines, in our case, trees are fit simultaneously that form the basis of an ensemble's aggregate prediction with superior form performance to any single machine's fit. Um, so uh, Romp sort of touched on this. Uh, there's a trade-off between the bias and the variance. Uh, mean squared error equals bias squared plus variance. So there's a spectrum of trade-offs. Linear regression is on the high bias, low variance end single tree regression on the low bias, high variance end, and ensembles are in the middle, medium bias, medium variance. And that gives you optimal performance as, as Rob showed on one of his slides. Okay, so what is machine learning regression? Well, uh, it's extensible let's consider the general regression case of a continuous outcome with normal errors like so, okay? Yi equals mu plus f of x plus epsilon. Same, same setup uh, uh, we've been talking about. So f is some unspecified function whose form is to be learned from the data. Uh, uh, and uh, um, there's a common MLR extension that we'll, uh, Rob will be discussing tomorrow, like so where uh, now you also, not only do you have a mean function, but you also have a variance function like so. And, um, and but how, how are we gonna learn these functions? Ideally in a non-parametric manner without resorting to precarious re restrictive assumptions. We don't wanna uh, assume linearity, nor do we wanna pre-specify the interactions. We wanna learn all that from the data. So I'm just gonna skip these slides. Uh, so um, there, we've had some questions about the notation we're using on the slides. Uh, generally, the notation has been taken from uh, uh, the papers that we've written on BART. Uh, 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 so, so, the, um, I, so on this slide, uh, all of these, uh, are, there's links in these URLs. So you can, you can get to all of these papers. Uh, so Rob's original paper, on BART. Uh, we've also got a paper in JSSS that talks about the BART package, et cetera. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but this, this slide will help you uh, find, locate the uh, most relevant articles, in my opinion, uh, on modern BART. So, uh, so this is just uh, an overview of the notation. Um, I don't think we need to get into this too deeply, uh, Rob's already covered most of this, but uh, uh, when, when uh, uh, in, in some of our later papers, we've written the BART this way. So BART is a, uh, the F is a prior and it has these uh, um, parameters and, and we've already discussed those. Uh, but here's an important aside, I think. Um, Sadly, uh, in MLR in general and BART, we're, we're a little careless uh, with notation. Uh, uh, so I can only blame myself, but uh, um, the notation is a, is a common pitfall. Uh, often if authors make the mistake of denoting f of x when they really mean mu plus f of x. Uh, Rob and I try to avoid this, but it is, it is such an easy mistake to make. <laughs> uh, I found myself making it often. Uh, similarly, virtual all, all of the software available returns mu plus f of x while not properly documented it. Uh, and we are certainly guilty of that uh, as well. Uh, this is really bad, yet even worse for marginal effects, which I'm gonna talk about next. So perhaps we should adopt a new notation like this, mu x equals mu plus f of x to make the proper distinction, uh, but that doesn't help with what all those articles that are already out there that you're gonna be reading. <laughs> 
So, uh, for, so for the most part, we, we're sticking to this notation and we're, we're gonna try our best to do it uh, correctly. Um, this is just a slide that, uh, that shows the uh, um, partitioning the space. I'm gonna skip that, Rob's already covered that. Oh, and here's a slide that... Uh, Okay, so let's uh, let's let's see this. So so here, uh, let's assume we just have two trees and and two x variables, right? So you can see this tree partitions the space like so. So in this uh, in this uh, half of the space, we get a one. In this quadrant, we get a three. In this quadrant, we get a two. Similarly, this tree partitions the space like so. And then uh, the ensemble, you just add the you just add the uh, um, partitions together. So like here you get one plus six is a seven. Uh, over here you get uh, three plus six is a nine, et cetera, right? Uh, Muse, oh, instead of the numbers. I think I have a slide. I have another slide like that too. But anyway, this is just this. This one was published, so I I, I put it in as it is. <laughs> but, but we've tinkered around with these uh, over the years. And then somebody was asking about uh, this earlier. How, how does it? How do you go left? Uh, so so if you're less than or equal to uh, this cut point, then you go left. If you're greater than, you go right. That's that's how the software works. And uh, you can see this is all documented in the uh, in our article on JSS. Uh, and um, mm, you can you can get the trees out. Uh, typically, you don't need to do that. <laughs> I mean, that's the good news, right? All of the, that fine level detail is not necessary, but it's there when you need it. All right. So the point of this talk is about marginal effects. So what do I mean by marginal effects? So suppose that we have a complex regression function like we have here, right? We've got uh, X sub S, that's a covariate, uh, uh, that's a subset of interest at some fixed settings and, and X C are the complement covariates that we are not interested at the, at the moment. So uh, the expectation of Y given X, X of S looks like this. So uh, we call this, uh, this new function, the marginal effect of X uh, of S. Well, oops, sorry. Well, okay, so, so what does this function look like? Look like, well, um, if we take the expectation of, uh, say, our BART function, given these settings, then over, over the, uh, the complement, then we get our function. Well, that's easier said than done. But uh, 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 Jerry Friedman uh, has a nice trick here. Uh, he calls it the partial dependence function. So he calculates it like so. And when we follow his work, uh, 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 I, think it's, I think this is a brilliant way to do it. So effectively, you're setting, uh, you're fixing these and you're, you're, you're averaging over the others, okay? Where these come from the training, right? Well, you can do that uh, uh, at each uh, of the M draws from the posterior, and uh, you can summarize all of those like so, right? So, so, uh, uh, so at each draw, we're averaging over all N, where N is the training values, right, to get this function, and then we can summarize that over the posterior like so. Well, this works very well uh, um, if, if these, uh, uh, these X of S's are relatively independent of the, of the complement, but what if they're not? Well, then you run into trouble. So uh, uh, for example, consider our growth chart, by, uh, growth chart for height example. Age and weight obviously co-vary. Uh, um, so then, so there you go, right? So you have um, you have something in the S's and something in the C's that are highly correlated. So uh, let's just have some notation here. So let's say T is for age, U is for sex, V is for race and ethnicity, and W is for weight. Well, if we assume independence, we get something that looks like this, right? So this uh, this could be estimated by the partial dependence function. 
Well, um, I can tell you right now that's not going to work. So as we'll see in a moment, but how do we do this the right way? Well, let's consider the strong relationship between age, sex, and weight. It would look like something like this. So expectation of weight given uh, age and sex is some function or some, this could be a grid of values or it could be a function. So I'm calling it a function uh, because we can summarize this relationship with BART by, by fitting uh, the weights that we have for these children by their age uh, and their gender, right? So we just do it with the part, BART prior. And now we can calculate a, a more appropriate marginal effect for dependent variables like so. Uh, we have this expectation over race and ethnicity because uh, I want to wash that out, uh, but everything else is going to come into play. So we have age, gender, but now notice the Ws are at these settings, right? So, so these settings here, uh, because, because we're taking advantage of the dependence of, of age and weight. So what is, uh, let me see if you're done. All right, so, so let's return to the real data example so we can see this in action. So the CDC's data uh, is uh, something called NHANES waves one through three. Uh, so these uh, waves were uh, the 70s through the 90s. They have about 12, uh, almost 13,000 patients, uh, children. For simplicity, I just used uh, NHANES annual continuous, uh, a little bit more recent data. And I just used one, I just, um, it was just easier to grab that way than, than putting together their big data set. So this data set is in the BART 3 package, it's called BMX. And there's a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of demos, growth one, growth two, growth three, et cetera. So um, I'm looking at the ages two to 17 years. Each child is only measured once. Height is in centimeters, weights in kilograms. Um, so this is something uh, Rob was talking about earlier. Uh, so you can check convergence uh, just by looking at the sigma plot, or uh, there's a, um, a Vitari and Gelman have come up with something they call max r hat. Um, but but um, there's a peculiarity with max r hat in that it's really for parametric models. Uh, so the parametric models, they say if max r hat is less than 1.01, then you get convergence. Well, um, for non-parametric models, it's 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 very hard to get to that uh, that bar, and I, and I don't, actually I don't think that bar is fair. I think a, a better cutoff for max R hat is about one point one, which uh, which was the old cutoff before they dropped it to one point oh one. Anyways, that's a uh, that's a uh, that's a long conversation all by itself. But I mean, I'm just uh, giving you some advice there on how to do convergence. If you if you like max R hat, which I do. Uh, that's the way you would use it here with BART. So um, in, in our data set, we have, we have 3,400 patients, like so, about half males and females. Uh, the, the more recent NHANES uh, were, were very diverse because actually you'll notice that there's actually more Hispanics uh, than there, there are whites or blacks. So here's what, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, here's uh, uh, one of Rob's uh, convergence plots. So if you, if you look at the sigma, so I have each one of the chains. So I have eight, uh, eight chains here and each one of the chains is in a different color. And you can see Sigma's dropping. It's still dropping, still dropping. And then it, it, it levels off at about a thousand of burn-in. Oh, and I've also thinned these 10, okay? So uh, after that, you can see that Sigma's fairly stable. And if you do max R hat, you see you get about a 1.08, which which is pretty good. But notice it's less than 1.1, but it's not as small as 1.01. Like, I don't think you're ever going to see that in, in these type of non-parametric models. You just, it just, it's just very hard to get that small. And, and I don't think uh, it's a realistic uh, um, cutoff. Uh, so you can also look at autocorrelation for what that's worth. You can see that uh, the drops down pretty fast. All right, so let's look at the uh, uh, predicted heights versus the observed heights. Um, uh, the, the, the reds are, are, are females and the uh, blues are males. 
And you can see it's, it's pretty high, 96.7% R squared. Um, you know, these are strong relationships. Uh, I don't, you're not gonna get an R squared that high in most, in most data sets. Uh, but in this data set, you, you get a you get a nice uh, you get ex extremely high R squared. Okay, but what if we look at the marginal effect and we assume that weight is independent? Well, uh, uh, the dots are the truth, and this black line is uh, this is overall. I didn't do males and females, but it, it wouldn't matter. You can see that this line is nowhere going to match the data. Feel me? <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, I, I was working on this this study with growth chart data, and I got to this plot because we were, we wrote it, this article, and when I got to this plot, and I'm like, I'm like, I thought the BART package was wrong. So I broke this down with every other BART package within reason, and they all got exactly the same thing. And I said, aha, it's not the code. <laughs> it's something fundamentally wrong, and then it, and it hit me. So this is what you get if you do it the right way. So um, I, I don't know how well these are projecting. Can you guys see the line here? So, so let's look over here. So these, uh, uh, so these, the males and females separate over here. So you can see, this is the blue line going right through the center of the data. And there's also a 95% credible enroll. And same thing for females, it's going right through the center. It's also pretty much going right through the center all the way. Because uh, uh, males and females are, are pretty much on the same glide path with you know, a few, few exceptions here and there. But I mean, generally uh, the same up from, from two till about, I don't know, 13. Yeah, yeah, and and I I always I always heard that the that the the girls were ahead, but you you can't really see it here. They're pretty much on the same. Uh, maybe there's a little spurt here that where they're ahead, but it's generally about the same. Um. All right, so this is something Rob's going to talk about tomorrow. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. All I'm going to say here is that uh, I'm trying to. I'm just going to use the same notation except for I'm gonna call it the H bar prior and I'm gonna, you know, uh, we're gonna put a tilde on these parameters. Uh, 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 generally these alpha, alpha and beta are the same, but uh, one thing to note about, well, Rob will probably talk about this tomorrow, but one thing to note is that um, the number of trees is generally far less for the variance because there's just not as much information. Uh, there's not as much, how do I say this? The covariates don't explain as much as the variance uh, 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 as they do the mean. So I also uh, refit these with uh, H uh, with uh, HBART model, and why did I do that? Like I said before, notice what 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 can you notice here? Uh, not only is it nonlinear, but it's it's heteroscedastic, right? There's more variance up here than there is down here. So here I've got uh, I've, I've got um, the fifty percent uh, is the median, and then I've got the uh, 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 the growth chart bars. It is, you can't really see it too well on, on this slide, but when you download them, it, I think it'll look a little bit nicer. Is that projecting? I can't tell. Same thing here. I have it for females. And, and uh, oh, uh, this, I should say, this is uh, in the H bar package, this is the demo height. And then if you compare uh, um, these lines with the CDC, you can see that. Um, our, uh, our, oops, sorry. Our males are growing faster than, than the CDC. Oops. And so are the females. So I don't know what to make of that. Uh, um, we're, I'm not using exactly the same data. Like I said, they're using waves one through three and I'm using the more modern continuous wave, but I don't know if that makes any difference, but, um, but it's, it's just, a, I think it's just a nice example. It shows off Bart's capabilities. Um, Okay, so uh, so now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about marginal effects. Well, I guess I should stop now. Any any questions about this uh, growth chart? Use the use the microphone. 
Sorry. Can we get back to the male and females plot, which is not a, looks good. It doesn't look good. What? Uh, yes, this one. Uh, so it looks based on uh, this plot. I suppose there should exist uh, exist interaction between the gender and right and the age. Yeah, I think, you know, I think one way I would say it is this, there's a strong relationship between weight and age, which, which this calculation is ignoring, right? So it's allowing, it's allowing the weights to vary over the training set, but at a certain, for example, here, I got to give you an example. Here we go. So at age five, right? There's not going to be anybody uh, with a weight corresponding. So, so, so these these tall taller boys, right? Uh, One seventy, right? I don't know what their weights are, but they're going to be much higher than this. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And if you if you ignore that, this is what you get. You'll get a a, a fit that's way higher than any single value, right? The fit at five is higher than any value except for one, <laughs> right? And that's supposed to be the average. And, and, and conversely, over here at 15, it's the same thing. You'll get a fit lower than any value except for one girl. And that's supposed to be the average fit, but it's not, right? Well, I think I still have the previous question. I think in previous slides, Rob mentioned the um, part based on the dream, right? It could capture the additive and the interaction effects. However, here, for instance, if we observed interaction like age and gender, but the actual fitting curve based on bar looks, uh, have difficulty to capture the interaction. If no, I, so. doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> it gets it, right? Right there, see right here. Like I said, for most of the most of the way, they're pretty much right on top of each other. It's it's right here at like thirteen where they separate. It, it picks it up, picks it up, no problem. So my assumption is that if the bar or the tree uh, can really really capture the additive and interaction, I will expect the previous modeling curve should perform better than this. Uh, I don't know. It's 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 it, 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 that's what I'm saying. It's it's not the fit. <laughs> I, I I fit this with every single Bard package in existence. It's it's the uh, uh, um, it's the mistaken assumption that you can do this, <laughs> right? It you, you can often do this, right? We do this all the time, but you have to be very careful when you do this to make sure that uh, what you're what you've got on this side has all of the thing. Uh, how do I say this? <laughs> you got to be very careful what's on this side is really independent from what's on that side. So it depends on how you construct your model. It's not about whether the train can actually uh, capture. It's, it's how you construct, it's how you construct the marginal effect. Okay. You have to, you have to, you have to do it this way, <laughs> but, but, but this, this way is like a heuristic, right? It, it's showing you how to do it, but like, you have to adapt it to your case, like, you know, whatever your case is, right? This could be age and uh, BMI or something. I don't know, but but it's 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 trivial once you once you know the trick, right? Right. This is this is one of those things. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Uh, um, okay. So um, so one thing I didn't tell you uh, is the marginal effects uh, can be rather intensive. Uh, but um, uh, Rob mentioned Shapley values uh, uh, earlier, right? So uh, maybe, maybe it was yesterday. I can't remember now. But anyways, uh, machine learning Shapley values are another choice for marginal effects uh, as opposed to uh, Friedman's function. However, Shapley values are far more computationally intensive uh, than FPD. Uh, frankly, they're, they're, if you have more than like 10 variables, they're useless. Uh, so I, I, I do not consider SHAP uh, as a reasonable alternative. Uh, what we really want 
is not something else but besides FPD. We want something faster than FDD because uh, just, uh, just that summary of the training set can be tedious. But in fact, we can speed up FPD. There's something called kernel sampling and uh, we didn't even discover this. It turns out other people had talked about this uh, uh, earlier uh, before, uh, well, around the same time frame we were thinking about it, but they were ahead of us because they got it out. Uh, so like a lot of this stuff I, I, I did years ago, but it uh, never, um, never came out till today, I guess. Uh, anyways, uh, well, we can speed up kernel sampling and also uh, we can speed up SHAP or sorry, uh, Kernel sampling can also speed up SHAP. It can, it can speed up FPD and it can also speed up SHAP making it relevant. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that anymore today and I'm still working on the software. It seems to be working for, for SHAP, but what I am gonna talk about is we have reliable S3 methods for FPD and FPDK, which is what I call uh, FPD with kernel sampling. Uh, however, the documentation is pretty pathetic at the moment. Uh, like I said, we do have preliminary support for SHAP and SHAPK. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. So what does FPD with kernel sampling look like? Well, it looks like this. So um, uh, it, it, th this is what FPD looks like right now with no changes, right? Just, just what I had on the earlier slide. But now with kernel sampling, what are we doing? Well, notice that here now I'm summing over K and, and Instead of the whole training set, I'm summing over K where these, these are just random draws of the training. You guys get that? Okay, so uh, if you do that, it's pretty clear that uh, the expectation, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay, so this notation, I'm adding an F for, for FPD and a K for, S, for uh, uh, kernel sampling, right? Uh, FPD with kernel sampling. Well, clearly these two are the same, right? However, it's also clear that the variances are not the same, uh, but you can look at the law of total variance and you can figure this out. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't wanna go through this whole slide, but uh, it turns out that uh, the variance due to kernel sampling is the variance that we're interested in plus this term where this term we can estimate from the posterior. Well, uh, uh, so, um, so we can, uh, uh, so we have, th this is just the, the same formula I had at the bottom of the last slide. And the first term here is the target variance of the calculation we want to avoid. And the second term, well, this, I already said this. Anyways, uh, so, so this is what, this is how we can estimate the variance we want. We just take this and we subtract off that. And also uh, you can generate uh, um, the whole posterior like so. And uh, I don't know, I have time to explain all this, but, uh, but the point is, this is gonna speed it up dramatically. So now uh, we're gonna do this hands-on. All right, you guys ready for this? Let's see. Oops. If I could, if I could type here. So there should be, an, yep, there's an example, fpd, fpd.r. Now, how do you find this? Well, uh, I can show you. So, so it's, it's either in the directory that you, 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 you downloaded BART3, or you can find this file like so. So you use system file. And then it says, what are you looking for? So we're gonna look for the demo directory, or we can, now that we know the, the file name, we can look for that file. And then you say package, part three. 
and this should tell us on your on your computer where you where you installed it. Right, so it's telling me that that on my computer it's installed here. Okay, but you know on your computer it might be somewhere else, but wherever it is, this function will tell you where it is. And uh, I'm just going to start it because I'm not sure exactly how long this will take, and then uh, I'll, I'll take questions while it's running. Or I'll, I'll explain what's in the code while it's running. And we've got an error. <laughs> so that's fun. Oh, so P is for, oh, it looks like it's done already. How could that be? Uh, is that possible? Hmm. Let's see, where's, where's the error here? Well, let's step to the code here. So first of all, so this is a Friedman function like uh, Rob was talking about. Uh, it's, it's simplified though. Here I've only got three X's, right? Out of four. So there's one dummy uh, X that doesn't do anything. Uh, and it's correlated with uh, 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 X4 is correlated with X3, which does uh, is a signal variable. So what happened here? So, so let's see. Oh, so uh, I, I should explain the code a little bit. So notice, uh, uh, notice I'm using I'm using mc.gbart. So this is using multi-threading. That's one reason why it, it ran so fast. And uh, so this is what the output looks like from, from BART. So see BART in return this object here, I called it post. So it's the posterior fit. And uh, this is the type of output you get from BART. There's a, a header about the data. So there's a, a thousand uh, uh, samples or uh, covariates, et cetera. So there's a bunch of, uh, uh, bunch of um, diagnostic output here. And then here's the run. It ran in one second. That's super fast. So let's, let's make sure that the posterior came through. And it did. So you can see uh, um, Y hat train looks like that. Et cetera, sigma, et cetera, right? So, right, so what's the error here? Let me see. Y hat test. Oh, so here the error is generated. Where is it? Yeah, so right here, right from the function that I wanted to show you. <laughs> right. Uh, Anybody else get an error there? Oh, it looks like uh, uh, um, I called the function wrong. So let's see. So the first argument is the is the object. The second argument should be. Oh, okay. So so let's do this. Oops. Yeah. So uh, the arguments go like this, right? So, so um, this is a predict function using FPD. So the first argument is the object. So that's post X train is the, uh, actually the fourth argument. For some reason I had it second. So anyways, so it's there. X test is like that. X test we just created, right? So we, we created a grid sort of like Rob did and we're gonna estimate on that grid. 
and then S3, S3 is the variable we're, we're, uh, we're interested in here. That's the variable that we want to uh, create um, the, the marginal effect for. And notice S3 is just a linear term, right? So that's what we want to do. So let's try this again. There it is, it's going. So that was the that was the problem. This line here, I don't know, was wrong in the demo, but now you can fix it, right? All you have to do is uh, use the names, use named arguments because they're not in the right order, or you can put them in the right order. All right, here, now you can see that it's done. Now you can see that took a while, but it didn't really take that long. But remember, we only have a thousand, uh, data points here. So if this was a much bigger data set, that could have taken a long time. We have data sets where we're running, you know, tens of thousands of, uh, 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 or, or 10,000 observations that can take considerably long. All right, so run that, run this. All right, so let's look at the marginal effect that we just created. Uh, so I'm gonna say uh, open, FPD All right, so that's what it looks like. So you can see the true effect is blue. The FPD is in red, dashed red, and the the, crit the credible interval is in dotted red. How many people? How many people got that graph? What are you guys waiting for? <laughs> it's not what? It's not with Bart. It's with the Bart three package. Oh, so let's let's install the Bart three package. That's a good that's a good tip. All right. It doesn't. It, it does. It does for me. Uh, well, let's let's find out. Let's install it. So, uh, so, so th th this is in, uh, covered in the install. But I mean, think I think this is important that we should cover this. So let's see. So, how do you install Bart? Bart three. Sorry. Well, this is how I do it. First of all, I install the remotes package. This is a cool package. Oh, and you have to say dependencies equals true. Uh, before I do that, I should say uh, uh, here. I run with an R profile like so. So in my R profile, I have, um, I have my favorite CRAN mirror. Uh, this is StatLib from Carnegie Mellon, and I found this is the best mirror uh, uh, in my experience. I don't know if Rob wants to comment. This one is uh, virtually al always available, uh, whereas some of the others, uh, it you know, the, and they're, and it's all it's always complete. Some of the mirrors don't have all of the packages, which which always blows my mind. So before before you run install. You can either have something like this in your R profile or you can just tack it on. Okay, so first I'm, I'm, telling, I'm telling R where CRAN is, which CRAN mirror I want, and then I'm saying install the remotes package with all the dependencies. All right, oh, that went fast, so that's done. Now to install BART3, it goes like this. Oh, first of all, you got to load, now you have to load the remotes package. Okay, so now it's gonna ask for the repo, right? So the repo is um, my, my GitHub account, so it's R, this is my, my username on GitHub. And then you, you give it the repo. So I have several repos. 
And then you can also give it a subrepo. So in this case, the subrepo is BART3. And I think that's all you need. Let's give that a shot. Now, I should say, uh, this is like not the fastest way to install it, but it is pretty convenient. It's just two lines, so, uh, so occasionally I'll use this. All right, let's see how it goes. Oh, sorry, uh, it's, it's moving. It did that, I didn't do it. Where, where was it? Yeah, right here. So, so load, first load the, li the remotes library uh, uh, package and then use the uh, remotes function this. And it will install it from from GitHub. Oh, uh, you want to you want to see what it looks like on GitHub? Um, let me see if I can do that right now. I don't have my my phone with me, so let's see if let's see if GitHub will let me in. Repository. Users. <laughs> um, I wonder why. So GitHub uh, has some weird, some weird new security policy. But I wonder if I'm running into that, or if I'm just not doing this right. All right, let's try this one more time. Users. Okay, so that. Oh, maybe if I, ah, sorry, I know. Yeah, so I think we should have put the repo. So if we say, oh, this is the repo name, I think. There it is. And now, uh, so this is the repo name, but I have a sub repo BART3. And, and you can see, uh, I don't know if that's what you were expecting to see. So you could see the R directory data demo, just like the skeleton that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, it's a, mm -hmm. Yeah, and like we could see the demos. There's the one we we're looking at to fpd.r. All right, so let's see if it's done downloading, uh, done installing. Yes, it did. Uh, and notice, uh, I just want to highlight this line. So there's going to be a line that's going to say something like, what is the option to support OpenMP? This is super important. The predict function uses OpenMP, uh, and uh, obviously that's needed. Uh, our part is the predict function is very computational. Uh, um, and um, so it should be smart enough the way we've set it up, it should be smart enough to find that on your computer if you've got the right tools installed, right? If your tools are messed up, okay, then you're on your own. That's right. For Mac, you install Xcode standard from the, uh, from the app store. Uh, um, now that's, that's at Mac. For Windows, and a lot of this is covered in that install.pdf. For Windows, um, they don't have a standard compiler, or at least one that R recognizes. So they they created their own. They call it R Tools 43, and that you can find on CRAN. I can show you that right now. Just a second. Okay, so so this directory here. Um, sorry, it's not showing me the name of the directory, but I clicked on download R for Windows and CRAN, and it takes me to this page, and you can see right here there's R tools, and that's where Windows keeps their tools. Anyways, all of that's covered in the install.pdf um, installation. But anyways... Um, well, we can click on it. it. Yeah, something like that. I, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, oh, it's, um, 
Yeah. MSYS2, which depends on Ming, whatever the hell that is. Whatever that is. Anyway, so now let's go back down here. So we can go back to our, our original question, right? Where is this demo that we want? Ha. Oh, uh, you have to load the library, I think. But I thought we had it loaded. Let's see. Let's see. Part three. It's loaded. Hmm. That's interesting. What if we just say demo here? Well, wow, look at that. I wonder if that's because we just installed it. Uh, well, it worked, it worked before. <laughs> I can show you up above, right? Because that was the first thing we did, right? Where do we do that? Right here, right? So that worked there. Oh, I don't know. Am I typing something wrong? Wait. Let me see. Demo. What am I doing wrong here? Oh, I think you have to say, do you have to say package? Yes. See, um, see how much fun it is to install stuff? <laughs> All right, so that's that. Okay, so now, now, uh, well, okay. So how, how many people have run this example, fpd.r? Raise your hand. How, how many people have run the demo, fpd.r? Uh, I just found it. All right. I'll give you another couple minutes. And um, anybody online have a question? I can, I can, uh, I'm looking at the chat here. Oh, Tao, you have your you have the microphone on. So hit the button. I don't, I can't clear it from up here. Can I? Oh, I can. Ha. Yep. Um, you can do it either way. I, I uh, uh, so example for the one. Yeah, for the remotes package notice, uh, it didn't compile anything, so that it down see it says it downloaded binary packages. So if the binary package exists. Uh, from CRAN, it will install it. If it doesn't exist, it will compile it. No, I don't, I don't have a binary on GitHub because um, I don't know how to create that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Plus, uh, these change pretty rapidly. Like I'm, I'm fixing stuff like, I don't want to say on a daily basis, but like once a week. So it changes pretty often. Yeah, right. Yeah, yep, you do, and but yeah, but you have to do that. I can tell you why. So let's say you install uh, the Bart binary. Is that smart enough to work with an OpenMP? I don't think it is. <laughs> I think you need to compile it locally on your computer. Uh, otherwise, it won't. And then I'm not, this is not just a Mac thing. I think the same is true for Windows. Uh, the Linux might be an exception, but I, yeah, so, so there you go. So, so, so that's a key step. If you don't do that step, you're not going to get OpenMP. Just, you're not going to do it. It, it. Okay. 
Okay, so so as somebody asked a question, does it require a specific R version? And uh, yes and no. Um, so we can see that on GitHub. So let's go back to GitHub. So in the description file, you get to you get to say what version of R is required. But I don't think we have very restrictive. Um, yeah, we're just saying it, all it depends on is R greater than three point six. So. It should run on fairly old R. Uh, hello, Ronnie. Uh, I, I can find the fpd.r document now. Uh, I have an error here. Uh, do I need to install the MC parallel, uh, parallel, MC parallel first. Are you on Windows? Yes. No, because it uh, doesn't exist on Windows. <laughs> so this is one of the issues that I said. R tries to paper over the differences, but some of the differences are so vast, they cannot be papered over. MC parallel does not exist on Windows because forking does not exist on Windows. There is no such thing. So, uh, uh, but getting back to your question, so how do you run this on Windows? Well, okay, let's take a peek. The predict function, but this is not the MC parallel is coming from, uh, hold on, right here. So see this line? So if you're on Windows, you have to comment out this line and uncomment these two. Oh, sorry, uh, this should be, there, that's what it should look like on Windows. Because why? Because forking does not exist on Windows. We can't take advantage of that type of multi-threading. It does not exist on Windows. Bill Gates, if you're listening, please fix that feature. I don't think it's impossible. I think it's totally possible uh, from, for a multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar company to do. Uh, and I'm very disappointed, frankly. Well, I, I just, I use it enough to support my students and I've done a lot of testing and it, it does work on Windows, but then you have to deal with Windows issues. All right, so uh, uh, any other questions I can help you with? Um, I think at this point, you should be able to run these. Uh, it's working now, thank you. Oh, great. All right, so now I'm gonna open the other demo. Are you guys finding this helpful though? I have to ask, this hands-on? I, I, I had one question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Wait, first first answer my question. <laughs> what was the question? Is uh, uh, Do you guys find this hands-on helpful? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, uh, question is, actually, um, I fixed that one that you showed, and it's it was started running, but it stopped again in the y hat dot test on that side. The FPD y hat dot test is the... Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, did you fix this line? Yeah. yeah. So this line was wrong. Remember, uh, this line. You need to. Yeah, make make sure you edit this line like I've got it here. The line in the original demo was wrong. I'll, I'll fix that. This is what I'm saying. I, I fix a lot of bugs. <laughs> oh, okay, I didn't. I didn't do that. I will fix that and put it online. But for now, you have to do it by hand. What do you think, Rob? Is this helpful, the hands-on? 
Okay, uh, you have to clear. Oh. Use the microphone. What, what did you say? How to fix the Windows arrow message? Like Wait, window, okay, so so see, see, see this line here? Can you, can you see this line here? That's the line if you're on Mac OS or Linux. If you're on Windows, then you uncomment this line. And this one, this one looked like this, right? That was wrong. That was, so this is what it, here, I'll, I'll say, uh, uh, um, let, me, let me add something, let me add, with, with forking, without forking. Okay. So if you have if you have forking on these platforms, you do that. If you have, if you don't, then you 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 have these two lines and it will take longer. <laughs> You're not using multi-threading, so it will take uh, longer. But but don't blame us, blame Bill Gates. All right, some, somebody wants to see the uh, BART install again, so I'm gonna install BART3 again, okay? One more time. All right, so this is the way I do it. Uh, All right, so first I do is I pick I pick my favorite mirror. In this case, it's Statlib at Carnegie Mellon. Then I install uh, the RCPP package, which is the only dependency for BART or BART3. And uh, I say dependencies is true. I don't think RCPP has any dependencies, but just to be safe, it, th this line will install RCPP and anything that RCPP needs. Okay. And then I install the robots pack. This does have uh, several dependencies. Okay, um, now it's going a little bit faster for me because I have the dependencies already installed uh, for remotes, but, but you get the idea, right? That's the command line you'll need. Now I'm gonna install BART3 from GitHub. Why am I installing it from GitHub? Because it's the latest and greatest version I've been fixing bugs all month preparing for today, and that's the version you should use. Okay, the way this command works is you give it a repo. And the, the first, the way you define a repo is username slash repo name. Ah. So that's, uh, that's my username slash repo name. And then you can do a sub repo. In this case, I have a sub repo part three. And that's it. You press, you press enter, it should work. Oh, in this case, I've, I've already installed it. So I'd have to say force equals true. What the heck, let's do that. Uh, and this, this is not fast. This will take, I don't know, a couple of minutes, but you know, it's a good time to use the restroom. All right, somebody's asking me what S3 is. So the way the FPD function works is you get to tell it which of the columns are you, um, which of the columns are the settings, right? 
which of the columns are uh, the, the X sub S. And it could be more than one, right? Uh, in this case, we just say uh, three for the third column, but it could be three and four. It could be one and two. So uh, S, S can be either a single, it can be a scalar or S can be a vector. And, and like I said, I'm working on the documentation. That's why you, you don't know what S is, uh, but, um, um, but one of these days in the near future, you will have documentation. Yes, it is. So, 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 so what Rob is asking about is there's this concept of C, in C++, there's this concept of header only uh, uh, libraries. In a header only library, there's no binaries. All you need is the headers and uh, that's it. Now, for example, RCPP is a header only package, uh, R package, but, 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 but the meaning is uh, of the C++ sense. It's the C++ headers that matter. Now, technically BART3 is a, a header only, However, there are no other packages that use that uh, uh, currently that I'm aware of, uh, but, um, but it, it's, it's an, it, in theory, we're gonna take advantage of that in the future. All right, I'm gonna do the FPDKR. I'm gonna start this. And uh, well, first I'm gonna look for that error. Let's see, where is it? Uh, let's see, right here. Uh, oh, that's that's no kernel sample. Actually, uh, well, yeah, let's fix that. But I don't think we have to run this whole thing. What we do have to run hmm. I'm not sure if this is the right demo. Let me see. Uh, this one does Shapley values, so I don't know if that's the one I really want here. Well, um, let's do this. Let's do the FBDK right now. So I'm just going to copy that block. I'm just going to add a K here. And I'm gonna add a K there. Wait a minute, that's not right. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, 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 sorry. Here, I'm gonna add a K there. Yeah, K there, K there, yeah, there we go. So let's try this out. Uh-oh, what happened here? Uh, didn't like, what didn't it like? Let's see what we got back. Okay, so we got this back. Oh, I see, sorry. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Right, so here's what we should have done. Let's see, let's do this.
There we go. And now I'm going to plot those in a new in a new plot. So I'm just going to copy this one. All right. All right. So right now I've got uh, FPD on these three, right? So I'm going to add. FPDK, which is going to be our estimate of those. In fact, I'm going to turn off uh, the truth so we can see better, maybe. All right, let's see what happens. Okay, so uh, I actually should change these colors. So let's All right, there you go. So now you can see that um, the estimate of FPD and FPDK are right on top of each other, but notice that the, um, uh, the credible intervals are not the same, right? Um, I think that's because um, the default uh, only does four kernel samples, but if I, I can change that, let's do 20. All right, it's running. And you could see that was way faster than FPD, right? And there you go, they're almost identical. Do you agree? So instead of running uh, over all over a whole a thousand samples, I only ran, ran over a, a random 20 and I get virtually identical results. So huge computational savings. Um, and um, I think we'll stop there. Uh, and uh, let me check the outline and see where we're, what, what time, what we're supposed to be doing at this time. We have an hour to go. Maybe we should be taking a break. Just a second. Why don't we take um, a 15 minute break here? We haven't had a break this afternoon, right? So let's take a 15 minute break. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna answer some questions that I see in the chat. All right, so the question in the chat, chat is, how do I find the demo again? So this, is, this comes from the system file command. Ah, sorry. And that will tell you where uh, where SAS or sorry or SAS, where R installed the demo on your system.
All right, so um, now we're gonna take a 15 minute break. So we will be back at 3.45 Central Daylight Time. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna move on to the next uh, talk. Um, this also uh, was uh, funded in part by the Advancing Health Air Wisconsin Research and Education Program. Um, I'm gonna talk about binary and categorical outcomes with BART. <laughs> um, uh, m most of this work is also in our JSS article. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, well, let's just keep, let's just get into it. All right, so um, in the article, you'll see there's a, a example, chronic spine pain and obesity. However, I'm gonna do it a little bit differently here today. So uh, one of the researchers was saying to me that uh, obesity is a risk factor for chronic uh, lower back pain uh, uh, or buttock pain. Because uh, uh, when uh, uh, <clears throat> some, somehow when uh, you have lower back pain, it can radiate down your buttocks. Anyways, uh, uh, the same researcher also said, well, this is not a risk factor for chronic neck pain. So, uh, so we looked at Haynes, uh, uh 2009 to 2010. There's an arthritis questionnaire. Uh, there's about 5,000 subjects. We've got age and gender, and we've got some anthropology Pometric variables. Um, I think, uh, in, in, as I recall, in the JSS article, we focus on body mass index. However, today I think I'm going to uh, talk about waist circumference. Um, let's see what happens. But um, so, uh, so in that case, the binary outcome is whether or not you have pain. Uh, so, uh, so how do we analyze uh, binary outcomes with BART? Well, uh, this is a, a, a probit regression with latent variables, and there's a, a fairly standard trick uh, due to Albert and Chib uh, in the JASA paper from 1993, and it goes like this. So uh, um, you have a, a dichotomous outcome Y given some probability P sub I, uh, uh, that's Bernoulli. And then um, this PI depends on F, where F has the BART prior. And this, uh, this probability looks like so. It's the phi function where uh, phi is the CDF of a standard normal. Uh, and it's some uh, constant mu plus F of X. And this mu is um, the inverse CDF of Y bar. Uh, and then we have this latent variable uh, Z and its distribution is like so. It's normal mu plus F of X with uh, variance one. And if YI is zero, uh, it's truncated uh, to be negative. And if yi is one, is truncated to be positive. And um, uh, as you can see, once you know z, whether or not you know y is is irrelevant, right? You you uh, once you know the distribution of f given f, f given z and y, just f given z is all you need to know. Um, uh, the likelihood looks like so. And so this is a, a you just run this as a continuous part with the unit variance, unit variance sigma equal, sigma squared equals one and zi are the data. Okay, so, um, so as we saw, Friedman's partial dependence function is uh, useful for marginal effects. But in this case, we're not really interested in the marginal function, uh, marginal effect of f, we're interested in the marginal function of this function p of x. So, uh, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's basically the same calculation, but it's on a different function. It's not on the, the f function, uh, uh, f of x, it's on p of x. So you get a, uh, so you just do the same trick, right? 
So P of X of S, where X of S is the subset of interest, looks like so. We are averaging over the complement, and this uh, looks like looks like that. And, and here, here I'm assuming that these are independent, right? So we could also do the same, uh, the same thing. If, if X and S have some dependence, then we could address that. All right, so, um, so typically this is handled with the GBART function. Uh, so GBART is the generalized BART, uh, generalized in the sense that Y train can be either uh, continuous or dichotomous. If it's dichotomous, you have to say type equals P BART, uh, and it works like so. Uh, uh, GBART is uh, without forking, and MC.GBART is with forking. So that's multi threaded, and you can tell it the number of cores you want to use, et cetera. So the inputs are X train, which is a matrix, and optionally X test, which is also a matrix. And then what do you get in return? Well, uh, you get all of the same things we had before, but now there's something new. In the posterior, you get uh, uh, prob dot train, right? And if you uh, have X test, you get prob dot test, right? In this case, uh, they're they're calculated like so, right? Because these are the these are of interest, whereas the direct values of f of f aren't uh, the, the direct uh, f of x values are not necessarily of interest. And there's also a predict function. Um, just like before, uh, and now, again, uh, the predict function is also returning uh, not just y hat dot test; it's also returning prob dot test. All right, so let's getting let's getting back to our our uh, uh, example. Uh, so there's uh, uh, in the Bart package there are. Um, uh, Two, uh, two part, two uh, demos. So let's see, this looks like, uh, yeah. So this is from the BART package. All right, so these are Friedman functions. Uh, so let's, let's, let's see what's happening. So on the left side, we have low back pain and on the right side, we have neck pain and you can, uh, and the uh, men are in blue and women are in red. So here you can see that um, uh, it seems like uh, uh, low back pain is actually getting, is actually dropping with respect to BMI instead of increasing like, uh, like the researcher thought. Similarly uh, with neck pain or not similarly, but uh, neck pain, uh, they're, they're both pretty flat, right? So it doesn't seem to be affected by BMI, which uh, the researcher also, uh, which the researchers that was high, their second hypothesis. So, so, uh, um, so, th uh, but this seems, well, I mean, I guess this is good news if you're, uh, if you have a high BMI that, you know, there's, there's no relationship or, or if anything, you're, you have a lesser chance uh, of low back pain. Uh, and then there's just, a, there's another, uh, uh, display of the probabilities, but, um, I'm not going to go into that anymore. So next up, so that's probit BART. Um, but maybe I should ask any questions before I go to logistic BART. Any questions about probit BART? I have one question. Uh, can you go to the like the? Uh, I think two slides before. Uh, no, again. Uh, uh, yes, there's one. Did one. Sorry. Uh, so this P bird and the type is uh, mentioning that it is a binary outcome. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, so the default is type W Bart, which means it's continuous. So so the idea is you have one function that that can do that's ambidextrous, right? Um, why is that? Well, because um, you know programming just one of these is a lot of work, right? So there's a lot of features like Dart and all, all kinds of other things that we're going to talk about tomorrow. So, uh, so it, it was just handy to have one function that does both. And it's, and it's not that difficult to, uh, to do the Albert and Chib um, 
to, to make that, to make a function that's ambidextrous. It's, it's actually easier in the long run to make one function that's ambidextrous than instead to have two functions you have to support forever. Okay, so that's probit BART. What about logistic BART? And actually this is where the story uh, more or less started. So Rob was working with uh, Robert Gramercy on, on, on this logistic BART. And that, that's when we started working on the package way back in 2015. So uh, there's a similar trick with logistic regression um, uh, due to Holmes and Held. Uh, and then uh, Gramercy and Polson came out with a, a faster way, but they're both slow. <laughs> uh, let's face it, even though uh, Gramercy and Polson's method is faster than Holmes and Held, it's slow. Uh, and that, uh, sadly, that's the case today. So, uh, but it's the same sort of setup the only difference really is here, right? This sigma squared before was one. Well, now it's, uh, it's a random variable uh, uh, where um, four times psi squared, where this psi comes from the Kolmogov Smirnov distribution. And this is a real nasty distribution to draw from. So, uh, so there's some tricks that uh, Holmes and Helen Gramsci and Polson used to, to do that, but it's slow. So uh, now we have a continuous BART with a heteroscedastic variance. However, it's known. I mean, known in the sense that, you know, uh, uh, in the Gibbs sense, we're conditioning on it. And Z is the data. Um, so one challenge when you're dealing with uh, uh, dichotomous uh, uh, um, outcomes is Rob showed us this, this nice trip, trick of looking at the sigma squared and, and using that to determine convergence. Well, guess what? We don't, we don't have one. Uh, in probit BART, it's one. And in sigma square, uh, in logistic BART, it's some sort of uh, uh, feature of the sampling scheme. It's not the error, right? So how do you determine whether uh, you're converging, right? Well, uh, we can fall back on some old uh, uh, tricks uh, uh, due to Hastings, and uh, um, uh, there's some standard tricks to do this. Uh, um, Silverman adopted some uh, tricks from um, time series models. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this. I don't think we're gonna have time for it. So I'm just gonna skip this for now, but, uh, but this, these slides are in there and, and they're also in the article, uh, the Journal of Statistical Software. Although they make some nice graphics. I wish we had time for this, but we don't. All right, so, uh, so next uh, uh, we have what, what, what uh, we call multinomial BART, or what did you call it, Rob? Multinully? What, what, what is the term you use? <laughs> so, 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 go ahead. Multinully. Well, uh, we called, uh, well, uh, I think Rob uh, came up with the name multinomial BART. It's actually not multinomial, as I'll show you in a minute, but the name kind of stuck, so, uh, uh, so we, we kept it. But uh, so this is multinomial BART with a logit link. Uh, um, so so uh, in this case, we're not dealing with uh, by dichotomous data, we're, we're dealing with categories, right? So polytomous data. So, uh, um, so if you can think about these, these are the categories, right? There's K categories. We say it's multinomial NP where P is like this, right? Of course, these sum to one. Uh, but but, but uh, here, this sum is uh, of the number of, um, hmm, the total number of categories. Well, for multinomial, you could do that, but this is not really multinomial because we're fixing it at one. And like I said, we, we call it multinomial, but really it's multinully or whatever, whatever. It's just a category anyways. Well, okay, so how do, you, how do you handle this? Well, it turns out there's a very neat trick uh, 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 in the literature, uh, in uh, uh, I think a Gristi's uh, book, right, Rob? I, I forget where, 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 where this is found. But anyways, what you can do is you can model these as um, a K, K barts, like so, right? So for each one of these uh, Ps, and each one of these categories, we have um, we have a BART fit, okay? And then you can combine them like so. So uh, uh, for the jth one, it's like this. 
and then you just sum over the, all the others, right? Uh, it looks like there's a typo there. So these should be J primes here, right? But again, uh, logits are slow, and now you've got K of them, <laughs> right? Bad, this is very bad. Now you could coax this to work with a probit link, and it would actually be much faster, but there's no theoretical basis for that, right? There's a very nice theory that shows that you can do this for logit link. There's no such theory for, for probits. Uh, so uh, now, would it work? Probably, but I mean, there's no theory behind it. So I got to thinking about this, and uh, this is a lot like something else that we had done. Uh, so we, we came up with, uh, with this method, and this method has recently been compared to uh, several other um, uh, categorical BARTs, and it has been shown to be just as good, if not better, uh, than anything else. So the idea goes like this. So uh, n equals one, right? So we fit a sequence of binary probits. And this, uh, this is similar to something uh, that Agresti has, has written about called continuation ratio logits. It, it's, it's, it, it bears a resemblance. It's not exactly the same thing, but it, it, it's sort of maybe inspiration, let's say. So, uh, so we have k categories like before. And um, and you 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 do these uh, these conditional probabilities, right? So this pi of one is the probability of y i equals one. Pi two is the probability of y i equals two, given that y i one is zero, et cetera, right? So you have all these conditional probabilities, and notice that the last one uh, we can specify uh, just like so, right? So there's only k minus one uh, of these probabilities because the, the last one has to sum up to, to, to one. And then uh, we, we model these conditional probabilities, um, I, I say by construction. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, uh, so for the first one, all N patients contribute. In the second one, um, uh, let's see, what is this? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so the second one, um, it's some subset. Let's see, you have all i where y1 equals zero. Ah, right, see that? So the, se so you, the second subset has this condition. The third subset has this condition, et cetera, right? Well, those are the unconditional probabilities, but we can create the, con the uh, sorry, those are the conditional probabilities, but we very can easily create the conditional probabilities by just multiplying through, right? So, so, so I call these uh, pi, well, that one's just, so pi one is just, or sorry, pi i one is just pi one. Pi two is pi uh, two times qi one, right? Et cetera. So you can create all of those and all of those sum up to one. Uh, so we have a question. The inputs can be continuous and categorical. That's right. The axes can be anything. All right. So uh, so there's this really neat example that that we found. Uh, so 219 uh, alligators were taken by hunters in 1985 from four Florida lakes, and these were some some big alligators, one to four meters long, and their stomachs were removed for study. Each gator's primary food chase was determined. So there's five categories, bird, fish, invertebrate, reptile, or other. Uh, and the covariates are lake, sex, and size. Although in this case, size was dichotomous. Uh, uh, so that, in the, uh, that was a limitation of the data we had access to. We, we couldn't get the, um, the actual size of the gators from, uh, uh, from, from this paper, but... Uh, Oh, uh, so uh, so let's look at this one. Why don't we just run this one? So this is the demo alligator. So I'm going to use my system file trick.
Oops. Huh. Okay, there we go. And we compare this with um, we compare this with a neural net, and um, we uh, uh, this is similar. In the paper, I think they did the same. Th or uh, sorry, yeah, we we compare this with a neural net. I don't know if we compared it with anything else. I don't know how long this takes to run, so let's just run it and see what happens. Oh, it's done already. All right, so let's see. I created a figure. So in this case, uh, this doesn't look right, but anyways, if, if this was right, it would saying that there's no difference between small and large reptiles, but I know that's not true, so I don't know what happened, but. Oh, looks like we had a crash there, nice. All right, so let's, uh, let's X out of that. Actually, there was another, um, there was another demo that I wanted to show you. So let's, let's, let's go back and do another demo instead. All right, so let's go back and do the uh, chronic pain demo. Right. All right, so let's do our system file trick to find it. I mean, now I know where it is, but just, just to remind ourselves. So this one's called nhanes pbart r. And um, like I said earlier, instead of classifying um, obesity by BMI, we're gonna use waist circumference. Now, why did I use waist circumference? Well, it turns out uh, uh, back in the old days here at uh, uh, MCW, uh, there was a big study of something called uh, the TOPS group. Uh, and TOPS stands for take off pounds sensibly. Um, in Milwaukee, this was a, uh, a weight loss group. Uh, uh, now they're international. Uh, and even, even then they were international, but I mean, they, they were based in Milwaukee. So we got a chance to work with them. And we found that uh, waist circumference and hip circumference uh, are, are two of the most important um, variables when it comes to all kinds of types of health outcomes. Now, in this case, I don't have hip circumference also. I just have waist circumference. So I'm just going to use that. So I'm just going to run this whole thing. And while it's running, we can look at what we've got here. So we've got one fit here. The first fit is for lower back pain. The second fit is for neck pain. And, um, and we have several, uh, several covariates. We have uh, gender, waist circumference, and there's one other. Let me see, what is the other one? It's running right now, so I need to wait. Um, so I should say one, one way that you can tell if you installed um, if you installed Bart three correctly is notice that it's saying. It's usually it's calling the parallel uh, when I call, when I ran this predict function. Notice that it's the output's telling me TCU eight. That means I'm I'm using eight threads. See thread count eight, and it's saying parallel. So it's calling parallel code. That's how you know that you installed uh, as one of the ways you know that you installed uh, Bart three correctly because the predict function is now using eight threads, so theoretically eight times faster. All right, so let's see. Let's see what uh, uh, what this produced. Oh, uh, first I wanted to tell you what besides. Oh, uh, so so notice what is it doing here? It's it's doing. Um, let's see. 
So, so this is what the arthritis questionnaire looks like. So you can see we've got uh, chronic neck pain. Uh, SEQN, is this a unique service number? So that's not gonna be a predictor, right? Uh, you have a survey sampling weight, that's not a predictor. So you have gender, oh, and age, that's the other one. So it's age, gender, age, and, um, and waist circumference. And we're gonna use, we're gonna use, um, sorry, wrong window. We're gonna use uh, our RFPD tricks to, uh, to get this as just a marginal effect of um, waist circumference. And we're gonna do it both ways. We're gonna use FPD and we're gonna use FPDK. Just to, just, just to contrast them. All right. Uh, I'm in the wrong directory. Okay, so. Aha. See, did it create a PD? Well, maybe it created a graphic. Where's the my? Hmm. Oh, it's in this directory. Okay. All right, so those are those are my two. Uh, all right, so this is uh, this is what it looks like um, for FPD. So, um, all right, so so the blue line is is males, and the red lines are females, right? So if we look at this. We can see um, for low back pain, it's increasing with waist circumference. And uh, uh, so, so the, the, the solid line is the estimate and the dashed lines are the credible intervals, right? And you can see that uh, uh, just a straight line uh, just a straight line does fall within the credible level. So like, even though it's increasing, it there's a lot of uncertainty, see that? And the same is true mostly for women, although maybe for women, there's a better case to be made that it's increasing because, uh, uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty even for women. Like see, look at the, look at the width of those uh, credible intervals, right? Um, and then for, uh, for, for neck pain, Neck pain, it's pretty flat. See, you can see that the straight line, the straight line goes well in between the uncertainty, right? So the data here, the X were males, females, age, and waist. Right, those are the three, but I, I'm uh, I'm marginaling, marginalizing out the uh, age. Right. And, um... Oh, that that's in the JSS paper. I, yeah, I, I, I um, I think <laughs> here. Let's let's the uh, so so that's in the BART package. So uh, I don't I don't think I have them in the in this package. So let's see. Uh, well, you can look look it up. I, I I mean these are just kind of neat examples. I don't know that I would uh, you know talk to your chiropractor about these, <laughs> but I mean. Uh, it, it wasn't my idea. Somebody, somebody was very interested in it. But let's look what happened to uh, our Kaplan, uh, sorry, our, uh, our kernel sampling trick. I just want to see, uh, let's see here. Where did I call that? Yeah, see here, I used 20, right? 
So the default is four, which is way too low. I should, I should increase the default to like 20 or 30. Just the one question here. So it seems like piecewise linear. Is that the yeah, so uh, when you're fitting with trees, um, that's what you get. You get kind of uh, piecewise linear fits, right? They uh, uh, now you, there's ways of smoothing them out. Like you can use more trees, and you'll get a smoother fit. Uh, there's also a package uh, um, where they use instead of um, Instead of normal leaves, they put a Gaussian prior on the leaves so you get a nice smooth fit, but that takes a long time to fit. So you take something like BART, which is pretty computationally intensive, and then you add something like Gaussian processes, which is 10 times more <laughs> computationally intensive, and it takes like a day to fit them. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, you usually just throw more trees at it. You want to say anything about that, Rob? <laughs> oh, Rob's not paying attention. You just throw more trees at it. It makes it smoother, if, if, if that's desired. Or, or you can fit it with Gaussian process. You can fit it. Um, it's called targeted smoothing BART. Targeted smoothing BART is just like BART we've talked about, but now the leaves are not normal, they're Gaussian processes, so they have some smoothness. Uh, now also tomorrow though, we're gonna talk about monotonic part, which will add some degree of smoothness, but maybe not as much. Anyways, uh, so this, so I'm just gonna flash back and forth. You can see these are uh, FPD fits and these are FPD fits with kernel smoothing, pretty close, <laughs> right? So. So the approximation is, is pretty good. And you save yourself, especially if you're dealing with a big data set. Like if you're dealing with a data set, like we have a data set where, that we use a lot, where we have 10,000 patients, that can take, that takes like uh, several hours to fit. Uh, and um, predictions are on the same order, roughly. They're a little bit fast. So predictions are a little bit faster, but not, not enough. <laughs> not, not enough with a big data set like that. So that's the idea. And um, I think I'm going to stop there, but now I think we're going to do some Q&A. Rob, do you want to get out a microphone so, uh, so we could take some questions? Oh, and I should say we're having dinner, dinner with the speakers next uh, uh, at about 5 o'clock, uh, and we're planning to meet at, uh, I think it's called Senior Soul. Let's see, I have, I have, a, I have a, a web page here. Yeah, Senior Soul 81st in Greenfield. Let's see, let's make sure it's open. I'm clicking on this. How can we tell if it's open? Hmm. All right, yep, it's open. So, uh, so if you're going to be there, raise your hand. Great. All right. Now, uh, 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 now we're going to take some questions, uh, questions and answers. And uh, or or uh, uh, feedback. What did you like? What did you hate? Go ahead. In the in the slide, um, yeah, there is mentioned like that there is like small categories and large categories. Uh, what actually it means? Like um, I think in the slide where you showed the package or for the logistic, there is like large number of categories of K and small number of categories of K. What that means? Of K, oh, of K, did you say K? Yes. Uh, um, what, do you, what do you mean K? You mean capital K or? <laughs> uh, like, no, in the logistics slide. Oh, logistics, okay, hold on, let me. Logistic let me, one. Let me go back to that, oh, okay, so, Sorry. yeah. 
Uh, where did I have that? I got too many windows open. Let's see. Oh, you mean, uh, I see what you mean. You mean this slide? This one right here? Yes, a larger number of categories. And uh, for larger number of categories, it's M bar, M bar two and smaller number of categories, M, M bar. Yeah, okay, so, so that's a good question. So, um, so partly this comes from, I mean, I don't know that we've actually tested this per se, but it, the idea is this should work for any number of categories. For a large number of categories, it should be just as good as a small number of categories. The bad news is if you're a large number of categories, you're doing more of these, right? They're slow to do one, and now you're doing 20, right? The idea here is we think this is a very good approximation for a small number of categories. And, and, and that has been shown. We haven't tried this with a large number of categories. First of all, the data that I typically use doesn't have a large number of categories, but that's, that's more common in business or economics. But we haven't actually tried that. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm saying it should work for a small number of categories. Uh, we, we did show a crash there, but I mean, I know that 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 works. I don't know what's wrong there, but well, that's my that's all I'm saying. You want to say anything about that, Rob? <laughs> Do you want to say anything about that? Like a, a large number of wait, put put your put your put your <laughs> just hit the button. There should be a button. There you go. I mean uh, that PIK. All the other Ys have to be zero. I mean, you may not have many observations by the time you get down there. Right? right. If you have a large number of categories, exactly. So, 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 so this works usually very nicely if you have a few categories like that. That alligator example is perfect for this, right? There's only like four or five categories. Fine. Uh, but, but, but I've talked to people in, in finance. They might have seventy categories, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, like you know, uh, but. That's the type of data that we typically don't see in biostatistics. Wait, you got to hit the button. Yeah, go. I mean, it's hard on like if you want to do multi, you know, multi-newly support vector machines. Don't we have to do like one category versus all the others for each category? Like, I think that's the way to support vector machines. So it, these kind of tricks are not uncommon. It's a trick. Yeah, but th and this one works like, as you said, this this one works really nice for smaller categories. Like like you can do this for, um, like in chess, like a, a win, lose, or draw. You know that. This 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 works out really nicely. But uh, we don't have good data on a. I mean, I personally don't have access to anything that has a large number of categories that I care about. <laughs> Let me put it that way. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, why don't we give you seven minutes back of your time and um, we'll see you guys uh, uh, tomorrow at uh, about 9 a.m. And um, for those of us joining us at uh, Senior Soul, we will see you about five-ish, I guess. Um, we, we, don't, we don't have reservations. Should we say 5.30? What do you guys think? I'm flexible. Okay, 530.